Part One of Chapter One Spontaneous Activity in Education by Maria Montessori. Translated by Florence Simmons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Grace Fern, oddlyaware.com. Chapter 1 A Survey of the Child's Life. The general laws which govern the child's psychical health have their parallel in those of the physical health. Many persons who have asked me to continue my methods of education for very young children on lines that would make them suitable for those over seven years of age have expressed a doubt whether this would be possible. The difficulties they put forward are mainly of a moral order. Should not the child now begin to respect the will of others rather than his own? Should he not some day brace himself to a real effort, compelling him to carry out a necessary rather than a chosen task? Finally, should he not learn self-sacrifice, since man's life is not a life of ease and enjoyment? Some, taking certain practical items of elementary education, which present themselves even at the age of six, and must be seriously envisaged at seven, urge their objection in this form. Now we are face to face with the ugly spectre of arithmetical tables, with the arid mental gymnastics exacted by grammar. What do you propose? Would you abolish all this? Or do you admit that the child must inevitably bow to these necessities? It is obvious that the whole of the argument revolves round the interpretation of that liberty, which is the avowed basis of the system of education advocated by me. Perhaps in a short time all these objections will provoke a smile, and I shall be asked to suppress them, together with my commentary on them, in future editions of this work. But at the present time they have a right to exist, and to be dealt with, although indeed it is not very easy to give a direct, clear, and convincing answer to them, because this entails the raising of questions on which everybody has firmly rooted convictions. A parallel may perhaps serve to save us a good deal of the work, Indirectly, these questions have been answered already by the progress made in the treatment of infants under the guidance of hygiene. How were they treated formerly? Many, no doubt, can still remember certain practices that were regarded as indispensable by the masses. An infant had to be strapped and swaddled, or its legs would grow crooked. The ligament under its tongue had to be slit to ensure its speaking eventually. It was important that it should always wear a cap to keep its ears from protruding. The position of a recumbent baby was so arranged as not to cause permanent deformity of the tender skull. And good mothers stroked and pinched the little noses of the nurslings to make them grow long and sharp instead of round and snub, and put little gold earrings through the lobes of their ears very soon after birth to improve their eyesight. Such practices may be already forgotten in some countries but in others they obtain to this day. Who does not remember the various devices for helping a baby to walk? Even in the first months after birth, at a period of life when the nervous system is not completely developed and it is impossible for the infant to coordinate its movements, mothers waste several half hours of the day teaching baby to walk. Holding the little creature by the body, they watch the aimless movements of the tiny feet and deluded themselves with the belief that the child was already making an effort to walk, and because it does actually, by degrees, begin to arch its feet and move its legs more boldly, the mother attributed its progress to her instruction. When finally the movement had been almost established, though not quite the equilibrium, and the resulting power to stand on the feet, mothers made use of certain straps with which they held up the baby's body, and thus made it walk on the ground with themselves, or, when they had no time to spare, they put the baby into a kind of bell-shaped basket, the broadest base of which prevented it from turning over. They tied the infant into this, hanging its arms outside, its body being supported by the upper edge of the basket. Thus the child, though it could not rise on its feet, advanced, moving its legs, and was said to be walking. Other relics of a very recent past are a species of convex crowns which were put round the heads of babies when they were considered capable of rising to their feet and were accordingly emancipated from the basket 
The child, suddenly left to himself, after being accustomed hitherto to supports comparable to the crutches of the cripple, fell perpetually, and the crown was a protection to the head which would otherwise have been injured. What were the revelations of science when it entered upon the scene for the salvation of the child? It certainly offered no perfected methods for straightening the noses and the ears, nor did it enlighten mothers as to the methods of teaching babies to walk immediately after birth. No, it proclaimed first of all that nature itself will determine the shape of heads, noses, and ears, that man will speak without having the membrane of the tongue cut, and further that legs will grow straight and that the function of walking will come naturally, and requires no intervention. Hence it follows that we should leave as much as possible to nature, and the more the babe is left free to develop, the more rapidly and perfectly will he achieve his proper proportions and higher functions. Thus swaddling bands are abolished, and the utmost tranquillity and a restful position is recommended. The infant, with its legs perfectly free, will be left lying full length, and not jogged up and down to amuse it, as many people imagine they are doing by this device. It will not be forced to walk before it is time. When this time comes, it will raise itself and walk spontaneously. In these days, nearly all mothers are convinced of this, and vendors of swaddling bands, straps, and baskets have practically disappeared. As a result, babies have straighter legs and walk better and earlier than formerly. This is an established fact, and a most comforting one, for what a constant anxiety it must have been to believe that the straightness of a child's legs and the shape of its nose, ears, and head were the direct results of our care. What a responsibility to which every one must have felt unequal, and what a relief to say, Nature will think of that. I will leave my baby free and watch him grow in beauty. I will be a quiescent spectator of the miracle. Something analogous has been happening with regard to the inner life of the child. We are beset by such anxieties as these. It is necessary to form character, to develop the intelligence, to aid the unfolding and ordering of the emotions. And we ask ourselves how we are to do this. Here and there we touch the soul of the child, or we constrain it by special restrictions, much as mothers used to press the noses of their babies, or strap down their ears, and we conceal our anxiety beneath a certain mediocre success. For it is a fact that men do grow up possessing character, intelligence, and feeling. But when all these things are lacking, we are vanquished. What are we to do then? Who will give character to a degenerate, intelligence to an idiot, human emotions to a moral maniac? If it were really true that men acquired all such qualities by these fitful manipulations of their souls, it would suffice to apply a little more energy to the process when these souls are evidently feeble, but this is not sufficient. Then we are no more the creators of spiritual than of physical forms. It is nature, creation, which regulates all these things. If we are convinced of this, we must admit as a principle the necessity of not introducing obstacles to natural development. And instead of having to deal with many separate problems, such as what are the best aids to the development of character, intelligence, and feeling? One single problem will present itself as the basis of all education. How are we to give the child freedom? In according this freedom, we must take account of principles analogous to those laid down by science for the forms and functions of the body during its period of growth. It is freedom in which the head, the nose, and the ears will attain the highest beauty and the gate the utmost perfection possible to the congenital powers of the individual. Thus here again liberty, the sole means, will lead to the maximum development of character, intelligence, and sentiment, and will give to us, the educators, peace, and the possibility of contemplating the miracle of growth. This liberty will further deliver us from the painful weight of a fictitious responsibility and dangerous illusion. Woe to us! when we believe ourselves responsible for matters that do not concern us, and delude ourselves with the idea that we are perfecting things that will perfect themselves quite independently of us. For then we are like lunatics, and the profound question arises, what, then, is our true mission, our true responsibility? 
if we are deceiving ourselves, what is indeed the truth? And what sins of omission and of commission must be laid to our charge? If, like Chanticleer, we believe that the sun rises in the morning because the cock has crowed, what duties shall we find when we come to our senses? Who has been left destitute because we ourselves have forgotten to eat our true bread? The history of the physical redemption of the infant has a sequel for us which is highly instructive. Hygiene has not been confined to the task of anthropological demonstration, such as that which not only made generally known, but convinced everyone that the body develops spontaneously. Because in reality, the question of infant welfare was not concerned with the more or less perfect forms of the body. The real infantile question, which called for the intervention of science, was the alarming mortality among infants. It certainly seems strange in these days to consider this fact, that at the period when infantile diseases made the greatest ravages, people were not nearly so much concerned with infantile mortality as with the shape of the nose or the straightness of the legs, while the real question, literally a question of life and death, passed unobserved. There must be many persons who, like myself, have heard such dialogues as this. I have had great experience in the care of children. I have had nine. And how many of them are living? Two. And nevertheless, this mother was looked upon as an authority. Statistics of mortality reveal figures so high that the phenomenon may justly be called the slaughter of the innocents. The famous graph of Lexis which is not confined to one country or another, but deals with the general averages of human mortality, reveals the fact that this terrible death rate is of universal occurrence among all peoples. This must be attributed to two different factors. One is undoubtedly the characteristic feebleness of infancy, the other the absence of protection for this feebleness, an absence that had become general among all peoples. Good will was not lacking, or parental affection. The fault lay hidden in an unknown cause, in a lack of protection against a dire peril of which men were quite unconscious. It is now a matter of common knowledge that infectious diseases, especially those of intestinal origin, are those most destructive to infant life. Intestinal disorders, which impede nutrition and produce toxins at an age when the delicate tissues are most sensitive to them, were responsible for nearly the entire death toll. These were aggravated by the errors habitually committed by those in charge of infants. Those errors were a lack of cleanliness, which would astound us nowadays, and a complete absence of any sort of rule concerning infant diet. The soiled napkins which were wrapped round the baby under its swaddling band would be dried in the sun again and again, and replaced on the infant without being washed. No care was taken to wash the mother's breast or the baby's mouth, in spite of fermentation so pronounced as to cause local disorder. Suckling of infants was carried out quite irregularly. The cries of the child were the sole guide whereby its feeding times, whether by night or day, were determined, and the more it suffered from indigestion and the resulting pains, the more frequently was it fed, to the constant aggravation of its sufferings. Who in those days might not have seen mothers carrying in their arms babies flushed with fever, perpetually thrusting the nipple into the little howling mouth in the hope of quieting it? And yet those mothers were full of self-sacrifice and of maternal anguish. Science has laid down simple rules. It enjoined the utmost possible cleanliness, and formulated a principle so self-evident that it seems astounding people should not have recognized it for themselves. That the smallest infant, like ourselves, should have regular meals and should only take fresh nourishment when it has digested what has been given before, and hence that it should be suckled only at intervals of so many hours, according to the months of its age and the modifications of physical function in its development. No infant should ever be given crusts of bread to suck, as is often done by mothers, especially among the lower orders, to still its crying, because particles of bread might be swallowed which the child is yet incapable of digesting. The mother's anxiety then was, what are we to do when the baby cries? They found to their astonishment, after a time, that their babies cried a great deal less, or indeed not at all. 
They even saw infants, only a week old, spending the two hours' intervals between successive meals, calm and rosy, with wide-open eyes, so silent that they gave no sign of life, like nature in her movements of solemn immobility. Why indeed should they cry continually? Those cries were a sign of a state of things which must be translated by these words, suffering and death. And for those wailing little ones, the world did nothing. They were strapped up in swaddling clothes, and very often handed over to a young child incapable of responsibility. They had neither a room nor a bed of their own. It was science which came to the rescue and created nurseries, cradles, rooms for babies, suitable clothes for them, elementary substances specially prepared for them by great industries devoted to the hygienic sustenance of infants after weaning a medical specialist for their ailments. In short, an entirely new world, clean, intelligent, and full of amenity. The baby has become the new man who has conquered his own right to live, and thus has caused a sphere to be created for him. And in direct proportion to the diffusion of the laws of infantile hygiene, infant mortality has decreased. So then, when we say that, in like manner, the baby should be left at liberty spiritually, because creative nature can also fashion its spirit better than we can, we do not mean that it should be neglected and abandoned. Perhaps looking round us, we shall perceive that, though we cannot directly mould its individual forms of character, intelligence, and feeling, there is nevertheless a whole category of duties and solicitudes which we have neglected, and that on these the life or death of the spirit depends. The principle of liberty is not therefore a principle of abandonment, but rather one which, by leading us from illusions to reality, will guide us to the most positive and efficacious care of the child. The liberty accorded to the child of today is purely physical. Civil rights of the child in the twentieth century. Hygiene has brought liberty into the physical life of the infant. Such material facts as the abolition of swaddling bands, open-air life, the prolongation of sleep till the infant wakes of its own accord, etc., are the most evident and tangible proof of this. But these are merely the means for the attainment of liberty. A far more important measure of liberation has been the removal of the pearls of disease and death which beset the child at the outset of life's journey. Not only did infants survive in very much greater numbers as soon as the obstacles of certain fundamental errors were swept away, but it was at once apparent that there was an improvement in their development. Was it really hygiene which helped them to increase in weight, stature, and beauty, and improve their material development? Hygiene did not accomplish quite all this. Who, as the gospel says, can by taking thought at one cubit to his stature, Hygiene merely delivered the child from the obstacles that impeded its growth. External restraints checked material development and all the natural evolution of life. Hygiene burst these bonds, and everyone felt that a liberation had been effected. Everyone repeated in view of the accomplished fact, children should be free. The direct correspondence between conditions of physical life fulfilled and liberty required, is now universally and intuitively recognized. Thus the infant is treated like a young plant. Children today enjoy the rights which from time immemorial have been accorded to the vegetables of a well-kept garden. Good food, oxygen, suitable temperature, the careful elimination of parasites that produce disease. Yes, henceforth we may say that the son of a prince will be tended with as much care as the finest rose-tree of a villa. The old comparison of a child to a flower is a reality to which we now aspire, though even this is a privilege reserved for the more fortunate children. But let us beware of so grave an error. The babe is a man. That which suffices for a plant cannot be sufficient for him. Consider the depth of misery into which a paralyzed man has sunk when we say of him, He merely vegetates. As a man, he is dead, and lament that there is nothing but his body left. The infant, as a man, such is the figure we ought to keep in view. We must behold him 
amidst our tumultuous human society, and see how with heroic vigor he aspires to life. What are the rights of children? Let us consider them for a moment as a social class, as a class of workers, for, as a fact, they are laboring to produce men. They are the future generation. They work, undergoing the fatigues of physical and spiritual growth. They continue the work carried on for a few months by their mothers, but their task is a more laborious, complex, and difficult one. When they are born, they possess nothing but potentialities. They have to do everything in a world which, as even adults admit, is full of difficulties. What is done to help these frail pilgrims in an unknown world? They are born more fragile and helpless than an animal, and in a few years they have to become men, to be units in a highly complicated, organized society, built up by the secular effort of innumerable generations. At a period in which civilization, that is, the possibility of right living, is based upon rights energetically acquired and consecrated by laws, what rights has he who comes among us without strength and without thought? Like the infant Moses lying in the ark of bulrushes on the waters of the Nile, he represents the future of the chosen people. But will some princess passing by perchance see him? To chance, to luck, to affection, to all these we entrust the child. And it would seem that the biblical chastisement of the Egyptian oppressor, the death of the firstborn, is to be unceasingly renewed. Let us see how social justice receives the infant when he enters the world. We are living in the twentieth century. In many of the so-called civilized nations, orphan asylums and wet nurses are still recognized as institutions. What is an orphan asylum? It is a place of sequestration, a dark and terrible prison, where only too often the prisoner finds death, as in those medieval dungeons whence the victim disappeared leaving no trace. He never sees anyone who is dear to him. His family name is cancelled. His goods are confiscated. The greatest criminal may retain memories of his mother, knows that he has had a name, and may derive some consolation from his recollections, comparable to the soothing reflections of one who, having become blind, recalls the beauty of colors and the splendor of the sun. But the foundling is as one born blind. Every male factor has more rights than he, and yet who could be more innocent? Even in the days of the most odious tyranny, the spectacle of oppressed innocence kindled a flame of justice that sooner or later blazed up into revolution. The persons imprisoned by tyrants, because they had happened to be witnesses of their crimes, and who were cast into dungeons where darkness and inaudible suffering were henceforth their unhappy portion, at least rouse the people to proclaim the principle of equal justice for all. But who will lift up his voice for our foundlings? Society does not perceive that they too are men. They are indeed only the flowers of humanity, and to save honor and good name, what society would not with one accord sacrifice more flowers? The wet nurse is a social custom, a luxurious custom, on the one hand, not very long ago, a girl of the middle and not even the upper middle class, who was about to marry, boasted in the following terms of the domestic comfort promised her by her future husband. I am to have a cook, a housemaid, and a wet nurse. On the other hand, the robust peasant girl, who has given birth to a son, looking complacently at her heavy breasts, thinks, I shall be able to get a good place as wet nurse. It is only quite recently that hygiene has cried shame upon those mothers whose laziness makes them refuse to suckle their own children. In our times, queens and empresses who suckle their children are cited admiringly as examples to other mothers. The maternal duty of suckling her own children prescribed to mothers by hygienists is based on a physiological principle. The mother's milk nourishes an infant more perfectly than any other. In spite of this clear indication, the duty is far from being universally accepted. Often in our walks we still see a robust mother, accompanied by a wet nurse, gorgeously attired in red or blue, 
with gold and silver embroideries, carrying a baby. Wealthy mothers have untidily dressed wet nurses who do not go out with them, who always follow the modern nurse, an expert in infantile hygiene, who keeps the baby like a flower. And what of the other child? For every infant who has a double supply of human milk at his disposal, there is another child who has none. The wealth in question is not an industrial product. It is proportioned by nature with careful precision. For each new life, the ration of milk. Milk cannot be produced by any means other than the production of life. Cowkeepers know this well. Their good cows are hygienically reared, and calves are sent to the butcher. Yet what distress is felt whenever the young of some animal is parted from its mother? Is it not so in the case of puppies and kittens? When a pet dog has given birth to a litter so numerous that she cannot suckle them all, and it is necessary to destroy some of the puppies, what sincere grief is felt by the mistress of the house, whose own baby is being suckled by a magnificent wet nurse? Well, the thing which excites her compassion, above all, is the eager, whimpering mother, who does not understand whether she has or has not the strength to suckle all the shapeless puppies she has borne, but who cannot lose one of them without despair. The wet nurse is quite another affair. She came of her own accord to offer her milk to Parcel. What the other, her own child, was to do, no one cared. Only a clearly defined right, a law, could have protected him, for society is based on rights. These, it is true, are the rights of property, which are absolute. Steal a loaf, even if you are starving, and you are a thief. You will be punished by the law and outlawed by society. The rights of property constitute one of the most formidable of the social bases. An administrator of landed estate, who should sell the property belonging to his master, make money out of it for his own enjoyment, and leave the rightful owner in the direst poverty, is a criminal difficult to imagine. For who would buy a property without the signature of the owner? Society is so constituted that certain crimes would not only be punished if committed, but are almost impossible to commit. Yet in the case of young infants, this crime is committed every day and is not regarded as a crime, but as a luxury. What can be a more sacred right than that of the baby to his mother's milk? He might say of this in the words of the Emperor Napoleon, God has given it to me. There could be no doubt, whatever, as to the legitimacy of his claim. His sole capital, milk, came into the world with and for him. All his wealth is there. Strength to live, to grow, to acquire vigor are contained in that nourishment. If the defrauded infant should become weak and rickety, what would become of him? condemned by poverty to a hard calling. What a claim for damages! What a question of accident during work with permanent injury resulting therefrom might be raised if some day the infant could present himself after the manner of a man before the tribunal of social justice. In civilized countries, rich mothers have been induced to suckle their children because hygienists have proved that this is beneficial to the baby's health, but not because it has been recognized that the civil right of the adult extends to the infant. These mothers consider countries where the wet nurse is still an institution as less highly developed, but on the same plane of civilization as their own. It may be asked, what if the mother is ill and unable to suckle her child? In such a case, the child of the sick woman is the unfortunate one. Why should another have to suffer for his misfortune? However poverty-stricken individuals may be, we do not allow them to take from others the wealth that is so urgently needed by them. If in these days an emperor could be cured of terrible sufferings by immersion in a bath of human blood, he could not bleed healthy men for the purpose as a barbarian emperor would have done. These are the things that make up our civilization. This it is which differentiates us from pirates and cannibals. The rights of the adult are recognized, but not the rights of the infant. What an implication of baseness the fact carries with it. We recognize the rights of adults indeed, but not those of the child. We recognize justice, but only for those who can protest and defend themselves, and for the rest we remain barbarians. Because today there may be people 
more or less highly developed from the hygienic point of view, but they all belong to the same civilization, a civilization based on the rights of the strongest. When we begin seriously to examine the problem of the moral education of the child, we ought to look around us a little and survey the world we have prepared for him. Are we willing that he should become like us, unscrupulous in our dealings with the weak, that like us his consciousness should harbor ideas of a justice which stop short at those who make no protests? Are we willing to make him, like ourselves, half a civilized man in our dealings with our equals, and half a wild beast when we encounter the innocent and oppressed? If not, then before we offer moral education to the child, let us imitate the priest who is about to ascend to the altar. He bows his head in penitence and confesses his own sins before the whole congregation. This outlawed child is like a dislocated arm. Humanity cannot work at the evolution of its morality until this arm has been put into its place. And this will also end the pains and the paralysis of the injured muscles attached to it. Woman. The social question of the child is obviously the more complete and profound. It is the question of our present and our future. If we can recounsel to our conscience deeds of such grave injustice, not to say crimes, without recognizing them as such, what minor forms of oppression shall we not readily condone in our dealings with the child? End of part one of chapter one. Part two of chapter one, Spontaneous Activity in Education, by Maria Montessori, translated by Florence Simmons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Grace Byrne, oddlyaware.com. How we receive the infants that come into the world. Let us look around. Only of late has any preparation been made to receive this sublime guest. It is not very long ago that little beds for children were first made. Among all the innumerable tasteless, superfluous, and extravagant objects of commerce, let us see what things are intended for the child. No washstands, no sofas, no tables, no brushes. Among all the many houses, there is not one house for him and his like. And only rich and fortunate children have even a room of their own more or less a place of exile. Let us imagine ourselves subjected for even a single day to the miseries to which he is condemned. Suppose that we should find ourselves among a race of giants, with legs immensely long, and bodies enormously large in comparison with ours, and also with powers of rapid movement infinitely greater than ours, people extraordinarily agile and intelligent compared with ourselves, we should want to go into their houses. The steps would be each as high as our knees, and yet we should have to try to mount them with their owners. We should want to sit down, for the seats would be almost as high as our shoulders. Clambering painfully upon them, we should at last succeed in perching upon them. We should want to brush our clothes, but all the clothes brushes would be so huge that we could not lay hold of them nor sustain their weight, and a clothes brush would be handed to us if we wanted to brush our nails. We should perhaps be glad to take a bath in one of the washstand basins, but the weight of these will make it impossible for us to lift them. If we knew that these giants had been expecting us, we should be obliged to say, they have made no preparations for receiving us, or for making our lives among them agreeable. The baby finds all that he himself needs in the form of playthings made for dolls, Rich, varied, and attractive surroundings have not been created for him. But dolls have houses, sitting rooms, kitchens, and wardrobes. For them all that the adult possesses is reproduced in miniature. Among all these things, however, the child cannot live. He can only amuse himself. The world has been given to him in jest, because no one has yet recognized him as a living man. He discovers that society has prepared a mockery for his reception. That children break their toys is so well known that this act of destruction of the only thing specially manufactured for them is taken 
to be proof of their intelligence. We say, he destroys it because he wishes to understand how things are made. In reality, he is looking to see if there is anything interesting inside the toys, because externally they have no interest whatever for him. Sometimes he breaks them up violently like an angry man. Then, according to us, he is destroying out of naughtiness. It is the tendency of the child actually to live by means of the things around him, and he would like to use a washstand of his own, to wash dress himself, really to comb the hair on a living head, to sweep the floor himself. He, too, would like to have seats, tables, sofas, clothes pegs, and cupboards. What he desires is to work himself, to aim at some intelligent object, to add comfort in his own life. He has not only to behave like a man, but to construct a man. Such is the dominant tendency of his nature, of his mission. We have seen him in the Casse des Bambini, happy and patient, slow and precise, like the most admirable workman and the most scrupulous conservator of things. The smallest trifle suffice to make him happy. It delights him to hang up his own clothes on pegs, pick slow down on the walls, within reach of his hands, to open a light door, the handle of which is proportionate to the size of his hand, to place a chair, the weight of which is not too great for his arms, quietly and gracefully. We offer a very simple suggestion. Give the child an environment in which everything is constructed in proportion to himself, and let him live therein. Then there will develop within the child that active life which has caused so many to marvel, because they see in it not only a simple exercise performed with pleasure, but the revelation of a spiritual life. In such harmonious surroundings the young child is seen laying hold of the intellectual life like a seed which has thrown out a root into the soil, and then growing and developing by one sole means, long practice in each exercise. When we see little children acting thus, intent on their work, slow in executing it because of the immaturity of their structure, just as they walk slowly because their legs are still short, we feel intuitively that life is being elaborated within them as a chrysalis slowly elaborates the butterfly within the cocoon. To impede their activity will be to do violence to their lives. But what is the usual method with young children? We all interrupt them without compunction or consideration, in the manner of masters to slaves who have no human rights. To show consideration to young children as to adults would even seem ridiculous to many persons. And yet, with what severity do we enjoin children not to interrupt us? If the little one is doing something, eating by himself, for instance, some adult comes and feeds him. If he is trying to fasten an overall, some adult hastens to dress him. Everyone substitutes an alien action to his, brutally, without the smallest consideration. And yet we ourselves are very sensitive as to our rights in our own work. It offends us if anyone attempts to supplant us. In the Bible, the sentence, And his place shall another take, is among the threats to the lost. What should we do if we were to become the slaves of a people incapable of understanding our feelings, a gigantic people, very much stronger than ourselves? When we were quietly eating our soup, enjoying it at our leisure, and we know that enjoyments depends upon being at liberty, Suppose a giant appeared and, snatching the spoon from our hand, made us swallow it in such haste that we were almost choked. Our protest, for mercy's sake, slowly, would be accompanied by an impression of the heart. Our digestion would suffer. If again, thinking of something pleasant, we should be slowly putting on an overcoat with all the sense of well-being and liberty we enjoy in our own houses, and some giant should suddenly throw it upon us, and having dressed us, should, in the twinkling of an eye, carry us out to some distance from the door. We should feel our dignity so wounded that all the expected pleasure of the walk would be lost. Our nutrition does not depend solely on the sloop we have swallowed, nor our well-being upon the physical exercise of walking, but also upon the liberty with which we do these things. We should feel offended and rebellious, 
not at all out of hatred of these giants, but merely from our recognition of the innate tendency to free functions in all that pertains to life. It is something within us which man does not recognize, which God alone knows, a something which manifests itself imperceptibly to us, to the end that we may complete it. It is this love of freedom which nourishes and gives well-meaning to our life, even in its most minute acts. Of this it was said, Man does not live by bread alone. How much greater this need must be in young children, in whom creation is still in action. With strife and rebellion, they have to defend their own little conquests of their environment. When they want to exercise their senses, such as that of touch, for instance, everyone condemns them. Do not touch. If they attempt to take something from the kitchen, some scraps to make a little dish, they are driven away and mercilessly sent back to their toys. How often one of those marvelous moments when their attention is fixed and that process of organization which is to develop them begins in their souls is roughly interrupted. Moments when the spontaneous efforts of the young child are groping blindly in its surroundings after sustenance for his intelligence. Do we not all retain an impression of something having been forever first stifled in our lives? Without being able to give any definite reason, we feel that something precious was lost on our life journey, that we were defrauded and depreciated. Perhaps at the very moment when we were about to create ourselves, we were interrupted and persecuted, and our spiritual organism was left rickety, weak, and inadequate. Let us imagine to ourselves certain adults, not mature and stable like the majority of grown men, but in a state of spiritual auto-creation, as are men of genius. Let us take the case of a writer under the influence of poetic inspiration. At the moment when his beneficent and inspiring work is about to take form for the help of other men, or that of the mathematician who perceives the solution of a great problem from which will issue new principles beneficial to all humanity, or again that of an artist whose mind has just conceived the ideal image which it is necessary to fix upon the canvas lest a masterpiece be lost to the world. Imagine these men at such psychological moments broken in upon by some brute person shouting to them to follow him at once, taking them by the hand, or pushing them out by the shoulders. And for what? The chessboard is set out for a game. Ah, such men would say, you could not have done anything more atrocious. Our inspiration is lost. Humanity will be deprived of a poem, an artistic masterpiece, a useful discovery by your folly. But the child in like case does not lose some single production. He loses himself. For his masterpiece which he is composing in the recesses of his creative genius, is a new man. The caprices, the naughtiness, the mysterious vapors of little children are perhaps the occult cry of unhappiness uttered by the misunderstood soul. But it is not only the soul that suffers, the body suffers with it. For the influence exercised by the spirit on the entire physical existence is a characteristic of man. In an institution of deserted children, there was one extremely ugly little creature, who had, nevertheless, greatly endeared himself to a young woman who had the care of him. This nurse one day told one of the patronesses that her child was growing very pretty. The lady went to look at it, but found it very ugly, and thought to herself that daily habit soon accustoms us to the defects of others. Some time after this, the nurse made the same remark as before, and the lady good-naturedly paid another visit. Impressed by the warmth with which the young woman spoke of the child, she was touched to think that love had made the speaker blind. Several months lapsed, and finally the nurse, with a triumphant air, declared that henceforth no mistake would be possible, for the child had undoubtedly become beautiful. The lady, astounded, had to admit that this was true body of the child had actually been transformed under the influence of great affection. When we delude ourselves with the idea that we are giving everything to children by giving them fresh air and food, we are not even giving them this. 
air and food are not sufficient for the body of man all the physiological functions are subject to a higher welfare wherein the sole key of all life is to be found the child's body lives also by joyousness of the soul physiology itself teaches us these things a frugal meal taken in the open air will nourish the body far better than a sumptuous repast in a close room where the air is impure because all the functions of the body are more active in the open air and assimilation is more complete in like manner a frugal meal eaten in common with beloved and sympathetic persons is much more nutritious than the food a humble harassed secretary would partake at the lordly table of a capricious master liberty in this case is a cry that explains all parva domus sed mia a little house but my own has been quoted ever since the roman epoch to indicate which is the most healthful of houses where our lives are oppressed there could be no health for us even though we eat of princely banquets or in splendid buildings with man the life of the body depends on the life of the spirit physiology gives an exhaustive explanation of the mechanism of such phenomena moral activities have such an exact correspondence with the functions of the body that it is possible to appreciate by means of these the various emotional states of grief anger weariness and pleasure in grief for instance the action of the heart becomes feebler as under a paralyzing influence all the blood vessels contract and the blood circulates more slowly the glands no longer secret their juices normally and these disturbances manifest themselves in the pallor of the face an appearance of weariness in the drooping body a mouth parched from lack of saliva indigestion caused by insufficiency of the gastric juice and cold hands if prolonged grief results in malnutrition and consequent wasting and predisposes the debilitated body to infectious diseases weariness is like a rapid paralysis of the heart it may induce fainting as expressed in the popular phrase dead tired but a reflex action will nearly always restore the sufferer like an automatic safety valve thus a yawn that is to say a deep spasmodic inspiration which dilates the pulmonary alveoli causes the blood to flow to the heart like a suction pump and sets it in motion again in anger there is a kind of titanic contraction of all the capillaries causing an extreme pallor and the expulsion of an extra quantity of bile from the liver pleasure causes dilation of the blood vessels the circulation and consequently all the functions of secretion and assimilation are facilitated the face is suffused with color the gastric juice and the saliva are perceptible as that healthy appetite and that watering of the mouth which invites us to supply fresh nourishment to the body all the tissues work actively to expel the toxins and to assimilate fresh nourishment the enlarged lungs store up large quantities of oxygen which burn up all refuse leaving no trace of poisonous germs it is an injection of health in italy where after the abolition of the death penalty the punishment of solitary confinement was substituted we have a proof even more eloquent of the influence of the spirit upon the functions of the body with our modern measures of hygiene in prisons the prison cell cannot be called a place of torture for the body it is merely a place where all spiritual sustenance is withheld it consists of a cell with perfectly bare gray walls opening only into a narrow stripe of ground enclosed by high walls where the criminal may walk in the fresh air because the open country is all around him though it is hidden from his sight what is lacking here for the body it is provided with food and a shelter from the weather it has a bed and a place where it can take in fresh stores of pure oxygen the body can rest nay more it can do nothing but rest the condition seems almost ideal for any one who does not wish to do anything and desires simply to vegetate the no sound from without no human voice ever reaches the air of the being here incarcerated he will never again see a color or a form no news from the outer world ever reaches him alone in dense spiritual darkness he will spend the interminable hours days seasons and years now experience had shown 
that these wretched persons cannot live. They go mad and die. Not only their minds, but their bodies perish after a few years. What causes death? If such a man were a plant, he would lack nothing, but he requires other nourishment. Emptiness of the soul is mortal even to the vilest criminal, for this is a law of human nature. His flesh, his viscera, his bones perish when deprived of spiritual food, just as an oak tree would perish without the nitrates of the earth and the oxygen of the air. The slow death substituted for violent death was indeed denounced as very great cruelty. To die of hunger in nine days like Count Ugolino is a more cruel fate than to be burnt to death in half an hour like Giordano Bruno. But to die of starvation of the spirit in terms of years is the most cruel of all the punishments hitherto devised for the castigation of man. If a robust and cr brutal criminal can perish from starvation of the soul, what will be the fate of the infant if we take no account of his spiritual needs? His body is fragile, his bones are in process of growth, his muscles overloaded with sugar cannot yet elaborate their powers. They can only elaborate themselves. The delicate structure of his organism requires, it is true, nutriment and oxygen, but if it, its functions are to be satisfactorily performed, it requires joy. It is a joyous spirit that causes the bones of man to exalt. End of part two, chapter one. Part one of chapter two, Spontaneous Activity in Education, by Maria Montessori, translated by Florence Simmons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Grace Byrne, oddlyaware.com. Chapter two, A Survey of Modern Education. Section one, The Precepts which govern moral education and instruction. Although the adult relegates the child to an existence among toys and inexorably denies him those exercises which would promote his internal development, he claims that the child should imitate him in the moral sphere. The adult says to the child, Do as I do. The child is to become a man, not by training and development, but by imitation. It is as if a father were to say to in the morning to his little one, Look at me. See how tall I am. When I return this evening, I shall expect you to have grown a foot. Education is greatly simplified by this method. If a tale of some heroic deed is read to the child, and he is told to become a hero, if some moral action is narrated and is concluded with the recommendation, Be thou virtuous. If some instance of remarkable character is noted together with the exhortation, You too must acquire a strong character. The child has been put in the way of becoming a great man. If children show themselves discontented and restless, they are told that they want for nothing, that they are fortunate to have a father and a mother, and to conclude, they are exhorted thus, Children, be happy. A child should always be joyous. And behold, the mysterious yearnings of the child are supposed to be satisfied. Adults are quite content when they have acted thus. They straighten out the character and the morals of their children as they formerly straightened their legs by bandaging them. True, rebellious children occasionally demonstrate the futility of such teachings. In these cases, a good instructor chooses appropriate stories showing the baseness of such ingratitude, the dangers of disobedience, the ugliness of bad temper, to accentuate the defects of the pupil. It would be just as edifying to discourse to a blind man on the dangers of blindness, and to a cripple on the difficulties of walking. The same thing happens in material matters. A music master says to a beginner, Hold your fingers properly. If you do not, you will never be able to play. A mother will say to a son, 
condemned to sit bent double all day on school benches and obliged by the usages of society to study continually hold yourself gracefully do not be so awkward in company you make me feel ashamed of you if the child were one day to exclaim but it is you who prevent me from developing will and character when i seem naughty it is because i am trying to save myself how can i help being awkward when i am sacrificed to many this would be a revelation to many others merely a want of respect there is a method by which the child may be brought to achieve the results which the adult has laid down as desirable it is a very simple method the child must be made to do whatever the adult wishes the adult will then be able to lead him to the heights of goodness self-sacrifice and strength and the moral child will be created to dominate the child to bring him into subjection to make him obedient this is the basis of education if this can be done by any means whatever even by violence all the rest will follow and remember it is all for the good of the child the child could not be moulded by any other means it is the first and principal step in what is called educating the will of the child one which will henceforth enable the adult to speak of himself as virgil speaks of god after this first step the adult will examine himself to see what are the things he finds most difficult and these he will exact from the child in time that the child may accustom himself to the necessary difficulties of man's life but very often the adult also imposes conditions which he himself has not the fortitude to accept even partially as for instance the task of listening motionless for three or four hours every day during a course of years to a dull wearisome lecturer section two of chapter two it is the teacher who forms the child's mind how he teaches the same conception governs the school it is the teacher who must form the pupil the development of the child's intelligence and culture are in his hands he has a truly formidable task and a tremendous responsibility the problems that present themselves to him are innumerable and acute they form as it were a hedge of thorns separating him from his pupils what must first of all be devised to win the attention of his pupils so that he may be able to introduce into their minds all that seems to him necessary how is he to offer them an idea in such a manner that they will retain it in their memories to this end it is essential that he should have a knowledge of psychology the precise manner in which physical phenomena are produced the laws governing memory the psychical mechanisms by means of which ideas are formed the laws governing the association of ideas by means of which very gradually ideas proceed to the most sublime activities imp impelling the child to reason it is he who knowing all these things must build up and enrich the mind and this is no easy matter because in addition to this difficult work there is always the difficulty of difficulties that of inducing the child to lend himself to all this endeavour and to second the master and not show himself recalcitrant to the efforts made on his behalf for this reason the moral education is the point of departure before all things it is necessary to discipline the class the pupils must be induced to second the master's efforts if not by love then by force failing this point of departure all education and instruction would be impossible and the school useless another difficulty is that of economizing the powers of the pupils that is to say utilizing them to the utmost without wasting them how much rest is necessary how long should any particular work be carried on perhaps 
ten minutes rest may be necessary after the first three quarters of an hour of occupation but after another three quarters of an hour a pause of fifteen minutes may be required and so on throughout the day finally a quarter of an hour's rest may be needed after ten minutes occupation but what instruction is best adapted to the powers of a child during the various hours of the day is it best to begin with mathematics or with dictation at what hours will the child be most inclined to exercise his powers of imagination at nine in the morning or at eleven other anxieties must assail a perfect teacher how should he write on the blackboard so that the children seated at a distance may see for if they do not see his work it is of no avail and how much light shall fall upon the blackboard in order that all may see clearly the white characters on the black surface of what size should be the script specially chosen by the master to suit distant vision this is a serious matter because if the child obliged by discipline to look and learn from a distance should put too great a strain upon his powers of visual accommodation he may in time become short-sighted then the teacher would have manufactured a blind person a serious matter indeed what consideration has ever been given to the state of anxiety of such a teacher to get some idea of, of his anxiety we may think of a young wife about to become a mother who should set herself such problems as the following how can i create an infant if i know nothing of anatomy how can i form its skeleton i must study the structure of the bones carefully i must then learn how the muscles are attached but how will it be possible to put the brain into a closed box and how must the little heart go on beating continually until death is it possible that it will not weary in like fashion she might ponder thus over her newborn babe it is evident that he will not be able to walk if he does not first of all understand the laws of equilibrium if he is left to himself he will not be able to understand these till he is twenty i must therefore prepare to teach him these laws prematurely in order that he may be able to walk as quickly as possible the schoolmaster is the person who builds up the intelligence of the pupil the intelligence of the pupil increases in direct proportion to the efforts of the teacher in other words he knows just what the master has made him know and understands neither more nor less than the master has made him understand when an inspector visits a school and questions the pupils he turns to the master and if he is satisfied says well done teacher for the result is indubitably the work of the master the discipline by which he has fixed the attention of his pupils even to the psychical mechanism which has guided him in his teaching all is due to him god enters the school as a symbol in the crucifix but the creator is the teacher a good deal of help is given to teachers in their superhuman task there is a kind of division of labor by virtue of which more advanced experts prepare the schemata of instruction basing them upon psychology if the teaching is on a scientific plan or on the principles laid down by one of the great pedagogists such as herbart for example moreover the sciences such as hygiene and experimental psychology are further invoked to overcome many practical difficulties and to help in the arrangement of schoolrooms the drawing up of the curriculum timetables etc here for instance are notes for lessons on a psychological basis that is to say lessons which take account of the proper order of secession in which the psychical activity should develop in the mind of the child by exercises of this kind the pupil will not only learn but will develop his intelligence in accordance with the laws governing its formation object lesson a candle education of the sensory and perceptive faculties sight white solid touch greasy smooth nomenclature parts of the candle wick surface extremity 
edges, upper part, lower part, middle part. The candles we use are made of wax mixed with stearin. Stearin is made of the fat of oxen and sheep and pigs. Hence they are called stearin candles. There are also wax candles. These are yellowish and less greasy. Wax is produced by bees. There are also tallow candles. These are very greasy and have a disagreeable smell when burning. Memory. Have you ever seen a candle factory? Have you ever seen a beehive? Of what are the cells of the honeycomb made? When do you light a candle? Have you ever carried a lighted candle carelessly? Did not this cause a disaster? Imagination. Draw the outline of a candle on the blackboard. Comparison, association, abstraction. Similarity and difference in candles of stearin, wax, and tallow. Judgment and reasoning. Are candles useful? Were they more useful formerly or now that we have gas and electric light? Sentiments. Children are greatly pleased by a visit to the candle factory. It is indeed very agreeable to see how candles used by so many people are made. When we can satisfy our desire for instruction, we feel pleasure and contentment. Volition. What should we do with the fat of pigs if we did not know how to make it into stearin? What should we do with wax if we do not know how to utilize it? Man is able to work and to transform many products into useful substances and objects. Work is our life. Blessed be the workers. Let us also love work and devote ourselves diligently hitherto. Note well. The children are all to listen without moving. Any kind of lesson may be based on the same cyclical plan, even a moral lesson, for instance. Moral education derived from the observation of actions. Note well. The actions are all invented and narrated. Agreeable manners. Incident. Is it true, miss, that the village church is more than a kilometer from here. My mother has ordered me to go there. I thought I had arrived, and I was so pleased. I have come a long way, and I am so very, very tired. Indeed, replied the girl, who was standing at the gate of her home. You are still a kilometer and a half from the church, but come through my gate, and take the shortcut I will show you through my fields. You will get to the church in five minutes. What an amiable girl! Successive relations of cause and effect. The village girl showed amenity to the little traveler. The latter reached the church quickly, was saved much fatigue, and felt great relief. Memory. Have you always been pleasant to your companions? Have you always been ready to lend a comrade anything he has asked for? Have you always thanked those who have done your favors in an agreeable manner? Comparison, association, abstraction. Comparison between an agreeable child and a boorish one. Judgment, reasoning. Why is it necessary to be courteous to all? Is it sufficient to give help solely to show oneself to be amiable? Sentiments. He who is amiable has a soul rich in sweetness and suavity. What sympathy he evokes in all. The disagreeable person is irritated by trifles. He excites disgust and fear in others. He who is affable shows love to his neighbor. Volition. Children, accustom yourselves to be pleasant to everyone. You should be pleasant when you are conferring some favor. Otherwise, the favor will seem irksome. When you want something, 
do you ask for it arrogantly if so it will be easier to say no than yes to you on the other hand if you ask politely for something will it not be difficult to refuse you it will perhaps be more interesting to follow a lesson actually given and accepted as a model for teachers in general i therefore reproduce one of the lessons which gained a prize at a competition of teachers held in italy in this according to the subject or theme only one primary psychical activity was to be dealt with namely sensory perception the compositions were distinguished not by the names of the authors but by mottos motto things are the first and best teachers i set myself the following limits to give an idea of icy cold in contrast to that of heat this would be amply sufficient in itself for these ideas are not grains to pick up one after the other but sublime psychical facts of great complexity and consequently very difficult to assimilate combined with the idea to be imparted the cultivation of a sense of compassion and pity for the very poor to whom winter brings such severe sufferings a feeling i have already tried many times to arouse the above is for my own guidance what follows is for the children children how comfortable we are here everything is clean everything is in order i am so fond of you you are so fond of me isn't this true children children say i am i am me too correct tell me gino are you cold you said no at once well no you are right we are really very cosy here there in that corner i point there is a thing which gives out much children say heat it is the stove but outside where there is no stove over there towards the horizon the children are to a certain extent familiar with this word there is no warmth children say it's cold there an answer due to the clarity of the laws of contrast last night while we were asleep while your mother perhaps was mending your clothes dear mother how kind she is well last night so many many white flakes fell softly from the sky snow snow exclaimed the children children let us say so many snowflakes fell how beautiful the snow is let us go and look at it closely children say yes 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 it is so beautiful that i see you would all like to take a little but perhaps that this is not allowed to whom does the snow belong no answer who bought it who made it you no i no your mother no then did your father buy it they look at me in astonishment these are really very strange questions no again well then the snow belongs to everyone and if this is so we may take a little handful of it evident signs of joy i will hand round the boxes you made yesterday these children have not desks with lockers in which they may put their little works using the boxes will be a good way of demonstrating the utility of their work they will do very well to hold the beautiful snow i talk to them as i distribute the boxes that their attention may not flag i will take mine too the one i made with you it is larger than yours so which will hold more snow mine or yours children say yours come then children put a white handful into your boxes how delightful going just stop a moment how comfortable we are here put one hand over your face how warm your face is 
and how warm your hand is too we shall see whether your hands will still be so warm after you have touched the snow children say it will be cold yes indeed going out how beautiful it is it fell down from above the sky has given the earth a beautiful dress all children say white at this juncture my children accustomed to that principle of healthful ordered liberty which is the main factor in the formation of character touch and gather up the snow some of them break the pure surface with little drawings i let them i wait a minute then i make as it were a sudden assault upon their attention children i too will take a little snow but together with all of you stop stand up look well at me let us take away a little stripe of the great cloak let us put it in our boxes that's right re-entering the schoolroom oh how cold it is the children who are not well wrapped up are the coldest poor little things and those who haven't that thing full of burning coal in their houses the children say the stove how cold they will be come now quickly all to your places put the boxes on the desk how cold the snow is did you notice how cold it made your hands which were quite warm children say my hand is cold mine too etc in the courtyard i saw caroline take a little snow and then suddenly let it fall she was not strong enough to bear such cold but then she tried again and the second time she did not drop it child says i didn't i put it it correct quickly into my box children when the cold is as great as the cold of the snow it is called frost say that guido what is the word now you gianina and the snow which is so cold is what who can guess a child says frozen say the snow is frozen we come indoors because it is frosty inside and inside it is children say warm but we brought with us a frozen thing which is called children say snow what is it the snow gives us do you remember children say heat i want maria to tell me and now peppino do you know our mouths also give out heat open yours not too much hold up one hand in front of it the right hand breathe on it as i am doing let us breathe again now let us send our breath outwards as i am doing again 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 that's right now feel you see your mouth too gives out a little children say heat now let us try putting a little snow into it a little piece like this oh the heat of the mouth is escaping it has already gone at the icy touch of the snow children say our mouths are cold now yes that's right they're very very cold so cold that they are what we call children freezing perhaps giuseppe doesn't know he didn't say it with the others say it again that he may say it with you again that will do bravo giuseppe so our mouths were children freezing let us eat another little piece of snow the snow turns to water in our mouths because it is made of water only now bread is made of water too but not only of water what does the baker want to make the dough for bread children flour and what else children salt and what else children yeast i see luby is still eating snow and alfonso too and pierino do you like it children yes signora do you like it children yes signora me too me too correct well eat a little more but not much 
it might make you ill it is so freezing i repeat this word very often because it expresses the idea i am trying to convey when it snows it is so very cold and just think that there are many children many people who are not warmly dressed and have no stoves they are very poor they suffer very much and some of them die poor people how fortunate we are on the other hand we have so many garments they have learned this word to cover ourselves with we have a stove at home and one at school to warm us how lucky we are a child i have no stove at home i know you have not emilio and i am very sorry children you must be kind to emilio and giuseppina because they are very children poor have you eaten it all children no signora now let us go into the courtyard and throw away the rest of the snow then we will put the boxes on this table to dry and to-morrow i will show you a pretty picture of country covered with snow come along bring your boxes and when you have emptied them put them back where i told you i intend to repeat this lesson in another form combining others with it and referring in it to other ideas which bear a relation to that here set forth as everything in the physical and moral world is one and indivisible bound together in closest union human development is gravely impeded by the presentment of isolated educational facts in a desultory manner because it is impossible to disconnect things united by a sacred and eternal law in the above model lesson it is claimed that only two perceptions are dealt with those of cold and heat and that the child has been allowed a good deal of liberty but of a judicious kind now it would be exceedingly difficult to limit the perceptions strictly to two especially when dealing with persons placed in an environment abounding in stimuli who have already stored up a whole chaos of images but such being the object in view it is necessary to eliminate as far as possible all other perceptions to arrest those two and so to polarize attention on them that all other images shall be obscured in the field of consciousness this would be the scientific method tending to isolate perceptions and it is in fact the practical method adopted by us in our education of the senses in the case of cold and heat the child is prepared by the isolation of the particular sense of question he is placed blindfolded in a silent place to the end of that thermic stimuli alone may reach him in front of the child are placed two objects perfectly identical in all characteristics perceptible to the muscular tactile sense of the same dimensions the same shape the same degree of smoothness the same resistance to pressure for instance two india rubber bags filled with the same quantity of water and perfectly dry on the outside the sole difference is the temperature of the water in the two bags in hot one the water would be at a temperature of sixty degrees centigrade in the cold at ten degrees centigrade after directing the child's attention to the object his hand is drawn over the hot bag and then over the cold one while his hand is on the hot bag the teacher says it is hot while he feels the cold one he is told it is cold and the lesson is finished it has consisted merely of two words and of a long preparation designed to ensure that as far as possible the two sensations corresponding to these two words shall be the only ones that reach the child the other senses sight and hearing were protected against stimuli and there was no perceptible difference in the objects offered to the touch save that of temperature thus it becomes approximately probable that the child will achieve the perception of two sensations exclusively and what about the liberty of the child we shall be asked well we admit that every lesson infringes on the liberty of the child and for this reason we allow it to last only for a few seconds just the time to pronounce the two words hot cold but this is effected under the influence of the preparation which by first isolating the sense makes as it were a darkness in the consciousness and then projects only two images into it as if from the screen before a magic lantern 
the child receives his psychical acquisitions, or rather, they are like seeds falling on a fertile soil, and it is in the subsequent free choice and the repetition of exercise, as in the subsequent activity, spontaneous, associative, and reproductive, that the child will be left free. He receives, rather than a lesson, a determinate impression of contact with the external world. It is the clear scientific predetermined character of this contact which distinguishes it from the mass of indeterminate contacts which the child is continually receiving from his surroundings. The multiplicity of such indeterminate contacts will create chaos within the mind of the child. Predetermined contacts will, on the other hand, initiate order therein, because with the help of the technique of isolation, they will begin to make him distinguish one thing from another. The technique of our lessons is governed by experimental psychology, and this trend, without doubt, is in contrast to that of the past, which was governed by speculative psychology, on which the whole of the educational methods commonly in use in schools has hitherto been based. It was Herbart who used the philosophical psychology of his day as a guiding principle to reduce pedagogic rules to a system. From his individual experience, he believed he could deduce a universal method of developing the mind and be made this the psychological basis of methods of teaching. The German pedagogist, whose methods are now, thanks to Quidaro, formerly professor of pedagogy at the University of Rome, and afterward minister of education, adopted for elementary education throughout Italy, gave a unique type of lesson on the four well-known periods, the formal steps, clarity, association, system, method. These may be explained approximately as follows. Presentation of an object and its analytical examination. Clarity. Judgment and comparison with other surrounding objects or with mnemonic images. Association. Definition of the object deduced from preceding judgments. System. New principles derived from the idea which is thus deepened and which will lead to practical application of a moral order. Method. The teacher must guide the child's mind on these lines in every kind of teaching. He must, however, never substitute his own intelligence for that of the child, but rather make the child himself think and induce him to exercise his own activity. For instance, in the association period, the master must not say, Look at such and such an object and at such and such another. See how much alike they are, etc. He should ask the pupil, What do you see when you look around? Is there not something which is like, etc.? Again, in the definition period, the master should not say, A bird is a vertebrate animal covered with feathers. It has two limbs, which have been transformed into wings. But by rapid questions, corrections, and analogies, he should induce the child to find the precise definition for himself. If the mental process of Herbert's four periods is to come naturally, it would be essential that great interest in the object should exist. It is interest which would keep the mind amused, or as the famous pedagogist would say, plunged in the idea, and would maintain it in a system, nevertheless embracing multilateral ideas, and hence it is necessary that interest should be awakened and should persist in all instruction. It is well known that a pupil of Herbert's must, to this end, supplement Herbert's four periods by a prior period, that of interest, linking all new knowledge to the old, going from the known to the unknown, because what is absolutely new can awake no interest. To make oneself interesting artificially, that is, interesting to those who have no interest in us, is indeed a very difficult task, and to arrest the attention hour after hour, and year after year, not of one, but of a multitude of persons who have nothing in common with us, not even years, is indeed a superhuman undertaking. Yet this is the task of the teacher, or, as he would say, his art, to make this assembly of children whom he has reduced to immobility by discipline follow him with their minds, understand what he says, and learn an internal action which he cannot govern, as he governs the positions of their bodies, but which he must win by making himself interesting and by maintaining this interest. The Art of Tuition
says Ardigo, consists mainly of this, to know up to what point and in what manner one can maintain the interest of pupils. The most skillful teachers are those who never fatigue one fraction of a pupil's brain, but act in such a manner that his attention, turning now here, now there, may rest itself and, gaining strength, return to the principal argument of the discourse with renewed vigor. A much more laborious art is that which leads the child to find, by means of its own mental processes, not what it would naturally find, but what the teacher desires, although he does not say what he desires. He urges on the child to associate his ideas spontaneously, as the teacher associates them, and even succeeds in making the child compose definitions with the exact words he himself has fixed upon, without having revealed them. Such a thing would seem the result of some occult science, a kind of conjuring trick. Nevertheless, such methods have been and still are in use, and in some cases they became the sole art of the teacher. When in 1862 Tolstoy was making his tours of inspection in the schools of Germany, he was struck by this method of tuition, and among the pedagogic writings describing his school, Iasnaja Poliana, he reproduces a lesson which deserves to be recorded, although perhaps it would no longer be possible to find an example of such a lesson in any German school. Iasnaja Poliana, 1862. Calm and confident, the professor is seated in the classroom. The instruments are ready. Little tables with the letters. A book with a picture of a fish. The master looks at his pupils. He knows beforehand all they are to understand. He knows of what their souls consist, and various other things he has learned in the seminary. He opens the book and shows the fish. Dear children, what is this? The poor children are delighted to see the fish, unless indeed they already know from other pupils with what sauce it is to be served up. In any case, they answer, it is a fish. No, replies the professor. All this is not an invention nor a satire, but an exact account of what I have seen without exception, in all the best schools in Germany, and in those English schools which have adopted this method of teaching. No, says the professor. Now what is it you do see? The children are silent. It must not be forgotten that they are obliged to remain seated and quiet, each one in his place, and that they are not to move. Well, what do you see? A book, says the most stupid child in the class. Meanwhile, the more intelligent children have been asking themselves over and over again what it is they do see. They feel they cannot guess what the teacher wants and that they will have to answer that this fish is not a fish, but something the name of which is unknown to them. Yes, yes, says the master eagerly, very good indeed, a book, and what else? The intelligent ones guess and say joyfully and proudly, letters! No, no, not at all, says the teacher, disappointed. You must think before you speak. Again, all the intelligent ones lapse into mournful silence. They do not even try to guess. They think of the teacher's spectacles and wonder why he does not take them off instead of looking over the top of them. Come then, what is there in the book? All are silent. Well, what is this thing? A fish, says a bold spirit. Yes, a fish. But is it a live fish? No. It is not alive. Quite right. Then it is, is it dead? No. Right. Then what is this fish? A picture. Just so. Very good. All the children repeat, it is a picture. And they think that is all. Not at all. They have to say that it is a picture which represents a fish. By the same method, the master induces the children to say that it is a picture which represents a fish. He imagines that he is exercising the reasoning faculties of his pupils, and it never seems to enter his head that if it is his duty to teach children to say in these exact words, it is a book with a picture of a fish. It would be much simpler to repeat this strange formula and make his pupils learn it by heart. As a pendant to this old-fashioned lesson witnessed by Tolstoy in an elementary school in Germany, we may cite the following lesson recently set forth by a distinguished French pedagogist, and philosopher, whose textbooks are classics in the schools of his own country and in those of many foreign lands, and are also in use in the teachers' training colleges in Italy. As the subtitle on the title page informs us, it is one of a series of lessons designed 
to moral teachers and citizens who shall be conscious of their duties and useful to families, to the fatherland, and to humanity. We are therefore in the ambit of secondary schools. The lessons we cite is a practical application of the principle of giving lessons by means of interrogation, Socratic method, and deals with a the moral theme, rights. You boys have never mistaken your companion Paul for this table or this tree. Oh, no. Why? Because the table and the tree are inanimate and insensible, whereas Paul lives and feels good. If you strike the table, it will feel nothing, and you will not hurt it. But have you any right to destroy it? No. We should be destroying something belonging to others. Then what is it you respect in the table? The inanimate and insensible wood, or the property of the person to whom it belongs? The property of the person to whom it belongs. Have you any right to strike Paul? No, because we should hurt him, and he would suffer. What is it you respect in him? The property of another, or Paul himself? Paul himself. Then you cannot strike him, nor shut him up, nor deprive him of food? No. The police would arrest us if we did. Ah, ah, you are afraid of the police. But is it only this which prevents you from hurting Paul? Oh, no, sir. It is because we love Paul and do not want to make him suffer, and because we have no right to do so. You think, then, that you owe respect to Paul in his life and his feelings, because life and feelings are things to respect? Yes, sir. Are these all you have to respect in Paul? Let us inquire. Think well. His books, his clothes, his satchel, the luncheon in it. Well, what do you mean? We must not tear his books, soil his clothes, or his satchel, or eat his luncheon. Why? Because these things are his, and we have no right to take things belonging to others. What is the act of taking things that belong to others called? Theft. Why is theft forbidden? Because if we steal, we shall go to prison. Fear of the police again. But is this the chief reason why we must not steal? No, sir, but because we ought to respect the property as well as the persons of others. Very good. Property is an extension of human personality and must be respected as such. And is this all? Is there nothing more to respect in Paul than his body, his books, and his copy books? Do you not see anything else? Can you not think of anything more? I will give you a hint. Paul is an industrious pupil. An honest, good-natured companion. You are all fond of him, and he deserves your affection. What do we call the esteem we all feel for him? the good opinion we have of him. Honor, reputation. Well, this honor, this reputation Paul acquired by good conduct and good manners. These are things which belong to him. Yes, sir, we have no right to rob him of them. Very good, but what do we call this kind of theft, that is, the theft of honor and reputation? And first of all, how can we steal them? Can we take them and put them in our pockets? No, but we can speak evil of him. How? We could say, that he had done harm to one of his companions, that he had stolen apples from a neighboring orchard, that he had spoken ill of another. That is so, but how could you rob him of honor and reputation by speaking thus? Sir, people would no longer believe him if he, they had a bad opinion of him. He would be beaten, scolded, and left to himself. Then, if you speak evil of Paul, and what you say is false, do you give him pleasure? No, sir, we should cause him pain and do him a wrong, which would be very odious and wicked of us. Yes, boys, this lying with intent to injure would be odious and wicked, and it is called calumny. I will explain later that evil speaking differs from calumny or slander, and that what is said is not untrue, and I will point out the terrible consequences of evil speaking and slander. Now let us sum up what we have heard said. Paul is a living and sensitive creature. We ought not to cause him suffering, to rob him or to slander him. We ought to respect him. The honorable things in Paul constitute rights and make him a moral person. The obligation laid upon us to respect these rights is called duty. The obligation and the duty of respecting the rights of others is also called justice. Justice is derived from two Latin words, injuster, meaning to keep oneself in the right. The duties of justice enumerated by us are to be summed up thus, not to kill, not to cause suffering, not to steal, not to slander, always reflect upon the words you say in which not is followed by an at verb in the imperative infinitive, 
What does that mean? An obligation, a command, a prohibition. Go on, explain. The obligation of respect, the command to respect rights, the prohibition of stealing. How may all these things be summed up? In doing no evil. End of part two, chapter two. Chapter 2 of Spontaneous Activity in Education. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Spontaneous Activity in Education by Maria Montessori. Translated by Florence Simmons. Chapter 2 Survey of Modern Education. Part 2 Positive Science Makes Its Appearance in the Schools. Positive science was invited to enter into schools as into a chaos where it was necessary to separate light from darkness, a place of disaster where prompt succor was essential. Discoveries of Medicine, Distortions, and Diseases The first science, indeed, to penetrate into the school was medicine, which organized a special hygiene for the occasion, a kind of Red Cross service. The most interesting part of the hygiene that penetrates into schools was that which diagnosed and described the diseases of school children, that is to say, the maladies contracted solely as a result of study in school. The most prevalent of these maladies are spinal curvature and myopia. The first is caused by excessive sitting and by the injurious position of the shoulders in writing. The second arises from the fact that in the spot where the child has to remain seated, there is not sufficient light for him to see clearly. Or this spot is too far from the blackboard, or from the places where the child has to read, and the prolonged effort of accommodation induces myopia. Other minor generalized maladies were also described. An organic debility so widely diffused that hygiene prescribed as an ideal treatment, a gratuitous distribution of cod liver oil, or of reconstituent remedies in general to all pupils. Anemia liver complaints, and neurasthenia were also studied as school diseases. Thus a new field was opened to hygiene in connection with the most fertile source of professional disease, and reading and writing were carefully studied in relation to pedagogical methods, and in relation to spinal curvature and defective refraction of the eyes. The figure of the child, that victim of unsuitable and disproportionate work, was not hereby brought into strong relief, as might have been expected, by the aid of medicine but a new branch of legal medicine came into being. It was, indeed, medicine which drew attention to the diseases and deaths of the victims in orphan asylums, victims of artificial or irrational feeding, in conjunction with wet nursing. It was medicine which passed in review, one by one, all those individual cases which proclaimed this legal fact. Children have no civil rights. Medicine now entered into another sphere where the victims were not cases, but the generality, the child population in its entirety. And now it is the law itself which imposes duties upon them, and condemns them en masse, to labor for many years in a manner which entails physical torture. If a branch of legal medicine has arisen in connection with criminals, how is it that none should ever have arisen in connection with the innocent? Science has not fulfilled its mission in its dealings with children. Medicine has confined itself to the treatment of diseases artificially produced. It has diagnosed a cause of disease and left this cause undisturbed, content merely to alleviate the resultant evils befalling a multitude of victims. It has not taken up the attitude proper to its great and dignified role of protector of life. It has merely come forward, like the Red Cross service during war, to heal the wounded and alleviate the condition of the suffering. It has not considered that the authority it enjoys as the guardian of health would enable it to utter the supreme cry of peace, putting an end to a war so dangerous, unjust, and inhuman. As in its struggle against microbes, it was the standard bearer in the most glorious of victories over death, so, fighting directly against the causes of the impoverishment of generations, it might have aspired to bear the banner of protector of posterity. Instead of this, it confined itself to the elaboration of a branch of study that mimics science, school hygiene, 
thus making itself the accomplice of a social wrong. Let us glance into a recent treatise of school hygiene, which merely sums up the ideas and the work of the world at large. We will briefly indicate the conditions favorable to the development of spinal curvature. The age when the malady usually appears is that of second infancy, hence its name of spinal curvature of the adolescent. Spinal curvature, caused by rickets, which appears in early childhood, is rarer, and is of less direct interest to us here. The commonest cause, and that on which our attention should be primarily concentrated, is the vicious attitude adopted by the majority of our pupils during their schoolwork. This cause is so universal that we may call spinal curvature the professional disease of the pupil. Dr. Legendre, in a formula which may be judged over-severe, though unhappily it is only too well founded, said of our schools that they are factories for the production of the deformed and the myopic. The main cause of myopia is to be found in the very conditions under which children are gathered together in schools. Insufficiency of light, the over-small type common in school books. The frequent use of the blackboard, on which the teacher is not always careful to make the size of the characters he traces proportionate to the distance at which they have to be read are so many causes of ocular fatigue. The visual keenness of a given eye, says Dr. Le Prince, decreases rapidly when the intensity of the light falls below a certain limit. The pupil, working with insufficient light, repairs the defective keenness of which this is the cause by increasing the visual angle under which the details of the object he is looking at appear to him. In other words, he brings that object inordinately close to him. The time necessary to recognize a given letter increases greatly when the limit of visual acuteness has been reached. Therefore, insufficient light would tend to make work slower, unless the pupil increased acuteness by approaching the object more closely. Thus, myopia constitutes a positive adaptation to the defective conditions of work, enabling the pupil to work more rapidly. Note 6. It would seem therefore natural to say, let the child find himself a better lighted place. If the blackboard is at some distance from him, let him come nearer to it. If the insufficient light retards his work, let him go more slowly. If the questions at issue are such harmless things as changing a place, advancing a step or two, taking a few minutes longer over a task, what tyrant on earth would deny such a small favor, and condemn the suppliant to blindness? Such a tyrant is the teacher who aspires to win the affection of his victims by means of moral exhortations. It would be so simple to allow children, when tired of sitting, to rise, and when tired of writing, to desist, and then their bones would not be twisted. Who can look on unmoved at the spectacle of children whose vertebral column is being deformed by using desks, such as in the Middle Ages the instep was deformed by the torture of the boot? And on what grounds is this odious torture judged to be necessary? because a man has substituted himself for God, desiring to form the minds of children in his own image and likeness. And this cannot be done without subjecting a free creature to torture. This is the only reason. We will now quote the remedies by means of which a so-called science proposes to counteract spinal curvature in school children. It has determined the exact position in which a child may remain seated and at work for a long period of time without injury to the vertebrae. Quote, the child, seated at the table, should have his feet planted flat upon the ground or upon a footrest. The legs should be at right angles to the thighs, as should the thighs be to the trunk, save for a slight inclination of the bench itself. The trunk should be in such a position that there will be no lateral inclination of the vertebral columns, the arms should be parallel with the sides of the body, the thorax should not be interfered with by the front edge of the table, the pelvic basin should be symmetrically supported, the head slightly bent forward at a distance of 30 centimeters from the level of the table, the axis of the eyes, remaining parallel with the front edge of the table, should be horizontal, the forearms, two-thirds of which should be laid on the table, should rest on it, but without leaning upon it. End of quote. To realize all these conditions, it is necessary that the desk should be exactly fitted to the proportions of the child. Its constituent parts should agree with those of the body and limbs of the scholar. 
the following are the measurements which Dufessel considered indispensable in the fashioning of a desk suitable for children. 1. Height. 2. The length of the leg, taken from below the knee, when the child is seated with the legs at right angles to the thighs, and the feet flat on the ground. This measurement gives the required height of the seat from the footrest. 3. The diameter of the body from front to back, taken from the sternum. This, with five centimeters added to it, gives the proper distance from the reading desk to the back of the seat. 4. The length of the femur, two-thirds of which represent the depth of the seat. 5. Finally, the height of the epigastric cavity above the seat, augmented by a few centimeters, indicates the height of the reading desk. We may add that in view of the rapid growth of the child, these measurements should be taken twice in the course of the school year, and children should be made to change places in accordance with these measurements. There is a little crustacean which, coming naked into the world, chooses an empty shell and adapts itself thereto. When it grows larger and the shell becomes too tight, it sallies forth and takes up its abode in a larger one. This the creature does of its own accord, without a savant to measure it or a teacher to choose a new shell for it. But to us and to scientists, a child is inferior to this lowly invertebrate. The difficulty of keeping forty or fifty children motionless for hours in the prescribed hygienic attitude, and of finding desks exactly adapted to these growing bodies, makes this remedy impracticable, so hunchbacks continue among us. The problem remains unsolved. Hence it has been deemed more practical to establish a kind of orthopedic institution within the building itself in certain model schools in Rome. It consists of a costly and elaborate apparatus, to which the pupils come in turn to be suspended by the head after the method adopted in medicine to combat spinal curvature in Pott's disease, tuberculosis of the vertebral column, and rickets. Healthy children, as well as the unsound, suffer by these applications. But on the other hand, the results afford encouraging statistics. If this hanging treatment be initiated regularly at the age of six years, it strikes a perfect balance with the injury caused by prolonged deterioration induced by school desks, and children are delivered from spinal disease. Discoveries of Experimental Psychology Overwork, Nervous Exhaustion Hygiene, making its way into the school, discovered scholar's spinal curvature and scholar's myopia. Experimental psychology discovered the exhaustion due to overwork and studied the fatigue of the scholar. It followed in the beaten track of medicine, that is to say, it sought to alleviate the ills it had diagnosed and instituted a branch of science the title of which is not very clearly defined as yet, for some called it experimental psychology applied to the school, others scientific pedagogy. It is necessary to remember that experimental psychology was established in 1860 by Fechner, who was a physicist accustomed to experiment on things, not on living creatures, and who merely adapted the methods employed in physics to psychical measurements, thus founding psychophysics. The instruments specially invented for esthesiometric measurements were of extreme precision. But the results obtained showed such variations that by mathematical law they could not be attributed to errors of measurement, but were obviously due to errors of method. Indeed, for the measurement of liquids, it is necessary to have an instrument different from that which we use in measuring solids, although we are still in the domain of physics. We cannot measure a stuff by the quart, nor wine by the yard. How much more, then, must the methods of measuring physical substances and spiritual energy differ? After psychophysics, psychophysiology was introduced by Wundt. Wundt, being a physiologist, applied the methods of study proper to physiological functions to psychical study. He did not make the exact metrical instrument his aim, but he measured nervous reactions exactly in time. Fechner's primitive researches made it possible to produce instruments so exact that they can measure the sound made by a drop of water falling from the height of a meter while Wundt's researches have resulted in chronometers which can measure the thousandth part of a second. But the spirit did not correspond to the exactness of research. The results showed by their oscillations that nothing was being measured, that the object to be measured escaped. 
it will suffice to mention that in measuring the nervous currents in rate of transmission of impulse along the nerves and also in the ganglion cells of the spinal marrow exner arrived at a rapidity of eight meters and block at a rapidity of one hundred ninety four meters in the same unit of time in spite of this startling contrast between the precision of the means of research and the huge variations in the results which were shown by mathematical law to be absurd experimental psychology carried on extensive studies under the illusion that it rested upon a mathematical basis it is from this science that a branch has been detached with which to penetrate into the school for the purpose of giving spiritual help to the scholar and fresh vigour to pedagogy methods of research are no longer merely those antiquated psychophysical and psychophysiological methods formerly in favour experimental psychology henceforth emancipated from its origins has developed independently it now relies on purely psychological tests for its researches and although it does not exclude the methods adopted in the laboratory and the use of such accurate and trustworthy instruments as the esthesiometer and the ergograph the school itself has become the chief field of experiment for example one of the most familiar tests of attention is to give a printed page to be read over with directions to strike out every a on the page the time taken to complete this task is measured by chronometer counting aloud from one to a hundred and at the same time carrying on arithmetical operations in writing is a measure of the distribution of the attention provided the time taken be calculated by the chronometer and all errors be noted to make several persons perform similar exercises at the same time enables us to study comparative individual activities in schools exercises in dictation which have been previously determined may be given to a group of scholars care being taken to note the time occupied in performing the exercise and to compare the errors this is also an easy and practical means of obtaining collective results these experiments all psychologists agree should be carried out without interrupting the usual routine of the school they are to be regarded as an addition an extra and may be summed up as a means of scientific research throwing light upon the regular psychical conditions of school studies the principal results of such experiments have been the multiplicity of mistakes made and the difficulty of fixing attention that is to say they reveal the weariness the degree of fatigue in children this gave the alarm old-fashioned pedagogy was concerned solely with what children ought to do the idea that their nervous energies might be impaired was first called into being by the warning note of science researches into the causes of fatigue became more and more frequent and coupled with such researches was the less immediate inquiry as to how fatigue could be combated or alleviated all the factors relating to the question were studied age sex the degree of intelligence the type of individual the influence of the seasons the influence of the various times of the day of the various days of the week of habit intervals of relaxation interest variety of work the position of the body and finally position in reference to the cardinal points science is confronted by a mass of unsolved problems the outcome of all these researches is a growing mass of unsolved problems it has not been established whether males are more easily fatigued than females whether the intelligent are more subject to fatigue than the unintelligent with regard to the individual type tissier's conclusion seems to be the most noteworthy each individual becomes fatigued or not according to his degree of will in connection with the seasons it appears that fatigue increases from the first to the last day of school but it is uncertain whether this is due to the influence of the seasons or whether as skyton affirms the scholar's gradual exhaustion is due to the scholastic system with regard to the time of day it is still a question whether the fatigue produced is less when the pupil works spontaneously but this problem is a difficult one to solve the days of the week when fatigue is least evident are monday and friday but researches made in this connection are not definitive as to habit intervals of rest interest in connection with these factors which are antagonistic to fatigue it has been questioned whether they actually diminish fatigue or merely cloak it 
but no decision has been reached. A great variety of interesting researches have been made into the question of change of work with identical results, namely, that frequent change of work causes greater fatigue than continuous work of one kind, and that a sudden interruption is more fatiguing than persistence. The following experiment, quoted by Clara Ped, was made by Schultz. One day the girls were required to add up figures for twenty-five minutes, and then to copy out passages for another twenty-five minutes. Another day they performed the same work, but it was differently divided. They had to add for fifty minutes, and to copy for another fifty minutes. Now these last tests gave results infinitely superior to the first. And yet it is well known that, in spite of such results, constant interruption and change of work are commonly practiced in schools, as part of a scientific plan for combating fatigue. One of the researches directly relating to schools is that of the ponogenic coefficient of the various subjects of instruction, that is to say, of the degrees of fatigue induced by these. Wagner is of opinion a priori that 100, the maximum coefficient, must be assigned to mathematics. In this case, we should get the following ponogenic coefficients in schools for each subject. Mathematics, 100. Latin, 91. Greek, 90. Gymnastics, 90. History and Geography, 85. French and German, 82. Natural History, 80. Drawing, Religion, 77. We may note the arbitrary and surprising manner in which such results are established. Nevertheless, in the name of experimental science, it is possible to make such deductions as the following. Quote, it would be interesting to inquire if the order of the ponogenic coefficients varies with the age of the children, which would enable us to know on the one hand when the brain is best fitted for the study of any particular subject, and when therefore it would be most judicious to make it predominate in the program. On the other hand, it would help us in the arrangement of the daily timetable. We should take, if possible, the most fatiguing subjects at the beginning of the day. Clariped. Absit. Another order of recent researches is that made into the toxins produced by fatigue. Weichart succeeded in isolating these toxins and in fabricating antitoxins with which he experimented successfully on rats. The experiments were also repeated in a clinic. With regard to the appearance of the toxins, it was found that they were abundantly produced during the performance of wearisome work, whereas there were only traces of them to be found when the work was interesting. Throughout this science so packed with researches which give as their result unsolved problems, we perceive that not one of the factors taken into consideration can alleviate fatigue, interruption and change of work merely aggravate it. The one means by which surmenage, exhaustion due to overwork, can be eliminated is to make work pleasant and interesting, to give joy in work rather than pain. The necessity of making education and instruction attractive has been propounded by all pedagogists worthy of the name, such as Fénelon, Rousseau, Pestalozzi, Herbert, and Spencer, says Clarapède, but it is still unrecognized in the everyday practice of the schools. Upsit. By common consent, the first duty of the educator is that of doing no harm. First, do no harm, a precept also accepted in the practice of medicine. To obey it to the letter is, indeed, impossible, because every method of scholastic education is in some way prejudicial to the normal development of the child. But the educator will seek to alleviate the injury which instruction necessarily entails. Absit. This is indeed cold comfort, after all these studies and researches. A confession that problems have arisen at every step, and that not a single one has been solved. Indeed, Underlying all this is the problem of problems. How to make that place attractive and joyous where hitherto the body has been tortured and contorted and the blood poisoned by weariness. It is impossible to educate without doing harm. But we must do harm that will give pleasure. This is truly an embarrassing position. And this is why an interminable string of notes of interrogation serves as the decorative motive of this new science which might be more appropriately styled ignorabimus. 
and it is for this reason that the considerations indicated by hygiene and psychology now tend to do away altogether with the sum total of irreparable evils commuting the sentence that is to say abbreviating hours of study cutting down the curriculum avoiding written exercises thus a new spectre that of ignorance and henceforth the abandonment of the child for the greater part of the day present themselves as a substitute for the spectre of destruction meanwhile our epoch demands an intensive care of the new generation and the preparation of a culture ever vaster and more complex true it would appear that to-day a way of escape may be offered by the discovery of the antitoxin for fatigue just think exclaims claraped a serum against fatigue how valuable this would be from this point of view i should say that the pronogenic coefficients might find a more practical and rational application than that of the revelation of programs indeed these coefficients indicating the production of toxins would appear destined to determine the dose of antitoxin necessary to nullify the evil effects resulting from each different subject of instruction in the not far distant future when these auxiliary sciences of the school and pedagogy shall have made due progress we shall perhaps see side by side with the orthopedic ward a physiochemical clinic where every evening the pupils as they leave the beneficent suspensory apparatus which counteracts injury to their skeletons may enter with a kind of ponogenic prescription regulated by the teaching they have undergone and receive an injection which will deliver them from the poisonous effects of fatigue this reads like an irony of the worst kind perhaps but this is not the case where the orthopedic institution is already an accomplished fact we may very soon see the chemical clinic established if a problem of liberty is to be solved with machines and if a problem of justice is to be regarded from the chemical point of view similar consequences will be the logical end of sciences developed upon such errors it is obvious that a real experimental science which shall guide education and deliver the child from slavery is not yet born when it appears it will be to the so-called sciences that have sprung up in connection with the diseases of martyred childhood as chemistry to alchemy and as positive medicine to the empirical medicine of bygone centuries i think it will be of interest here to record the impressions of a person who leaving the field of mathematics entered upon the study of biology and experimental psychology it is an account of a young english engineer who had evidently mistaken his vocation and who after studying my method for two years returned to the universities of his own great country as a student of biology this is his opinion of experimental psychology Quote, in psychology we are studying the most modern experimental researches at present we are engaged upon thought and imagination i must confess that i do not find this course very illuminating though i agree that it is necessary to know something of these researches in modern psychology there is nothing at all adequate to the subject of our method these investigators seem to me like persons looking at a tree and noting the most obvious of its external forms the shape of a leaf a stem etc doing all this with great gravity and using very precise language perhaps believing that this constitutes science but often confusing the function of definition with that of description in this manner descriptions of wonderful and fascinating things are reduced to arid definitions in order to be clothed in their science and thus are rendered powerless to inspire thought they never meditate they read a great deal they think in mental images which no more represent facts than a diagram on the blackboard represents a living organ and these images differ among different psychologists but their language is always the same they do all this believing they are making progress and instead of training their pupils to observe for themselves without prejudice they instill their own prejudices into the minds of the students cramming them with definitions and descriptions of the strangest and most amorphous kind which effectually prevent them from thinking for themselves but within the tree there is the fundamental structure which they have not begun to examine though the revelation of this would explain all the external data the details would diminish in importance all these details issuing from a single root might be classified in the simplest manner this science reminds me of that antiquated lore which dealt with the constellations when the laws of planetary motion were not yet known 
and the so-called science confined itself to descriptions of the great bear, the crab, the goat, etc. I detest those dry as dusts, who, unaware of their own ignorance, write enormous arid tomes with an air of great majesty, as if they were revealing absolute knowledge, books that lie heavy on the minds of the students, making them dry as their teachers. But the students seem to me to care only about passing their examinations, and to have no thought of discovering new knowledge. And the professors serve them to this end. Thus we are all in a state of servitude due to a mistaken system of education, which calls loudly for reform. End of chapter 2, part 2 Read by Céline Major Chapter 3 of Spontaneous Activity in Education This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Foster Spontaneous Activity in Education by Maria Montessori Translated by Florence Simmons Chapter 3 My Contribution to Experimental Science The organization of psychical life begins with the characteristic phenomenon of attention. My experimental work with little children from three to six years old has been, in fact, a practical contribution to research which has for its aim the discovery of the treatment required by the soul of the child, a treatment analogous to that which hygiene prescribes for its body. I think, therefore, that it is essential to record the fundamental fact which led me to define my method. I was making my first essays in applying the principles and part of the material I had used for many years previously in the education of deficient children to the normal children of the San Lorenzo Quarter in Rome, when I happened to notice a little girl of about three years old deeply absorbed in a set of solid insets, removing the wooden cylinders from their respective holes and replacing them. The expression on the child's face was one of such concentrated attention that it seemed to me an extraordinary manifestation. Up to this time, none of the children had ever shown such fixity of interest in an object, and my belief in the characteristic instability of attention in young children, who flit incessantly from one thing to another, made me peculiarly alive to the phenomenon. I watched the child intently without disturbing her at first, and began to count how many times she repeated the exercise. Then, seeing that she was continuing for a long time, I picked up the little armchair in which she was seated and placed chair and child upon the table. The little creature hastily caught up her case of insets, laid it across the arms of her chair, and gathering the cylinders into her lap, set to work again. Then I called upon all the children to sing. They sang, but the little girl continued undisturbed, repeating her exercise even after the short song had come to an end. I counted forty-four repetitions. When at last she ceased, it was quite independently of any surrounding stimuli which might have distracted her, and she looked round with a satisfied air, almost as if awaking from a refreshing nap. I think my never-to-be-forgotten impression was that experienced by one who has made a discovery. This phenomenon gradually became common among the children, it may therefore be recorded as a constant reaction occurring in connection with certain external conditions, which may be determined. And each time that such a polarization of attention took place, the child began to be completely transformed, to become calmer, more intelligent, and more expansive. 
It showed extraordinary spiritual qualities, recalling the phenomena of a higher consciousness, such as those of conversion. It was as if in a saturated solution a point of crystallization had formed, round which the whole chaotic and fluctuating mass united, producing a crystal of wonderful forms. Thus, when the phenomenon of the polarization of attention had taken place, all that was disorderly and fluctuating in the consciousness of the child seemed to be organizing itself into a spiritual creation, the surprising characteristics of which are reproduced in every individual. It made one think of the life of man, which may remain diffused among a multiplicity of things, in an inferior state of chaos, until some special thing attracts it intensely and fixes it. And then man is revealed unto himself. He feels that he has begun to live. This spiritual phenomenon, which may co-involve the entire consciousness of the adult, is therefore only one of the constant elements of the phenomena of internal formation. It occurs as the normal beginning of the inner life of children and accompanies its development in such a manner as to become accessible to research as an experimental fact. It was thus that the soul of the child gave its revelations and under their guidance a method of exemplifying spiritual liberty was evolved. The story of this initiatory episode soon spread throughout the world, and at first it seemed like the story of a miracle. Then, by degrees, as experiments were made among the most diverse races, the simple and evident principles of this spiritual treatment were manifested. Psychical development is organized by the aid of external stimuli which may be determined experimentally. The contribution I have made to the education of young children tends, in fact, to specify, by means of the revelations due to experiment, the form of liberty in internal development. It would not be possible to conceive liberty of development if, by its very nature, the child were not capable of a spontaneous organic development if the tendency to develop his energies, expansion of latent powers, the conquest of the means necessary to our harmonious innate development, did not already exist. In order to expand, the child, left at liberty to exercise his activities, ought to find in his surroundings something organized in direct relation to his internal organization which is developing itself by natural laws, just as the free insect finds in the form and qualities of flowers a direct correspondence between form and sustenance. The insect is undoubtedly free when, seeking the nectar which nourishes it, it is in reality helping the reproduction of the plant. There is nothing more marvelous in nature than the correspondence between the organs of these two orders of being destined to such a providential cooperation. The secret of the free development of the child consists, therefore, in organizing for him the means necessary for his internal nourishment, means corresponding to a primitive impulse of the child, comparable to that which makes the newborn infant capable of sucking milk from the breast which by its external form and elaborated sustenance corresponds perfectly to the requirements of the infant. It is in the satisfaction of this primitive impulse, this internal hunger, that the child's personality begins to organize itself and reveal its characteristics, just as the newborn infant, in nourishing itself, organizes its body and its natural movements.
We must not therefore set ourselves the educational problem of seeking means whereby to organize the internal personality of the child and develop his characteristics. The sole problem is that of offering the child the necessary nourishment. It is by this means that the child develops an organized and complex activity, which, while it responds to a primitive impulse, exercises the intelligence and develops qualities we consider lofty, and which we supposed were foreign to the nature of the young child, such as patience and perseverance in work, and in the moral order, obedience, gentleness, affection, politeness, serenity, qualities we are accustomed to divide into different categories, and as to which, hitherto, we have cherished the illusion that it was our task to develop them gradually by our direct interposition. Although in practice we have never known by what means to do so successfully. In order that the phenomenon should come to pass, it is necessary that the spontaneous development of the child should be accorded perfect liberty, that is to say, that its calm and peaceful expansion should not be disturbed by the intervention of an untimely and disturbing influence, just as the body of the newborn infant should be left in peace to assimilate its nourishment and grow properly. In such an attitude ought we to await the miracles of the inner life, its expansions, and also its unforeseen and surprising explosions. Just as the intelligent mother, only giving her baby nourishment and rest, contemplates it, seeing it grow, and awaits the manifestations of nature, the first tooth, the first word, and finally the action by which the baby will one day rise to his feet and walk. But to ensure the psychical phenomena of growth, we must prepare the environment in a definite manner, and from this environment offer the child the external means directly necessary for him. This is the positive fact which my experiment has rendered concrete. Hitherto the liberty of the child has been vaguely discussed. No clearly defined limit has been established between liberty and abandonment. We were told, Liberty has its limits. Liberty must be properly understood. But a special method indicating how liberty should be interpreted and what is the intuitive quid which ought to coexist with it had not been determined. The establishment of such a method should open up a new path to all education. It is therefore necessary that the environment should contain the means of auto-education. These means cannot be taken at random. They represent the result of an experimental study which cannot be undertaken by all, because a scientific preparation is necessary for such delicate work. Besides, like all experimental study, it is laborious, prolonged, and exact. Many years of research are required before the means really necessary for psychical development can be set forth. Those educationalists who leave the great question of the liberty of the pupil to the good sense or to the preparation of the master are very far from solving the problem of liberty. The greatest scientist or the person most fitted by nature to teach, could never of himself discover such, because, to preparation and natural gifts, the further factor of time must be added, the long period of preparatory experiment. Therefore, a science which has already provided the means for self-education must exist beforehand. Today, he who speaks of liberty in the schools ought at the same time to exhibit objects, approximating to a scientific apparatus, which will make such liberty possible. The scientific instrument must be constructed upon a basis of exactitude, 
just as the lenses of the physicist are constructed in accordance with the laws of the refraction of light, so the pedagogic instrument should be based on the psychical manifestations of the child. Such an instrument may be compared to a systemized mental test. It is not, however, established upon a basis of external measurement for the purpose of estimating the amount of instantaneous psychical reaction which it produces. It is, on the contrary, a stimulus which is itself determined by the psychical reactions it is capable of producing and maintaining permanently. It is the psychical reaction, therefore, that in this case determines and establishes the systematic mental test. The psychical reaction which constitutes the sole basis of comparison in the determination of the tests is a polarization of the attention and the repetitions of the actions related to it. When a stimulus corresponds in this manner to the reflex personality, it serves not to measure but to maintain a lively reaction. It is therefore a stimulus to the internal formation. Indeed, upon such activity, awakened and maintained, the accompanying organism initiates its internal elaborations in relation to the stimuli. This does not penetrate into the ancient ambit of pedagogy as a science that measures the personality, as the experimental psychology introduced in schools has hitherto done, but as a science that transforms the personality and is therefore capable of taking its stand as a true and real pedagogy. Whereas the ancient pedagogy in all its various interpretations started from the conception of a receptive personality, one, that is to say, which was to receive instructions and to be passively formed, this scientific departure starts from the conception of an active personality, reflex and associative, developing itself by a series of reactions induced by systematic stimuli which have been determined by experiment. This new pedagogy accordingly belongs to the series of modern sciences and not to antique speculations, although it is not directly based on the purely metric studies of positive psychology. But the method which informs it, namely experiment, observation, evidence, or proof, the recognition of new phenomena, their reproduction and utilization, undoubtedly place it among the experimental sciences. External stimuli may be determined in quality and quantity. Nothing can be more interesting than such experiments. By their means, external stimuli may be determined with the greatest precision, both as regards quality and quantity. For instance, very small objects of various geometric forms will only attract the fugitive attention of a child three years old. But by increasing the dimensions gradually, we arrive at the limit of size when these objects will fix the attention. Then such objects excite an activity which becomes permanent and the resulting exercise becomes a factor of development. The experiment is repeated with a number of children and thus the dimensions of a series of objects are established. It is the same with colors and with every kind of quality. In order that a quality should be felt to such a degree as to fix the attention, a certain extension and a certain intensity of the stimulus are necessary, which may be determined by the degree of psychical reaction shown by the child. As, for instance, the minimum chromatic extension sufficient to attract the attention to the colored tablets, etc., Quality, therefore, is determined by a psychical experiment demonstrating the activity it produces in a child, who will continue the exercise with the same object for a long time, 
thus elaborating a phenomenon of internal development, of self-formation. Among the characteristics of the objects, one must be pointed out, which demands the highest degree of activity in the intelligence, they contain in themselves control of error. To make the process one of self-education, it is not enough that the stimulus should call forth activity, it must also direct it. The child should not only persist for a long time in an exercise, he must persist without making mistakes. All the physical or intrinsic qualities of the objects should be determined, not only by the immediate reaction of attention they provoke in the child, but also by their possession of this fundamental characteristic, the control of error, that is to say, the power of evoking the effective collaboration of the highest activities, comparison, judgment. For instance, one of the first objects which attract the attention of the child of three years old, the solid insets, a series of cylinders of various dimensions to be placed in or taken out of a block with corresponding holes, contains the most mechanical control because if a single mistake be made in placing the cylinders, one of these must be left out at the end of the exercise. Hence, a mistake is an obstacle only to be overcome by correction, for without it the exercise cannot be completed. On the other hand, the correction is so easy that the child makes it himself. The little problem suddenly presenting itself to the child almost like the unexpected object of a jack-in-the-box, has interested him. It is, however, noteworthy that the problem thus presented is not in itself the stimulus to interest. It is not that which incites to the repetition of the act, to the progress of the child. What interests the child is the sensation not only of placing the objects, but of acquiring a new power of perception, enabling him to recognize the difference of dimension in the cylinders, a difference which he did not at first notice. The problem presents itself solely in connection with the error. It does not accompany the normal process of development. An interest stimulated merely by curiosity, by a problem, would not be that formative interest which wells up from the needs of life itself and therefore directs the building up of the spiritual personality. If it were only the problem which should lead the soul to find itself, order might be dissipated by it, as by any other external cause which tends to seduce life into false paths. I lay, perhaps, excessive stress upon this point in answer to very important objections and observations that have been made to me. Indeed, in the second series of objects designed to educate the eye to appreciate dimensions, the control of error is not mechanical but psychological. The child himself, whose eye has been educated to recognize the differences of dimension, will see the error, provided the objects be of a certain size and attractively colored, it is for this reason that the next objects contain, so to say, the control of error in their own size and in their bright colors. A control of error of a totally different kind, and of a much higher order, is that offered by the material of the arithmetical frame, in which the control will consist in the comparison of the child's own work with that of the model, a comparison which denotes a remarkably intelligent effort of will on the part of the child, and places him thenceforth in the true conditions of conscious auto-education. But however slight the control of error may be, and in spite of the fact that this diverges more and more from an external mechanism, to rely upon the internal activities which are gradually developing, it always depends like all the qualities of the objects, upon the fundamental reaction of the child, 
who accords it prolonged attention and repeats the exercises. On the other hand, the experimental criterion is different in determining the quantity of the objects. When the instruments have been constructed with great precision, they provoke a spontaneous exercise so coordinated and so harmonious with the facts of internal development that at a certain point a new psychical picture, a species of higher plane in the complex development, is revealed. The child turns away spontaneously from the material, not with any sign of fatigue, but rather as if impelled by fresh energies and his mind is capable of abstractions. At this stage of development, the child turns his attention to the external world and observes it with an order which is the order formed in his mind during the period of the preceding development. He begins spontaneously to make a series of careful and logical comparisons, which represent a veritable spontaneous acquisition of knowledge. This is the period henceforth to be known as the period of discoveries, discoveries which evoke enthusiasm and joy in the child. The more elevated level of development is extremely fruitful in its last ascent. It is essential that the child's attention should not be directed to the objects when the delicate phenomenon of abstraction begins. For instance, the teacher who invites the child to continue his operations with the material at such a moment will retard his spontaneous development and place an obstacle in his way. If the enthusiasm, which leads the child to rise to greater heights and experience so many intellectual emotions be extinguished, a path of progress has been closed. Now, the same error may be committed by an excessive quantity of the educative material. This may dissipate the attention, render the exercises with the objects mechanical, and cause the child to pass by his psychological moment of ascent without perceiving it and seizing it. Moreover, such objects are then futile, and by their futility the child may lose his soul. The thing to be exactly determined is, what is necessary and sufficient as a response to the internal needs of a life in process of development, that is, of upward progression, of ascent? Now in determining the quantity, we must be guided by the expression, and at the same time by the active manifestations of the child. Those children who have long been occupied at with these determined objects, showing every sign of absorbed attention, will all of a sudden begin to rise gradually and insensibly, like an aeroplane when it completes its short journey upon the ground. Their apparent indifference to the objects is revealed in its true essence by the intense and radiant expression of the face, which is animated by the liveliest joy. The child may seem to be doing nothing, but this will only be for a moment. Very soon he will speak, and so will reveal what is happening within him, and then his ebullient activity will carry him along in a series of explorations and discoveries. He is saved. Now take the case of other children in whom the same primitive phenomenon is taking place, but who are surrounded by too great a profusion of objects. At the moment of maturity, they are seen to be caught, obstructed, almost palpably entangled in the toils that bind them to the earth. A diminution of the absorbed attention bestowed upon the new objects, instability, and consequently fatigue, manifests themselves in an obvious extinction of internal activity. The child's bearing deteriorates. He indulges in loud, empty laughter rude actions, and indolence. He demands other objects, and then again other objects, because he has remained imprisoned in the vicious circle of vanities. 
and is no longer sensible to anything but the desire to alleviate his weariness. Like the adult who, during a chaotic life, commits kindred errors, he becomes undisciplined, feeble, and in peril of perdition. If someone does not help him by wrestling from him the futile objects and pointing out his heaven to him, he will hardly have the energy to save himself. These two extreme types will give an idea of the criteria by which we experimentally determine the quantity of the material necessary for development. Overabundance debilitates and retards progress. This has been proved again and again by my collaborators. If, on the other hand, the material be insufficient and the primary auto-exercise incapable of leading the child onto that maturity which causes him to ascend, there will be no explosion of that spontaneous phenomenon of abstraction, which is the second stage of an auto-education advancing in infinite progression. The same fundamental phenomenon of absorbed and prolonged attention, which leads to repetition of the acts, guides us in determining the stimuli suitable to the age of the child. A stimulus which will cause a child of three years old to repeat an act forty times in succession may only be repeated ten times by a child of six. The object which arouses the interest of a child of three no longer interests a child of six. Nevertheless, the child of six is capable of fixing his attention for a much longer period than a child of three, when the stimulus is suited to his activities. If, indeed, a little child of three may achieve as his maximum the repetition of an act forty times in succession, the child of six is capable of repeating two hundred times an act which interests him. If the maximum period of continuous work on the same object may be half an hour for the child of three, it may be over two hours for the child of six. Hence, to establish systematic tests for a certain purpose, such as that of preparing children to write, without taking their ages into account, is valueless. For example, my system of writing is based upon the direct preparation of the movements which physiologically concur to produce writing, i.e., manipulation of the instrument of writing and the tracing of the letters of the alphabet. The children, filling in the contours of the insets with innumerable parallel strokes in the one case and touching the sandpaper letters in the other, fix the two muscular mechanisms so perfectly that the final result is an explosion of spontaneous writing, extraordinarily uniform in all the children. Because, as if all molded to a common form, they have fixed the necessary movements by touching the same alphabet and therefore reproduce its forms faithfully. To bring this about, to establish a real motor mechanism, it is essential that the exercise should be repeated over and over again. Now the children who take most interest in filling in the figures with parallel strokes, and above all in touching the letters, are, at most, between four and five years old. If we offer the same material to a child of six, he will not touch the letters often enough, and he will always write imperfectly in comparison with the child who has begun the exercise at a suitable age. This applies also to all the other details of the system. It is therefore possible to determine experimentally with, I believe, a precision not hitherto attained, what is the mental attitude of the child at various ages, and hence, if the fitting material for development be offered, what will be the average level of intellectual development according to age. Here we have an indication of the possibility of determining the means of development so exactly as to establish a true correspondence between internal needs and external stimuli, just as actual as the correspondence which exists between the insect and the flower. 
he who has all this material ready to his hand has an easy task in bringing about the natural development of the psychic life of the child with such objects at his disposal every teacher may realize the ideal of liberty in the school this long occult experiment suggested to me as i have already said by itar and seguin is in fact my initial contribution to education all this preparatory work has served for the determination of the method now well known but it is also the key to its continuation the material of development is necessary only as a starting point in the organization of the external means of development there remains a material impress of the internal development and of that which the soul needs in its progress during its course and in its flights the material part does not contain the impress of the whole soul any more than the impress of the foot is the impress of the whole body the aviation ground is not the sphere of action proper to the aeroplane but it is the part of terra firma necessary for flight and it is also the resting place the refuge the hangar to which the aeroplane must always return thus in psychical formation there is a necessary material part from which the spirit rises and where it should find repose refuge and a point of support without this it could not grow and rise freely in order that it may be a true support it ought to reproduce its forms and contain them in the part corresponding to the peculiar functions of the material aid thus for instance in the first period of the psychical life the material corresponds to the primitive exercises of the senses it is in quality and quantity determined by the sensory needs given by nature and permits an exercise of the activities sufficient to mature a superior psychical state of observation and abstraction vice versa nothing corresponds in the material to the subsequent career which the childish spirit accomplishes with such delight and with so much acquisition of knowledge but we then see the spirit eager for higher kinds of exercise and now we witness the same primitive phenomenon of attention which will exercise itself henceforth upon the alphabet and arithmetical material repeating in a more complex form methodical exercises of the intelligence by linking auditory images with the visible and motor images of the spoken and written word and in the positive study of quantities proportions and number the same concomitant phenomena of patience and perseverance then manifest themselves together with those of vivacity activity and joy characteristic of the spirit when the internal energies have found their keyboard the gymnasium in which they exercise themselves freely and tranquilly and the spirit organized in this manner under the guidance of an order which corresponds to its natural order becomes fortified grows vigorously and manifests itself in the equilibrium the serenity the self-control which produces the wonderful discipline characteristic of the behavior of our children the external material then should present itself to the psychical requirements of the child as a staircase which will help him to ascend step by step and on the steps of the staircase there will of necessity be disposed the means of culture and of the higher formation therefore the psychical exercises require new material and this if it is to fulfill its purpose must contain 
new and more complex forms of objects capable of fixing the attention, of making the intelligence ripen in the continual exercise of its own energies, and of producing those phenomena of persistence in application and of patience, to which will be added elasticity, psychical equilibrium, and the capacity for abstraction and spontaneous creation. Thus, in the subsequent development of the children, we see them applying themselves to those exercises of the memory which seem to us most arid, and because a desire has been born in them, not only to retain the images they encounter in the world, but also to acquire knowledge rapidly by a determined effort. An example of this is seen in the surprising yet common phenomenon of committing the multiplication table to memory, whereas the memorization of poems and prose extracts, although this is sometimes a passion, causes us no surprise. Very interesting again is the detachment the child shows at a certain point from the aids of arithmetical calculation. At a certain stage of maturity, he desires to reason in the abstract and make abstract calculations with numbers. As if obeying an internal impulse which seeks to liberate the soul from every material bond and at the same time to effect an economy of time. Hereupon we see children of eight years old become eager and precocious calculators. Children thus launched upon the enterprises of self-education acquire a remarkable sensibility as to their own internal needs. Just as the newborn infant, whose food is rationally regulated, is silent and tranquil during the two hours of digestion and assimilation, and cries out the moment the hour for a fresh meal has struck, so do these children ask for help, ask for new materials, new forms of work, as soon as they have accomplished their mysterious phenomena of internal maturation, and ask for them determinately, indicating their most immediate need, just as one in physical want would be able to state distinctly whether he were hungry, thirsty, or sleepy. A child, in like manner, asks for reading or grammatical exercises or means for observing nature. His sensibility manifests itself in a lucid and intense desire, to which the teacher has only to respond. It is evident that some external basis is necessary in the progressive development of such phenomena, and that the teacher, who is to respond to the requests of the child in conscious evolution, cannot do so adequately by haphazard means, he must be guided by conditions previously determined by experience. In other words, those external means already alluded to several times, that staircase, the steps of which lead the soul upwards, must have been already established by experience. Just as all the preceding means of the first development of the infant were established. The construction of the ascending stairway, of the external means of support for the soul in process of evolution, is gradually amplified like an inverted cone, the apex of which touches the very beginnings of psychical life. Resting upon that primitive impulse which attracts the child of two and a half to the sensory stimuli, just as hunger leads the newborn infant to perform the wonderful, complex action of sucking. And as these external means multiply, they are complicated more and more by the growing psychical needs of the child and comprise within them the principles of culture. The highest external organization is not based solely upon psychological necessities, but also upon those factors which take into account the cultural aspect itself. Each subject of study, as, for instance, arithmetic, grammar, geometry, 
natural science, music, literature, should be presented by means of external objects upon a well-defined systematic plan. The essentially psychological character of the preliminary work must now be supplemented by the collaboration of specialists in each subject in order to assure the establishment of that aggregate of means necessary and sufficient to incite to auto-education. This is the experimental preparatory work which establishes those means of development, those external impressions necessary to unfold the inner life, and an exact correspondence to the psychical needs of formation is essential in their construction. Up to a certain point, they might correspond with the so-called didactic or objective material of the old methods. Their significance, however, is profoundly different. The objective material of the old schools was an aid to the teacher in making his explanations comprehensible to a collective class listening passively to him. The objects were related solely to the things to be explained and these were chosen at random, that is to say, without any scientific criterion of their relation to the psychical needs of the child. Here, on the other hand, the means of development are experimentally determined with reference to the psychical evolution of the child, and their aim is not to give mere instruction. They represent the means which induce a spontaneous interpretation of the internal energies. The external material is then offered and left freely to the natural individual energies of the child. They choose the objects they prefer, and such preference is dictated by the internal needs of psychical growth. Each child occupies himself with each object chosen for as long as he wishes, and this desire corresponds to the needs of the intimate maturation of the spirit, a process which demands persevering and prolonged exercise. No guide, no teacher can divine the intimate need of each pupil and the time of maturation necessary to each, but only leave the child free, and all this will be revealed to us under the guidance of nature. Psychical Truths it is necessary to adopt a scientific point of view in order to interpret the facts that reveal themselves in children when they are developed upon this system, and to divest oneself completely of the old scholastic conception according to which the progress of the child is assessed according to his proficiency in the various subjects of study. Here, almost like the naturalist, it is essential to observe the development of certain phenomena of life. It is true that we prepare special external conditions, but the psychical effects are directly bound up with the spontaneous development of the internal activity of the child. Hence, there is no direct correspondence between teacher and child. Instruction is certainly not a cause of the effects observed. It is the objects of this method which, as reagents, provoke special psychical reactions. These may be summed up as an awakening, as an organization of the personality. Discipline, as the first result of an order establishing itself within, is the principal phenomenon to be looked for as the external sign of an internal process that has been initiated. During the first days when a new school is opened, we may consider a certain initial disorder as characteristic, especially if the teacher is making her first experiment, and consequently is handicapped by her over-sanguine expectations. The immediate response of the child to the material does not take place. The teacher is perhaps discomfited by the fact that the children do not throw themselves as she had hoped, upon the objects, choosing them according to their individual taste. If, indeed, the pupils are very poor children, this phenomenon does nearly always happen at once. 
but if they are well-to-do children, already sated by the variety of their pr processions, and by the most costly toys, they are very rarely attracted at first by the stimuli presented to them. This naturally leads to disorder when the mistress makes a kind of chain of that liberty she is to respect, and a dogma of the correlation existing between the stimulus and the childish soul. Experienced teachers, on the other hand, understand better that liberty begins when the life that must be developed in the child is initiated, and they possess a tact which greatly facilitates orientation in the initial period. However, an experience under the most difficult conditions, as between a teacher making her first experiment and a class of wealthy children, is more instructive and gives us a clearer picture of the fundamental psychical phenomenon which may be compared to the order which springs up out of chaos. I quote in this connection various descriptions, some of which already have been published, among them that given by Miss George of her first school in the United States and that of Mademoiselle Dufresne's in England. The initial disorder is eloquently set forth by Miss George. They, the children, at first snatch the objects out of each other's hands. If I tried to show an object to any particular pupil, the others dropped what they themselves were holding and gathered aimlessly and noisily round us. When I had finished explaining the nature of an object, all the children snatched at it and quarreled for its possession. The children showed no interest in the material. They passed from one object to another without persevering in the use of any. One of the children was so incapable of keeping still that he could not remain seated long enough to run his fingers round one of the little circular objects we give the children. In many cases, the movements of the children were quite aimless. They ran round the room without any apparent object. During these moments, they made no attempt to respect the objects about them. Indeed, they stumbled against the table, upset the chairs, and stepped upon the material. Sometimes they began an occupation at one spot, then ran off in another direction. They took up the objects and cast them aside capriciously. Miss Dufresne describes the initial disorder of her first attempt as follows. I must confess that the first four weeks were disheartening. The children could not settle to a task for more than a few moments. They showed no perseverance, no initiative. At times they followed one another like a flock of lambs. When one child took up an object, all the others wanted to imitate him. Sometimes they rolled on the floor and overturned the chairs. From an experiment with rich children here in Rome, we get the following laconic description. The greatest difficulty was the question of discipline. The children showed a complete lack of attraction to their work and seemed disinclined to begin upon it. These persons, who were all working independently, are all agreed later in their accounts of the initiation of order. The phenomenon is identical. At a given moment, the child begins to show an intense interest in one of the exercises. It is by no means necessary that it should be that exercise pertaining to the object determined as the first series. It may be any other object that fixes the attention of the child so deeply. The important factor is not the external object, but the internal action of the soul responding to a stimulus and arrested by it. Now when a child shows the this deep interest in any one of the objects we present to him as something answering to his psychical needs, he goes on to show a like interest in all the objects and begins to develop activities as by a natural phenomenon. When once the initiation has taken place, it leads to progression which goes on steadily and develops of its own accord. 
Moreover, the phenomenon is not that of the slow and gradual progression that might be produced by a measured and systematic external action. Rather, it has the explosive characteristic of unsuspected facts that establish themselves suddenly and makes us think of the crisis of physiological life, so characteristic in the period of growth. Thus, it is from one day to another that the baby cuts a tooth, from one day to another that he utters his first word, from one day to another that he takes his first step. And when the first tooth has been cut, the whole set of teeth will come. When the first word has been uttered, language will be developed. When the first step has been taken, the power of walking has been established once for all. Similar crises occur in the first achievement of psychic order, which is the beginning of progressive evolution in the inner life. I quote the following sentences from Miss George's description of the advent of discipline. In a few days, that nebulous mass of whirling particles, the disorderly children, began to take definite form. The children seemed to begin to find their own way. In many of the objects they had at first despised as silly playthings, they began to discover a novel interest. And, as a result of this new interest, they began to act as independent individuals. Miss George's subsequent expression is, They became extremely individual. Thus it came to pass that an object of absorbing interest to one child had not the slightest attraction for another. The children were strongly differentiated in their manifestations of attention. The battle is only definitively won when the child discovers some particular object which spontaneously excites great interest in him. Sometimes this enthusiasm awakens unexpectedly or with curious rapidity. On one occasion, I had tried a child with nearly all the objects of the series, without exciting the smallest spark of interest. Then I casually showed him the two tablets of red and blue colors, and called his attention to the difference of tint. He seized them at once with a kind of thirstiness, and learned five different colors in a single lesson. During the following days, he took nearly all the objects of the series, which he had at first despised, and little by little mastered them all. A child who at first had very little power of concentrating his attention found an outlet from this state of chaos by means of one of the most complex objects of the material, the so-called length rods. He played with these continually for a whole week and learned to count and make simple additions. He then began to turn to the cylinders and the insets, the simpler objects, and showed interest in every part of the system. Directly the children find their objects interesting, their disorderliness disappears at once. Their mental restlessness is at an end, and they amuse themselves with the blocks, the colors, etc. It is very interesting to follow Miss George again in her description of the special qualities that develop after such a phenomenon. She illustrates the birth of individuality by a pretty anecdote. They were two sisters, one of three years old, the other of five. The child of three could hardly be said to exist as an individual, so minutely did she imitate her elder sister. For example, the elder child had a blue pencil, and the little one was not happy till she too had a blue pencil. When the elder sister ate bread and butter, whatever the little one had of a different kind, she would touch nothing but bread and butter, and so on. This child took no interest in anything in the school, but merely followed her sister, imitating everything she did. One day the little one became interested in the pink cubes, built up the tower with the liveliest interest, repeated the exercise several times, and completely forgot her sister. The older girl was so astonished at this 
that she called her little sister and said to her, How is it that while I am filling in a circle, you are building the tower? From that day, the younger child became a personality. She began to develop independently and was no longer merely the shadow or reflection of her sister. These interesting facts concerning the spontaneous development of qualities, which hitherto were non-existent in the individual, and which exploded after the fundamental phenomenon of intense and prolonged interest in a task, had manifested itself, have been confirmed by repeated experiments in a great variety of places made by persons who had had no sort of communication with one another. Thus, for instance, Miss Dufresne speaks of a little girl of four years old, who seemed quite incapable of carrying a glass of water even only half full without spilling it, so much so that she turned away from such a task, knowing she could not accomplish it. One day she became absorbed in work with one or other of the objects, and after this she began to carry glasses of water with the greatest ease and as some of her companions were now painting with watercolors, it became her great delight to carry water to them all without spilling a single drop. Another most significant fact is related by Miss Barton, an Australian teacher. Among her pupils was a little girl who had not yet developed articulate speech and only gave utterance to inarticulate sounds. Her parents had had her examined by a doctor to find out if she were normal. The doctor declared the child to be perfectly normal and considered that though she had not as yet developed speech, she would do so in time. This child became interested in the solid insets and amused herself for a long time taking the cylinders out of the cavities and putting them back in their places. And after repeating the work with intense interest, she ran to the teacher saying, come and see. A phenomenon of constant occurrence when the children begin to be interested in the work and to develop themselves is the lively joy which seems to possess them. Certain psychologists would say it is the sentimental note corresponding to the intellectual acquisition. A physiologist, making an exact comparison, might affirm that joy is the indication of internal growth just as an increase in weight is the indication of bodily growth. The children themselves seem to have the sensation of their spiritual growth, a consciousness of the acquisitions they are making by thus amplifying their own personalities. They demonstrate with joyful effusion the higher process which is beginning within them. All the children, says Miss George, show that pride we ourselves experience when we have really produced something novel. They skip round me and throw their arms about my neck when they have learned to do some simple thing, saying, I did it all alone. You did not think I could have done that. I did it better today than yesterday. It is after all these manifestations that a true discipline is established the most obvious result of which are closely related to what we will call respect for the work of others and consideration for the rights of others. Henceforth, a child no longer attempts to take away another's work, even if he covets it. He waits patiently until the object is free, and very often a child becomes interested in watching a companion at work on some object he would like to use himself. Afterwards, when discipline has been established by these internal processes, it will happen all at once that a child will work quite independently of the others, almost as if to develop his own personality. But no moral isolation results from such work. On the contrary, there is a mutual respect and affection between the children, a sentiment which unites instead of separating and hence is born that complex discipline which, moreover, contains within itself the sentiment that must accompany the order of a community. Miss Dufresne says, 
After the Christmas holidays, when school began again, there was a great change in the class. It seems that discipline was establishing itself, without any effort on my part. The children appeared to be too much absorbed in their work to indulge in any of the disorderly actions which had marked their conduct in the beginning. They went spontaneously to the cupboards to choose the objects which had bored them formerly. They took the geometrical insets, the graduated cylinders, and began to touch the outlines of the wooden forms with their fingers. The younger children showed a preference for the buttoning and lacing frames. They took one after the other without any sign of fatigue and seemed delighted with the new objects. An atmosphere of industry pervaded the schoolroom. The children who had hitherto chosen objects on the impulse of the moment henceforth manifested a desire for some sort of rule, a personal and internal rule. They concentrated their efforts on the task, working accurately and methodically, and showing real satisfaction in surmounting the difficulties. This precision in work produced an immediate effect on their characters. They became capable of controlling their nerves. The instance which struck Miss Dufresne most was that of a little boy of four and a half, who at first had seemed very nervous and excitable and had disturbed the whole class. The imagination of this child had been developed in an extraordinary manner, so that when an object was given to him, he took no notice of the actual form of the object, but personified it, and further personified himself, talking perpetually, pretending to be someone else, and seeming incapable of fixing his attention upon the objects. When his mind was in this chaotic state, he was unable to perform any precise action. He could not, for instance, button a single button. All at once a miracle seemed to take place within him. I noted the great change in him with astonishment. He took one of the exercises as his favorite task, then went on to choose all the others in succession, and thus calmed his nerves. I will choose from various individual studies made by two mistresses of a children's house at Rome for well-to-do children those of two children of very different characters. One of these children came to the school too late, when he was too old, and had already developed in another environment. The other is a little creature of the normal age for entrance to the children's houses. The older child, a boy of five, had already been to a Frobelian kindergarten, where he was considered very troublesome because of his restlessness. For the first few days he was a torment to us, because he wanted to work, but could not settle to any occupation. He said of everything, this is a game, and ran about the classroom or annoyed his companions. At last he began to take an interest in drawing. Although normally drawing comes after the sensory exercises, he was left at liberty to do what he wished. The teachers rightly thought that it would be useless to insist that the child should apply himself to a different task. Indeed, this child, having passed the age when the primary materials answer to the psychical needs of childhood, was for the first time attracted by an exercise of a higher order, that of drawing. Whereas at first the child had passed from one occupation to another, and had even taken up the letters of the alphabet, but had never settled to work with any of the objects, now suddenly discipline was reached. We do not know exactly at what moment the change took place, but discipline was maintained and perfected, and reached a higher level in proportion to the growing interest of the child in every kind of occupation. Interest having been primarily aroused by drawing, the child spontaneously went on to the rods used in the teaching of length, then to placing the plain geometric insets, and so gradually worked through all the earlier sensory stimuli which the teacher had passed over. Thus we see that the older child chooses the objects in inverse order, 
proceeding almost methodically from the most difficult to the elementary. The other child of three was also quite undisciplined. The teachers were beginning to despair of producing order in this case, when the child began to take an interest in the solid insets and in one of the frames. Thereupon he worked steadily and ceased to disturb his companions. End of chapter 3, part 1《Directed by Signorina Macaroni, it was possible to make more methodical observations, and these were represented by diagrams, in order to demonstrate the course of the phenomena more clearly. The transverse line AB represents the quiescent state. The phenomena of order, work, are represented above, those of disorder below. When a child has become calm after the first strong attraction to a task, a permanent state of order may be established in him. At this stage, the conditions most favorable to work may be studied. There follows a diagram with the caption Primitive Curve of Ordered Work. This is the manner in which it develops, individual type of a morning of disciplined work. The child keeps still for a while, and then chooses some task he finds easy, such as arranging the colors in gradation. He continues working at this for a time, but not for very long. He passes on to some more complicated task, such as that of composing words with the movable letters, and perseveres with this for a long time, about half an hour. At this stage he ceases working, walks about the room, and appears less calm. To a superficial observer he would seem to show signs of fatigue. But after a few minutes he undertakes some much more difficult work, and becomes so deeply absorbed in this that he shows us he has reached the acme of his activity, additions and writing down the results. When this work is finished, his activity comes to an end in all serenity. He contemplates his handiwork for a long time, then approaches the teacher, and begins to confide in her. The appearance of the child is that of a person who is rested, satisfied, and uplifted. The apparent fatigue of the child between the first and second period of work is interesting. At that moment, the aspect of the child is not calm and happy as at the end of the curve. Indeed, he shows signs of agitation, moves about, and walks, but does not disturb the others. It may be said that he is in search of the maximum satisfaction for his interest, and is preparing for his great work. But, on the other hand, when the cycle is completed, the child detaches himself from his internal concentration, refreshed and satisfied. He experiences the higher social impulses, such as desiring to make confidences and to hold intimate communion with other souls. A similar process became in time the general process in a class of disciplined children. Signorina Macaroni sums up this complex phenomenon as follows. Whole class at work. There follows a diagram giving us the time frames. In the first period of the morning, up to about 10 a.m., the occupation chosen is generally an easy and familiar task. At 10 o'clock there is a great commotion. The children are restless, they neither work nor go in quest of materials. The onlooker gets an impression of a tired class, about to become disorderly. After a few minutes, the most perfect order reigns once more. The children are promptly absorbed in work again. They have chosen new and more difficult occupations. When this work ceases, the children are gentle, calm, and happy. If in the period of false fatigue at 10 a.m., an inexperienced teacher interpreting the phenomenon of suspension or preparation for the culminating work as disorder, intervenes, calling the children to her and making them rest, etc., their restlessness persists, and the subsequent work is not undertaken. The children do not become calm, they remain in an abnormal state. In other words, if they are interrupted in their cycle, 
they lose all the characteristics connected with an internal process regularly and completely carried out the single curve of individual orderly work is not general nor strictly constant in the type described but it may be considered as the average type of work in the level of order achieved it will be interesting first of all to consider the curve of children in whom order has not yet been established poor children hardly ever show themselves to be in such a state of utter confusion as rich ones they are always more or less attracted by the objects and respond to them with a certain interest from the very first moment such interest however is at first superficial they are attracted mainly by curiosity by a desire to handle pretty things they amuse themselves for some time it is true with single objects changing and selecting them but without developing any deep interest the characteristic of this period which may be altogether lacking in a class of well-to-do children is that of alternations of disorder included is a diagram entitled individual differences stage preceding the evolution of order individual curve of a poor child the various curves of work are to be found below the line of quiescence in state of disorder it was only when the children were called to order collectively that this child was still unless it was rising towards work in this case however it did not persevere and the curve drops suddenly below it should be noted that in the irregular course of the aforementioned diagram we may trace a period of easy work preceding a period of difficult work frame plain insets and between these two the maximum decline into disorder another diagram follows with the following title curve of work of a very poor child almost entirely neglected by its parents and very turbulent period of disorder the child in question o seemed to have a tendency to learn from others he ran away from work or was attracted by it only for a brief moment and seemed incapable of receiving direct teaching if any attempt was made to teach him something he grimaced and ran away he wandered about disturbing his companions and seemed quite intractable but he listened attentively to the lessons the teacher gave to the other children the next diagram in the book is entitled advance towards order when he began to work after having learned how to do so he persevered and the normal process is apparent in the diagram that is to say preliminary work a pause during which the child relapsed slightly and momentarily into his habit of disturbing his companions then the curve of great application and of final repose during which however he again relapsed into his characteristic defect the summits of the diagram show not only interest in the work but a marked kindliness the child was not only calm but seemed full of beatitude and gentleness when at the height of his labours he frequently looked round at his companions and blew little kisses to them on his fingers but without relaxing his attention it seemed as if a fount of love were gushing up from the fullness of his internal satisfaction from the depths of a soul that had appeared at first so rough and uncouth there is another diagram entitled curve of work of a weakly child the diagram is made up of curves that fall upon the line of quiescence unity of curve is lacking hence unity of effort the culminating point of work is reached after a preliminary task of an easier kind and the supreme task color is briefly resumed after the great impetus has been exhausted the phase of rest is not clearly defined the child turns to a very easy task solid insets a certain feebleness of character seems to manifest itself in the half-hearted mental processes the child makes many successive efforts to rise but he can neither make the decisive vigorous effort nor come to a definite decision to cease working the child is calm but his state of calm has no variations he is neither lively nor serene nor does he show strong affectionate impulses course of progress when the whole class is disciplined the course of development of the internal activities may be observed it must be remembered that the material of development affords graduated exercises passing from the most rudimentary sensory exercises to exercises in writing calculating and reading the children are free to choose the exercises they prefer but of course as the teacher initiates them in each exercise they only choose the objects they know how to use 
the teacher observing them sees when the child is sufficiently mature for more advanced exercises and introduces them to him or perhaps the child begins them for himself after watching other children more advanced there is another diagram in the book which shows two curves we must bear such conditions in mind in order to follow progress in work the two curves represent stages of greatest development as compared with the primary curve of orderly work the stage of unrest between the easy and the more difficult work tends to disappear the child seems more sure of himself he goes more directly and readily to the choice of his culminating exercise consequently two successive phases of uninterrupted work are left one may be called the phase of preparation the other the phase of serious work the phase of preparation lasts a very short time the serious work is of much longer duration it is noteworthy that the period of rest with its characteristic air of comfort and serenity sets in after the maximum effort has spontaneously spent itself on the other hand it happens invariably that any external interruption of the effort causes the child to show signs of fatigue restlessness or to become inattentive in the first curve the initial work consists of two easy tasks carried on for a short time and from these the child passes directly to the serious work the finale is a spell of rest full of thought the child ceases to work but contemplates his finished task for a long time in silence before preparing to put it away or after having contemplated his own work he goes quietly to watch that of the others in the second curve there is a very noticeable parallelism with the line of repose the child pursues his labors almost uniformly and the sole difference between the initial work and the serious work is in their different duration the contemplative period becomes henceforth an obvious period of internal work almost a period of assimilation or internal maturation observation of the work of others becomes increasingly frequent as if it were a spontaneous comparative study between the child himself and his companions or as if an active interest in the contemplation of the external surroundings were developing the period of discovery we may say that the child studies himself in his own productions and puts himself into communion with his companions and his environment at this stage the completion of an entire cycle will exercise an influence more and more far-reaching on the personality of the child not only is he spurred on to a work of intimate concentration immediately after his culminating effort he preserves a permanent attitude of thought of internal equilibrium of sustained interest in his environment he becomes a personality who has reached a higher degree of evolution this is the period when the child begins to be master of himself and enters upon that characteristic phenomenon i have called the phenomenon of obedience he can obey that is he can control his actions and therefore can direct them in accordance with the desires of another person he can break off a piece of work when interrupted without becoming disorderly or showing symptoms of fatigue moreover work has become his habitual attitude and the child can no longer bear to be idle when for instance we call some of the children who are in this stage to the lessons for teachers in which they are to serve as the subjects of study they lend themselves with ready docility to that which we ask of them they submit to the measurements of height heads etc and they perform the exercises we suggest responding always with interest and not merely with resignation as if they were conscious of collaborating with us but when they have to wait seated on one side till they are called forward they cannot sit idle they work at something inactivity has become intolerable to them very often while i am giving the lesson the children take to lacing or tying frames or cover the floor with words made with the movable letters and where this is feasible some of the children will draw or paint in these moments of waiting all these things have now become expressions of intelligent activity which form part of their psychical organism but to ensure the continuance of this attitude and of the development of personality it is essential that some real task should be performed each day for it is from the completed cycle of an activity from the methodical concentration that the child develops equilibrium elasticity adaptability and the resulting power to perform the higher actions 
such as those which are termed acts of obedience this makes one think of the method prescribed by the catholic religion for the preservation of the forces of spiritual life that is a period of spiritual concentration which opens up the possibility of acquiring moral powers it is from methodical meditation that moral personality must draw its powers of solidification without which the inner man incoherent and unbalanced fails to possess itself and dispose of itself for noble ends children have always need of the period of concentration and serious work from which they derive the capacity for final development following is a diagram which represents a very lofty stage of childish development titled superior stage average type even the preparatory work is now of a higher kind as soon as the child comes into school he will choose for instance the letters of the alphabet or will write then his strenuous work he will read for recreation he will choose an intelligent pastime such as looking at illustrated books all his intellectual occupations are of a higher order as are also his moral attributes obedience serenity perseverance taking the line of quiescence as a level of development it follows that the level has become higher another diagram indicates two lines signalling the first and the second degree of development in a superior stage the line of work tends to become straight parallel to the line of quiescence meanwhile it has been established that it is possible to determine degrees of development or averages of internal development by means of which individual variations may be studied in the primordial type the characteristics are disorderly conduct and the incapacity to concentrate attention in such a case there is no real line of work and the main part of the diagram remains below the line of quiescence for the type in which the phenomenon of permanent concentration of attention on a task has manifested itself the average characteristic diagram of normal orderly work of the first degree is now established i e preliminary work followed by a period of restlessness and then strenuous work followed by a state of repose afterwards we distinguish a second degree where the average is characterized by the disappearance of the period of unrest and the strenuous work is brought to a close in contemplation this is the stage of discoveries of generalized observation of obedience work has become a habit this is followed by a general elevation to be recognized by the choice of higher preliminary work disciplined behavior has become a habit during this progression the diagram of work tends to become straight and parallel to the line of quiescence there follows a four-part diagram with the following caption a recapitulatory table of development diagrams of average developments the rise in the level of the plane is related to the qualities of more advanced intellectual work and the straightening of the line is related to qualities of internal construction and of the organization of the personality qualities which would be considered of a moral order such as serenity discipline self-mastery as manifested in obedience and in the various activities of the child when work has become a habit the intellectual level rises rapidly and organized order causes good conduct to become a habit children then work with order perseverance and discipline persistently and naturally the permanent calm and vivifying work of the physical organism resembles the respiratory rhythm the pivot the medium of this construction of the personality is working in freedom in accordance with the natural wants of the inner life thus freedom in intellectual work is found to be the basis of internal discipline the great achievement of the children's houses case di bambini is to produce disciplined children it is this internal organization which gives them a special type or character the type or character required to continue the free exercises of activities for the conquest of culture in successive stages the elementary school period presents itself insensibly as a continuation of the children's houses in these behavior is a habit superposed on and fused with the earlier habit of work henceforth it will be sufficient to present the material of further culture and the child gradually exercising himself upon it will pass from one intellectual stage of culture to another 
the difference shown in the successive ages arises from an intellectual interest which is no longer merely the impulse to exercise oneself by repetition of the exercises but is a higher interest directed to the work itself and tending to complete an external work or to complete a branch of knowledge as a whole thus the child creates and seeks for things organized in themselves for instance he desires to compose a design by means of combinations of geometrical figures with the metal insets and devotes himself to this work with the greatest intensity until he has completed it again we see a child occupied for seven or eight consecutive days with the same work another child becomes interested in the potentialities of numbers or in the arithmetical frame and perseveres with the same work for days until his knowledge of it has matured upon a basis of interior order produced by internal organization the mind then builds up its castle with the same leisurely calm with which a living organism grows spontaneously after birth we can give but a primary idea at present of the practical possibility of determining average levels of interior development according to age we shall further require many perfect experiments in which homogeneous children completely suitable environment and trained teachers will afford adequate material for observation then students will be able to undertake a scientific work which will perhaps be characterized by a precision superior even to that with which it is at present possible to measure the body and give the mathematical averages of growth we must consider however that the indications available to-day represent a long systematic toil and that they rest upon the still greater labor of finding external material means for natural development this will give some idea of the difficulty of scientific researches which many still believe it possible to make by means of arbitrary and superficial tests such as those of binet and simon the study of the child cannot be accomplished by an instantaneous process his characteristics can only be illustrated cinematographically external means organized in accordance with the needs of psychical life are of fundamental importance for how is it possible to judge of individual differences in the acquisition of internal order in the ascent to abstraction in the progressive stages of intellectual development in the achievement of discipline without the existence of predetermined and unvarying external means which like so many points of support lead the child in process of formation towards his goal in order to determine individual differences logically there must be a constant work or aim and this is the external means on which each personality builds itself up when the external support is the same and corresponds in general to the psychical needs of a given age a difference of internal construction is due to the individual himself on the other hand if the means were different the variations in reaction might be attributed to differences in the means finally it is obvious that in all scientific research the instrument of measurement must be fixed but each thing to be measured requires a special instrument and the constant instrument in psychical measurement should be the method of education a series of formulae such as the binet simon tests can neither measure anything nor give even an approximate idea of intellectual levels of intelligence according to age as to the children who respond whence is their response derived how far is this due to the intrinsic activity of the individual and how far to the action of environment and if the portion due to environment be ignored who can determine what intrinsic psychical value should be given to the response in each personality we must recognize two parts one is the individual natural spontaneous activity by means of which elements may be taken from the environment wherewith the personality may be elaborated internally constructed and augmented and hence characterized another part is the external instrument with which all this may be done for instance a child who at the age of four can recognize sixty-four colors shows that he possesses remarkable activity in the perception of colors and in the arrangement of them in gradation in his mind etc but he also shows that he has had the means to accomplish this achievement he has had for instance sixty-four colour tablets with which he has been able to practise at his leisure and undisturbed as long as was necessary for such assimilation the psychical factor p is a sum of two factors one internal the other external p equals i plus e 
of these the unknown non-directly measurable factor i may be indicated by x p equals x plus e if we were to compare two children one of whom has had at his disposal the sixty-four colors in the conditions described above and another who has been left to himself in poor surroundings where grey and brown tints prevail and who seems dull and unobservant etc we should find a very remarkable psychical difference such a difference is not however intrinsic it might well be that subjected to the same conditions as the first child the second would recognize the sixty-four colors the judgment we should give in such a case would be based upon an external factor not upon internal potentialities we should really be appraising two different environments not two different individuals to enable us to judge of individual differences it would be necessary for the two children to have had the same means of development in this case if at the same age they were not equally capable of distinguishing the sixty-four colors but if for instance one of the two could recognize only thirty of these a true individual psychical difference would be apparent one of the tests proposed by one of the greatest authorities on experimental psychology in italy to determine the intellectual level of subnormal backward or deficient children was to make a child pick out the largest and the smallest cube in a series this choice in common with nearly all the tests proposed for the same purpose we considered quite independently of the influence of culture and education and it was appreciated as the expression of an intimate personal activity of the intelligence itself but if one of the deficient children i had educated on my method had been subjected to the test he would in virtue of a long sensory training have chosen the largest and the smallest cube very much more easily than the children selected by the psychologist from his special schools and my deficient child might even have been not only younger but even more backward intellectually than the other the test would therefore have measured the different methods of education whereas the psychical differences between the two children really existent by reason of age or of intellectual attainment would have remained absolutely obscure man is a fusion of personality and education and education includes the series of experiences he undergoes during his life the two things cannot be separated in the individual intelligence without acquirement is an abstraction that which holds good of all living beings that the individual cannot be divorced from his environment is more profoundly true in its application to psychical life because the content of environment constituting the means of auto experience which evolves man is an essential part of him and indeed is the individual himself nevertheless we all know that the psychical individual is not his environment but a life in himself given the formula p equals x plus e in which x is the internal and intrinsic part peculiar to the individual life it may be said that every individual has his x but in order to approach to direct knowledge of x it is essential to know p and e he who carries out an examination or supposes himself to be performing a psychical measurement by dwelling on psychical results is in reality measuring a mixture of two unknown quantities one of which being external to the individual nullifies the results of research hence to study individual differences in isolated activities such as the perception of colors musical sounds the letters of the alphabet or the capacity for observation of surroundings and the detection of errors or coordination of movements language etc it is essential to have first determined a constant element the means of development offered by environment here a simple and clearly defined difference between pedagogy and psychology manifests itself pedagogy determines experimentally the means of development and the method of applying them while respecting the internal or personal liberty of the individual psychology studies average reactions or individual reactions in the species or the individual but the two things are two aspects of a single fact which is the development of man the individual and the environment are the two factors x and e of the same product the psychical entity isolated psychical researches of a moral order must also if they are to be of any real value be based upon prolonged observation after the internal activities have become orderly because it is easy to make errors of judgment in chaos 
in clinical psychiatry or in criminal pathology when we speak of keeping a subject under observation for purposes of diagnosis we mean placing him in special surroundings under hygienic and disciplinary conditions etc and observing him for some time in such an environment such a process has a value still more extensive and profound in the case of normal individuals in process of evolution in such a case it is necessary not only to offer orderly external surroundings but to reduce the chaotic internal world of the child to order and after this to observe him for a considerable time we may offer as an illustration the following observations made upon two of the most interesting children who attended our schools they were admitted into the training school for teachers during my last international course in rome aspects of the two children during the period they were retained as subjects for anthropological observation in the classroom for teachers there was a considerable clamour among the students some were talking some laughing in the centre of the room stood a pedometer the behaviour of the two children was almost identical they were sitting apart quietly working at the lacing frames which they had gone spontaneously to fetch from a neighbouring room they did not look up at the noise nor join in the laughter their attitude was that of persons at work and anxious not to lose any time when invited by a single gesture to come and be measured they obeyed in a wonderful manner leaving off work at once and moving with smiles as if fascinated they evidently felt pleasure in obeying and an internal delight which came from the consciousness of being able to work and of being ready to leave something that they liked doing at a summons to something of a higher order they arranged themselves very carefully on the pedometer to be measured when any modification was necessary in the position of the body it sufficed to murmur a word in their ears and the almost imperceptible movement required was made with the utmost exactitude they could control their voluntary movements and direct them they were able to translate the words they heard into actions this enabled them to obey and this constituted for them a fascinating internal conquest when the measuring was over nothing was said they waited expectantly for a moment then gave an intelligent glance and a smile which was as it were their greeting they had understood and they returned voluntarily to their corner to take up their frames and resume their work presently they were wanted again and the same actions were repeated when we think that children of their age about four and a half when left to themselves will roam about upsetting objects almost unconsciously and requiring either some one to submit to their caprices or to call them roughly to order we shall recognize the internal perfection achieved in these two little ones who had arrived at that stage of development in which work has become a habit and obedience a fascinating acquisition the anthropometric measurements had shown that one of the children o was normal in measurement weight stature length of torso and the other a below the normal measurements here are some notes made by the teacher on the conduct of these two children when they were in the state of disorder or undisciplined o violent turbulent spiteful to his companions never applies to anything but looks on at what the others are doing and then interrupts them or listens to the individual lessons given by the teacher with a scornful and cynical expression the father of the child says that at home he is violent overbearing and intractable a is quiet but he has almost a mania for spying on his companions and pointing out to the teacher every little action that might be considered wrong or incorrect both of the children are very poor o is almost entirely neglected by his family later judgment the teacher was enabled to form of these two children after they had reduced themselves to order by means of work o all the turbulence shown by o in his home resolved itself into a struggle for bread the father who was very poor but also neglectful denied the child bread the child did not resign himself did not cry but struggled constantly with all the means at his disposal in order to obtain his portion of bread when the teacher asked the father why he denied the child bread he replied because when he has eaten it he asks for more in school this child ran from group to group from lesson to lesson disturbing the others and passing over everything because he was struggling to win his spiritual food after the same fashion he is a child who has an overpowering will to live self-preservation seems to be his most strongly developed tendency 
when his life was assured the child became not only gentle but remarkable for his sweetness and delicacy of feeling he was the child who in his joy when he had learned or completed some task looked round lovingly at his companions and blew little kisses to them from his fingers whereas for the other children who had entered into the phase of order or discipline the teacher's note is work for o oh, the note is work and kindness before the daily hot meal was instituted the children used to bring their own luncheons which varied very much two or three of the children were very generously provided and had meat fruit etc o was seated next to one of these the table was set and o had nothing to put on his plate but the piece of bread he had so strenuously acquired he glanced at his neighbour as if to regulate himself by the time the latter would take over his meal but with no trace of envy on the contrary with great dignity he tried to eat his piece of bread very slowly in order that he might not finish before the other and thus make it evident that he had nothing more to eat while the other was still busy he nibbled his bread slowly and seriously what a sense of his own dignity subduing the desires of an appetite exposed to temptation existed in this child together with his sense of the fundamental needs of his own life by which he was impelled to struggle and to conquer what was necessary and there was further that exquisite sensibility which manifested itself in the affectionate expression of his mobile face and in the effusion of a general tenderness which looked for no return a very remarkable thing was that this child whom we might have expected to find ill-nourished gave normal anthropological measurements and weight for his age born in poverty and neglect he had defended himself the normality of his body was due to an heroic effort a this child was always calm and quiet he very soon entered upon the phase of active ordered willing and thorough work he applied himself with intense earnestness and perseverance he would be the type of the clever well-behaved child of the ordinary school very often he came to school without any food his goodness had a positive character which became a mortal danger to himself he accepted malnutrition without revolt he profited greatly by the means of psychical life that were offered him but he would never have been able to conquer them for himself his goodness continued to be of the same type after as before the period of order he showed neither agitation nor expansion his anthropological measurements which were below the normal already indicated that he had started on life's pilgrimage with the gait of the victim he belonged to the company of those who must be saved by others the characteristic moral trait was espionage the teacher when observing him noticed that the child did not work simply like the others but came to her very frequently to know if what he was doing was well or ill done and this not only during his work with the materials but also in reference to every act of a moral nature he accomplished his great preoccupation seemed to be to know whether he was doing right or wrong then he endeavoured to do right with the most scrupulous exactitude with regard to his spying tendencies the teacher noted the child never showed any animosity towards his companions he watched them attentively and then proceeded to say of them as he would say of himself so and so did this was it right or wrong the child was then careful to avoid what had been pronounced wrong in others what appeared to be his spying proclivities were in fact a manifestation of the problem that dominated his childish conscience the problem of right and wrong the limited experience of his own life did not suffice him he wanted to benefit by the experience of all the others in order to learn what things were right and what were wrong almost as if the one feeling that absorbed him was the desire to do right and avoid wrong and as if this were his sole aspiration the case of this child recalls a popular superstition expressed in such terms as too good to live the child a seemed destined for the fate thus suggested the needs of the body did not greatly concern him and he seemed equally indifferent to those of the mind goodness was the mainspring of his being if society does not note such dispositions and assume the special protection of such frail lives children of this type go forward to premature death like angels gazing heavenwards these two accounts due to signorina macaroni's observation correct a superficial judgment which in an ordinary school would have become a permanent record of character the one child would have been branded as violent 
the other as a spy if we call that science which led to the translation of these words into hero and angel and touched so many hearts in the vicinity of these two children when they had been interpreted by their wonderful instructress we shall be able to assert that the judgment of love is the judgment of knowledge the mercy of christ in judging is here illustrated psychical action then starts from a principle which may be translated thus that the child lives all the rest comes as a consequence this action of fundamental life manifests itself as a polarization of the internal personality almost at a point of crystallization around which provided there be homogeneous material and an undisturbed environment the definitive form composes itself this initial action is a task repeated with a special intensity of attention in my biographical chart therefore i do not give a long formula of analytical studies but i give a guide to psychological observations founded upon the synthetical conception which i have sought to illustrate those who have not been initiated into this method of observation will gain no light from such a guide which lies entirely outside the conceptions of psychological study now obtaining in connection with the observation of pupils but those who have been initiated will understand it without the aid of illustration our teachers have also a terminology by means of which they understand each other without having recourse to the ordinary expressions which do not convey an exact idea of the action they see in process of development thus they never say the child is developing or progressing the child is good or naughty etc the only phraseology they use is the child is becoming disciplined or is not becoming disciplined it is an internal order that they await and on this principle of being or not being all or nothing depends this evokes a much deeper conception than that of growth to say that a living creature grows is to make a very superficial statement seeing that he grows indeed but in virtue of the fact that within an orderly and regular disposition of substances is in progress when for instance the embryo of an animal is formed it grows but any one who has observed it internally must have been struck by a fact much more marvellous than that of the visible external growth a wonderful internal grouping of the cells takes place some form as it were a leaf which folds over and makes the intestines others separate to form the nervous system one group isolates and specializes itself to make the liver and thus an organization of parts more and more pronounced together with a minute differentiation of each individual arrangement of the cells is carried on the future functions of the body all depend upon the possibility of the cells so establishing themselves the important point is not that the embryo grows but that it coordinates growth comes through and by order which also makes life possible an embryo which grows without coordinating its internal organs is not vital here we have not only the impulse but the mystery of life the evolution of internal order is the essential condition for the realization of vital existence in a life which possesses the impulse to exist now the sum of the phenomena indicated in the guide to psychological observation actually represents the evolution of spiritual order in the child guide to psychological observation work note when a child begins to occupy himself for any length of time upon a task what the task is and how long he continues working at it slowness in completing it and repetition of the same exercise his individual peculiarities in applying himself to particular tasks to what tasks he applies himself during the same day and with how much perseverance if he has periods of spontaneous industry and for how many days these periods continue how he manifests a desire to progress what tasks he chooses in their sequence working at them steadily persistence in a task in spite of stimuli in his environment which would tend to distract his attention if after deliberate interruption he resumes the task from which his attention was distracted conduct note the state of order or disorder in the acts of the child his disorderly actions 
note if changes of behavior take place during the development of the phenomena of work note whether during the establishment of ordered actions there are crises of joy intervals of serenity manifestations of affection the part the child takes in the development of his companions obedience note if the child responds to the summons when he is called note if and when the child begins to take part in the work of others with an intelligent effort note when obedience to a summons becomes regular note when obedience to orders becomes established note when the child obeys eagerly and joyously note the relation of the various phenomena of obedience in their degrees a to the development of work and b to changes of conduct End of chapter 3, part 2 Recorded by Céline Major Section 7 of Spontaneous Activity in Education by Maria Montessori This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Spontaneous Activity in Education by Maria Montessori. Translated by Florence Simmons. Section 7. The Preparation of the Teacher. The possibility of observing the developments of the psychical life of the child as natural phenomena and experimental reactions transforms the school itself in action into a kind of scientific laboratory for the psychogenetic study of man. It will become, perhaps in the near future, the experimental field par excellence of the psychologist to prepare such a school as perfectly as possible is therefore not only to prepare a better method for the education of children but also to prepare the materials for a renovated science everyone now knows that students of natural science require in their laboratories an organization directed to the preparation of the material to be observed to observe a simple cell in movement it is necessary to have a hollow glass slide with cavity for the hanging drop to have ready fresh solutions in which the living cells may be immersed to ensure their continued vitality to have ready soils for cultures etc for all these ends there are special applications those of the so-called preparers who are not the assistants or helpers of the professor but employees who were at one time upper servants and then became superior workmen at the present day they are however nearly always themselves scientific graduates for indeed their task is a most delicate one they must possess biological physical and chemical knowledge and the more thoroughly they are prepared by a culture analogous to that of the masters of research themselves, the more rapid and secure is the march of science. It is strange to think that among all these laboratories of natural science, only that of experimental psychology has judged it possible to dispense with an organization for the preparation of the subjects to be observed. If today, a psychologist were told to arrange the work of his preparer he would take this to mean the preparation of his instruments thus adopting more or less the standard of laboratories of physics but the idea of preparing the living being which produces the phenomenon would not enter his mind and yet if merely to observe a cell a living microbe the scientist needs a preparer how much greater must be the necessity for such an assistant when the subject to be observed is man psychologists consider that they can prepare their subjects by arresting their attention with a word 
and explaining to them how they are to proceed in order to respond to the experiment any unknown person met by chance in the laboratory will serve their purpose in short the psychologist of to-day behaves somewhat like the child who catches a butterfly in flight observes it for a second and then lets it fly away again not like the biologist who takes care that his preparations are properly carried out in a scientific laboratory on the other hand the picture of psychological development even though it be incomplete which is shown to us in our experiments demonstrates the subtlety with which it is necessary to present to the child the means of his development and above all to respect his liberty conditions which are essential to ensure that psychical phenomena be revealed and may constitute a true material for observation all this demands a special environment and the preparation of a practical staff forming a whole infinitely superior in complexity and in organization to the ordinary natural science laboratories such a laboratory can only be the most perfect school organized according to scientific methods where the teacher is a person answering to the preparer graduate true all schools would not achieve this lofty scientific ideal but it is indisputable that schools and teachers should all be directing their efforts towards the domain of the experimental sciences the psychical salvation of children is based on the means and the liberty to live and these should become another of the natural rights according to the new generations established as a social and philosophic conception it should supersede the present obligation to provide instruction which is a burden not only on state economy but also on the vigor of posterity if the psychical phenomena of the children in the national schools do not tend to enrich psychology they become ends in themselves just as the beauty of nature is an end in itself the new school indeed must not be created for the service of a science but for the service of living humanity and teachers will be able to rejoice in the contemplation of lives unfolding under their eyes without sharing the spectacle with science wrapped in a holy egoism which will exalt their spirits as does every intimate contact with living souls it is unquestionable that with this method of education the preparation of the teacher must be made ex novo and that the personality and social importance of the instructress will be transformed thereby even after the first desultory experiments hitherto made a new type of mistress has been evolved instead of facility in speech she has to acquire the power of silence instead of teaching she has to observe instead of the proud dignity of one who claims to be infallible she assumes the vesture of humility this transformation has a parallel in that undergone by the university professor when the positive sciences began to play their part in the world what a difference between the dignified old-world professor draped in a robe often ermine trimmed seated on his high chair as on a throne and speaking so authoritatively that students were not only bound to believe all he said but to swear in verbal magistre and the professor of to-day who leaves the high places to the students that they may be able to see reserving for himself the lowest station on the bare floor while the students are all seated he alone stands often clad in a gray linen blouse like a workman the students know that they will be on the way to the highest degree of progress when they are capable of verifying the thesis of the professor nay more of giving a further impetus to science and inscribing their own names among those quoted as having contributed to its wealth or having discovered new truths dignity and hierarchy in these schools have been superseded by interest in the chemical or physical or natural phenomena to be produced and in presence of this all the rest disappears 
the whole arrangement of the laboratory is subject to the same purpose if the phenomenon requires light all the walls are of glass if darkness be necessary the laboratory is so constructed that it may be transformed into a camera obscura the one thing of importance is the production of the phenomenon be this a bad smell or a perfume an electric spark or the colors of geisler's tubes a resonance with helmholtz's reverberators or the geometrical arrangement of fine dust on a metallic plate in vibration the shape of a leaf or the contraction of a frog's muscle the study of the blind spot in the eye or the rhythm of cardiac pulsation all is equal and all is included the eager and absorbing quest is the quest of truth it is this which the new generation demands from science not the oratorical art of the professor the noble gesture the quip that lightens the weight of the discourse the lively peroration of the carefully elaborated harangue and all those expedients which were once developed by a special art for the express purpose of capturing the attention it is passion for knowledge rather than attention which now animates our young people who often come out of university halls remembering neither the voice nor the appearance of their professor but this does not connote the absence of love and respect for the master only the veneration a modern student feels in the depths of his heart for the great scientist and benefactor of humanity who stands before him unassumingly dressed in a linen blouse differs essentially from the fear tempered by ridicule which the gown and wig once inspired the transformation of schools and teachers must now proceed on the same lines when in a school everything revolves around a fundamental fact and this fact is a natural phenomenon the school will have entered the orbit of science then the teacher must assume those characteristics which are necessary in the presence of science among its devotees we find characteristics independent of the content of thought in short physicists chemists astronomers botanists and zoologists though their content of knowledge is entirely different are nevertheless all students of the positive sciences and have characteristics which differentiate them from the metaphysicians of the past these characteristics are related not to the content but to the method of the sciences if therefore pedagogy is to take its place among the sciences it must be characterized by its method and the teacher must prepare herself not by means of the content but by means of the method in short she should be distinguished by quality even more than by culture the fundamental quality is the capacity for observation a quality so important that the positive sciences were also called sciences of observation a term which was changed into experimental sciences for those in which observation is combined with experiment now it is obvious that the possession of senses and of knowledge is not sufficient to enable a person to observe it is a habit which must be developed by practice when an attempt is made to show untrained persons stellar phenomena by means of the telescope or the details of a cell under the microscope however much the demonstrator may try to explain by word of mouth what ought to be seen the layman cannot see it when persons who are convinced of the great discovery made by de vries go to his laboratory to observe the mutations in the varied minute plants of the enothera he often explains in vain the infinitesimal yet essential differences denoting indeed a new species among seedlings which have hardly germinated it is well known that when a new discovery is to be explained to the public it is necessary to set forth the coarser details the uninitiated cannot take in those minute details which constituted the real essence of the discovery and this because they are unable to observe 
to observe it is necessary to be trained and this is the true way of approach to science for if phenomena cannot be seen it is as if they did not exist while on the other hand the soul of the scientist is entirely possessed by a passionate interest in what he sees he who has been trained to see begins to feel interest and such interest is the motive power which creates the spirit of the scientist as in the little child internal coordination is the point of crystallization round which the entire psychical form will coalesce so in the teacher interest in the phenomenon observed will be the center round which her complete new personality will form spontaneously the quality of observation comprises various minor qualities such as patience in comparison with the scientist the untrained person not only appears to be a blind man who can see neither with the naked eye nor with the help of lenses he appears as an impatient person if the astronomer has not already got his telescope in focus the layman cannot wait until he has done so while the scientist would be performing this task without even perceiving that he was carrying out a long and patient process the layman would be fuming and thinking in great perturbation what am i doing here i cannot waste time like this when microscopists expect visits from a lay public they prepare a long row of microscopes already in focus because they know that their visitors will wish to see at once and quickly and that they will wish to see a great deal we can easily imagine a scientist whose contributions to the work of the laboratory are of the highest order who hold chairs and possess civil dignities and honors of every sort amiably consenting to show a lady a cellular tissue under the microscope as if it were the most natural thing in the world he would proceed as follows with solemn and serene gravity he would cut off a minute portion of a piece of tissue preserved in spirit and would carefully clean the slide on which the subject was to be placed and the slide that was to cover it he would clean again the lenses of the microscope focus the preparation and make ready to explain but undoubtedly the lady all this time will have been on the point of saying a hundred times excuse me professor but really i have an engagement i have a great deal to do when she has looked without seeing anything her lamentations are bitter what a lot of time i have wasted and yet she has nothing to do and fritters away all her time what she lacks is not time but patience he who is impatient cannot appraise things properly he can only appreciate his own impulses and his own satisfactions he reckons time solely by his own activity that which satisfies him may be absolutely empty valueless nugatory no matter its value lies in the satisfaction it gives him and if it gives him satisfaction it cannot be said to be a waste of time but what he cannot endure and what impresses him as a loss of time is a tension of the nerves a moment of self-control an interval of waiting without an immediate result there is indeed a popular italian proverb aspettare e non venire è una cosa da morire to wait for what does not come is a killing business these impatient persons are like those busybodies who always make off when there is really work to be done a thorough education is indeed necessary to overcome this attitude we must master and control our own wills if we would bring ourselves into relation with the external world and appreciate its values without this preparation we cannot give due weight to the minute things from which science draws its conclusions the capacity for sustained and accurate application to a task the object of which is apparently of very small importance is indeed a most valuable asset to him who hopes to advance in science let us call to mind what a physicist does to place an instrument absolutely level 
how patiently he turns first one screw and then another tries again and again slowly and carefully and to what end to procure an absolutely horizontal direction for a surface when this measure of comparison is established in hard metal how carefully it must be preserved to ensure that the oscillations of temperature shall not modify the length even in the most infinitesimal degree for this would be fatal to the scientific use of the instrument in measuring horizontals and yet how slight a thing in itself is involved the preservation of a measure when the great chemist wishes to find out whether traces of a substance can give a reaction he seems to be playing with his files like a little boy he takes a retort and fills it with the substance he wishes to study and then empties it afterwards he fills it with water and watches for the reaction the reaction takes place then again he empties the retort fills it anew with water and sees whether there is a further reaction thus he establishes the degree of dilution in which the substance will leave traces in this case the minimum is the important thing it was to find this imperceptible negligible minimum that the great man acted like a child this attitude of humility is an element of patience in all things the scientist is humble from the external action of descending from his professional throne to work standing at a little table from the taking off of his robes to don the workman's blouse from having laid aside the dignity of one who states an authoritative and indisputable truth to assume the position of one who is seeking the truth together with his pupils and inviting them to verify it to the end not that they should learn a doctrine but that they should be spurred to activity by the truth from all this down to the tasks he carries out in his laboratory he considers nothing too small to absorb all his powers to claim his entire attention to occupy all his time even when social honors are heaped upon him he maintains the same attitude which is to him the only true honor the real source of his greatness a microbe an excretion anything may interest the man of science even though he be a senator or a minister of state the example of cincinnatus is not to be compared with that of the modern scientist for these workers surpass cincinnatus immeasurably in their power of bringing glory and salvation to humanity but the highest form of humility in men of science is their ready self-abnegation not only in externals but even in spiritual things such as a cherished ideal convictions that have germinated in their minds confronted with truth the man of science has no preconceptions he is ready to renounce all those cherished ideas of his own that may diverge therefrom thus gradually he purifies himself from error and keeps his mind always fresh always clear naked as the truth with which he desires to blend in a sublime union is not this perhaps the reason why the specialist in infantile diseases has at present a social dignity and authority far superior to those of a schoolmaster yet the specialist merely seeks for truth among the excretions of the child's diseased body but the master veils its soul with errors but how would it be if the master should seek the truth in the soul of the child what an incomparable dignity would be his to raise himself to this height however he would have to be initiated into the ways of humility of self-abnegation of patience and to destroy the pride which is built on the void of vanity after this he too might put on the spiritual vesture of the scientist saying to the people what did you see in the other true sciences reeds shaken by the wind men clothed in soft raiment no you saw prophets but i am more than a prophet i am he who crieth in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the lord make his paths straight more indeed than the other men of science for they must always remain 
extraneous to the object of their study electric energy chemical energy the life of microbes the stars are all things diverse and remote from the scientist but the object of the schoolmaster is man himself the psychical manifestations of children evoke something more in him than interest in the phenomenon he obtains from them the revelation of himself and his emotions vibrate at the contact of other souls like his own all life may be his portion not merely a part of life then those virtues such as humility and patience which spring up in the man of science within the limitations of the external aims he has fixed for himself may here enfold the entire soul then it will no longer be a question of the patience of the man of science or the humility of the man of science but of the virtues of man in all their plenitude that spiritual expansion of the man of science which is as it were compressed into a tube like rays of light passing through the cylinders of the telescope may here be diffused on the horizon like the dazzling splendor of the sun the so-called virtues are the necessary means the methods of existence by which we attain to truth but the delight of the scientist in his work must vary in proportion as this truth is manifested in a physical force a protozoan or the soul of man the one name seems scarcely suitable for the two forms we understand at once that in comparison with the schoolmaster the scientist must be to some extent a limited and arid being the nobility of his spirit is lofty as man but its dimensions are those of a brute force or an inferior life the spiritual life of man may blend with the virtues of the man of science only when the student and the subject of study can be fused together then science may become a wellspring of wisdom and true positive science may become one with the true knowledge of the saints there is a real mechanism of correspondence between the virtues of the man of science and the virtues of the saints it is by means of humility and patience that the scientist puts himself in contact with material nature and it is by means of humility and patience that the saint puts himself in contact with the spiritual nature of things and as a consequence mainly with man the scientist is virtuous only within the limits of his material contacts the saint is all compact of such virtue his sacrifices and his enjoyments are alike illimitable the scientist is a seer within the limits of his field of observation the saint is a spiritual seer but he also sees material things and their laws more clearly than other men and invests them with spirit the modern scientist knows that every living thing is marvelous and that the simplest and most primitive most readily reveal natural laws which help us to interpret the most complicated beings st francis indeed knew this come closer oh my sister he said to the grasshopper chirping beneath the fig tree near the window of his cell the smaller the creature the more perfectly does it reveal the power and goodness of the creator each tiny thing is worthy of a scientist's minute attention he counts the articulations which make up the claws of an insect and knows the veinings of its most delicate wings he finds interesting details where the ordinary eye would not linger for a moment st francis also observed these things but they awoke in him a feeling of spiritual joy and called forth a hymn of praise who who gave me these little fairy feet furnished with healthy and flexible little bones to enable me to spring swiftly from branch to branch from twig to twig who further gave me eyes crystal globes that revolve and see before and behind to spy out all my enemies the predatory kite the black crow the greedy goose and he gave me wings delicate tissues of gold and green and blue which reflect the color of the skies and of my trees the vision of the teacher should be at once precise like that of the scientist and spiritual like that of the saint 
the preparation for science and the preparation for sanctity should form a new soul for the attitude of the teacher should be at once positive scientific and spiritual positive and scientific because she has an exact task to perform and it is necessary that she should put herself into immediate relation with the truth by means of rigorous observation that she should strip off all illusions all the idle creations of the fancy that she should distinguish truth from falsehood unerringly that in fact she should follow the example of the scientist who takes account of every minute particle of matter every elementary and embryonic form of life but eliminates all optical delusions all the confusion which impurities and foreign substances might introduce into the search for truth to achieve such an attitude long practice is necessary and a wide observation of life under the guidance of the biological sciences spiritual because it is to man that his powers of observation are to be applied and because the characteristics of the creature who is to be his particular subject of observation are spiritual i would therefore initiate teachers into the observation of the most simple forms of living things with all those aids which science gives i would make them microscopists i would give them a knowledge of the cultivation of plants and train them to observe their physiology i would direct their observation to insects and would make them study the general laws of biology and i would not have them concerned with theory alone but would encourage them to work independently in laboratories and in the bosom of free nature this complex program of observation must not exclude the physical aspects of the child thus the direct and immediate preparation for a higher task should be the knowledge of the physical needs of the child from birth to the age when psychical life is beginning to develop in his organization and become susceptible to treatment by this i do not mean merely a theoretical course of anatomy physiology and hygiene but a practice among little children which aims at following their development closely and foresees all their physical needs the teacher in other words should prepare herself according to the methods of the biological sciences entering with simplicity and objectivity into the very domain in which students of the natural sciences and of medicine are initiated when they make their first experiments in the laboratory before penetrating into the more profound problems of life related to their special study in like manner those young men who in our universities are destined to study vast and complex sciences must in the beginning undertake the quiet and restful work of preparing an infusion or the section of a rose stalk and thus experience as they observe through the microscope that emotion born of wonder which awakens the consciousness and attracts it to the mysteries of life with a passionate enthusiasm it was thus that we accustomed hitherto to read in school only ponderous and arid printed books felt that the book of nature was opening before our spirit infinite in its possibilities of creation and of miracle and responding to all our latent and uncomprehended aspirations this should also be the book of the new teacher the primer that should mould her for her mission of directing infant life such a preparation should generate in her consciousness a conception of life capable of transforming her of calling forth in her a special activity and aptitude which shall make her efficient for her task she should become a providential force a maternal force but all this is but a part of the preparation the teacher must not remain thus on the threshold of life like those scientists who are destined to observe plants and animals and who are accordingly satisfied with what morphology and physiology can offer nor is it her mission to remain intent upon derangements in the functions of the body like the medical specialist in infantile disease who is content with pathology she must recognize that the methods of those sciences are limited when she chants her introit and sets foot upon those steps which in the temple of life 
ascend to the spiritual tabernacle she should look upwards and feel that among the adoring host in the vast temple of science she is a priestess her sphere is to be vaster and more splendid she is about to observe the inner life of man the arid field which is limited to the marvels of organic matter will not suffice for her all the spiritual fruits of the history of humanity and of religion will be necessary for her nourishment the lofty manifestations of art of love of holiness are the characteristic manifestations of that life which she is not only about to observe but to serve and which is her own life not a thing strange to her and therefore cold and arid but the intimate life she has in common with all men the true and only real life of man the scientific laboratory the field of nature where the teacher will be initiated into the observation of the phenomena of the inner life should be the school in which free children develop with the help of material designed to bring about development when she feels herself aflame with interest seeing the spiritual phenomena of the child and experiences a serene joy and an insatiable eagerness in observing them then she will know that she is initiated then she will begin to become a teacher end of section seven Section 8 of Spontaneous Activity in Education. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Spontaneous Activity in Education by Maria Montessori. Translated by Florence Simmons. Chapter 5 Environment not only must the teacher be transformed but the school environment must be changed the introduction of the material of development into an ordinary school cannot constitute the entire external renovation the school should become the place where the child may live in freedom and this freedom must not be solely the intimate spiritual liberty of internal growth the entire organism of the child from his physiological vegetative part to his motor activity ought to find in school the best conditions for development this includes all that physical hygiene has already put forward as aids to the life of the child no place would be better adapted than these schools to establish and popularize reform in the clothing of children which should meet the requirements of cleanliness and of a simplicity facilitating freedom of movement while it should be so made as to enable children to dress themselves no better place could be found to carry out and popularize infant hygiene in its relation to nutrition it would be a work of social regeneration to convince the public of the economy they might affect by such practices to show them that elegance and propriety in themselves cost nothing nay more that they demand simplicity and moderation and therefore exclude all that superfluity which is so expensive the above applies more especially to schools which like the original children's houses might be instituted in the very buildings inhabited by the parents of the pupils certain special requirements must be recognized in the room of a free school psychical hygiene must play its part here as physical hygiene has already done the great increase in the dimensions of modern classrooms was dictated by physical hygiene the ambient air space is measured by cubature in relation to the physical needs of respiration and for the same reason lavatories were multiplied and bathrooms were installed physical hygiene further decreed the introduction of concrete floors and washable dados of central heating and in many cases of meals while gardens or broad terraces are already looked upon as essentials for the physical well-being of the child wide windows already admit the light freely and gymnasia 
with spacious halls and a variety of complex and costly apparatus were established finally the most complicated desks sometimes veritable machines of wood and iron with foot rests seats and desks revolving automatically in order to preclude alike the movements of the child and the distortions arising from immobility are the economically disastrous contribution of a false principle of school hygiene in the modern school the uniform whiteness and the washable quality of every object denote the triumph of an epoch in which the campaign against microbes would seem to be the sole key to human life psychical hygiene now presents itself on the threshold of the school with its new precepts precepts which economically are certainly no more onerous than those entailed by the first triumphant entry of physical hygiene they require however that schoolrooms be enlarged not in deference to the laws of respiration for central heating which makes it possible to keep windows open renders calculations based on cubic measure negligible but because space is necessary for the liberty of movement which should be allowed to the child however as the child's walking exercise will not be taken indoors this increase of space will be sufficient if it permits free movement among the furniture still if an ideal perfection is to be achieved we may say that the psychical classroom should be twice as large as the physical classroom we all know the sense of comfort of which we are conscious when a good half of the floor space in a room is unencumbered this seems to offer us the agreeable possibility of moving about freely this sensation of well-being is more intimate than the possibility of breathing offered to us in a room of medium size crowded with furniture scantiness of furniture is certainly a powerful factor in hygiene here physical and psychical hygiene are at one in our schools we recommend the use of light furniture which is correspondingly simple and economical in the extreme if it be washable so much the better especially as the children will then learn to wash it thus performing a pleasing and very instructive exercise but what is above all essential is that it should be artistically beautiful in this case beauty is not produced by superfluity or luxury but by grace and harmony of line and color combined with that absolute simplicity necessitated by the lightness of the furniture just as the modern dress of children is more elegant than that of the past and at the same time infinitely simpler and more economical so is this furniture in a children's house in the country at paladino built to commemorate the marchese carlo guerri gonzaga we initiated the study of artistic furnishing it is well known that every little corner of italy is a storehouse of local art and there is no province which in bygone times did not contain graceful and convenient objects due to a combination of practical sense and artistic instinct nearly all these treasures are now being dispersed and the very memory of them is dying out under the tyranny of the stupid and uniform hygienic fashions of our day it was therefore a delightful undertaking on the part of maria moreni to make careful inquiries into the rustic local art of the past and to give it new life by reproducing in the furniture of the children's houses the forms and colors of tables chairs sideboards and pottery the designs of textiles and the characteristic decorative motives to be met with in old country houses this revival of rustic art will bring back into use objects used by the poor in ages less wealthy than ours and meanwhile may be a revelation in economy if instead of school benches such simple and graceful objects were manufactured even the school furniture would show how beauty may be evolved from ugliness by eliminating superfluous material for beauty is a question not of material but of inspiration 
hence we must not look to richness of material but to refinement of spirit for these practical reforms if similar studies should be made some day upon the rustic art of all the italian provinces each of which has its special artistic traditions types of furniture might arise which would in themselves do much to elevate the taste and refine the habits they would bring to the enlightenment of the world an educational mode because the time-honored artistic feeling of a people with a very ancient civilization would breathe new life into those moderns who seem to be suffocating under the obsession of physical hygiene and to be actuated solely by a despairing effort to combat disease we should witness the humanization of art rising amidst the ugliness and darkness of those who have accustomed themselves to think only of death indeed the hygienic houses of to-day with their bare walls and whitewashable furniture look like hospitals while the schools seem veritable tombs with their desks ranged in rows like black catalphics black merely because they have to be of the same color as ink to hide the stains which are looked upon as a necessity just as certain sins and certain crimes are still considered to be inevitable in the world the alternative of avoiding them has never occurred to any one classrooms have black desks and bare gray walls more devoid of ornament than those of a mortuary chamber this is to the end that the starved and famishing spirit of the child may accept the indigestible intellectual food which the teacher bestows upon it in other words every distracting element has to be removed from the environment so that the teacher by his oratorical art and with the help of his laborious expedients may succeed in fixing the rebellious attention of his pupils on himself on the other hand the spiritual school puts no limits to the beauty of its environment save economical limits no ornament can distract a child really absorbed in his task on the contrary beauty both promotes concentration of thought and offers refreshment to the tired spirit indeed the churches which are par excellence places of meditation and of repose for the life of the soul have called upon the highest inspirations of genius to gather every beauty within their precincts such words may seem strange but if we wish to keep in touch with the principles of science we may say that the place best adapted to the life of man is an artistic environment and that therefore if we want the school to become a laboratory for the observation of human life we must gather within it things of beauty just as the laboratory of the bacteriologist must be furnished with stoves and soils for the culture of bacilli furniture for children their tables and chairs should be light not only that they may be easily carried about by childish arms but because their very fragility is of educational value the same consideration leads us to give children china plates and glass drinking vessels for these objects become the denouncers of rough disorderly and undisciplined movements thus the child is led to correct himself and he accordingly trains himself not to knock against overturn and break things softening his movements more and more he gradually becomes their perfectly free and self-possessed director in the same way the child will accustom himself to do his utmost not to soil the gay and pretty things which enliven his surroundings thus he makes progress in his own perfection or in other words it is thus he achieves the perfect coordination of his voluntary movements it is the same process by which having enjoyed silence and music he will do all in his power to avoid discordant noises which have become unpleasant to his educated ear on the other hand when a child comes into collision a hundred times with an enormously heavy iron-bound desk which a porter would have difficulty in moving when he makes thousands of invisible ink stains on a black bench when he lets a metal plate fall to the ground a hundred times without breaking it 
he remains immersed in his sea of defects without perceiving them his environment meanwhile is so constructed as to hide and therefore to encourage his errors with mephistophelian hypocrisy free movement it is now a hygienic principle universally accepted that children require movement thus when we speak of free children we generally imply that they are free to move that is to run and jump no mother nowadays fails to agree with the children's doctor that her child should go into parks and meadows and move about freely in the open air when we talk of liberty for children in school some such conception of physical liberty as this rises at once in the mind we imagine the free child making perilous leaps over the desks or dashing madly against the walls his liberty of movement seems necessary to imply the idea of a wide space and accordingly we suppose that if confined to the narrow limits of a room it would inevitably become a conflict between violence and obstacles a disorder incompatible with discipline and work but in the laws of psychical hygiene liberty of movement is not limited to a conception so primitive as that of merely animated bodily liberty we might indeed say of a puppy or a kitten what we say of children that they should be free to run and jump and that they should be able to do so as in fact they often do in a park or a field with and like the children if however we wish to apply the same conception of motor liberty to our treatment of a bird we should make certain arrangements for it we should place within its reach the branch of a tree or crossed sticks which would afford foothold for its claws since these are not designed to be spread out on the ground like the feet of creeping things but are adapted to gripping a stick we know that a bird left free to move over a vast illimitable plain would be miserable how then is it that we never think thus if it be necessary to prepare different environments for a bird and a reptile in order to ensure their liberty of movement must it not be a mistake to provide the same form of liberty for our children as that proper to cats and dogs children indeed when left to themselves to take exercise show impatience and are prone to quarrel and cry older children feel it necessary to invent something whereby they may conceal from themselves the intolerable boredom and humiliation of walking for walking's sake and running for running's sake they try to find some object for their exertions the younger children play pranks the activity of children thus left to themselves has rarely a good result it does not aid development save as regards the physical advantage of general nutrition that is of the vegetative life their movements become ungraceful they invent unseemly capers walk with a staggering gait fall easily and break things they are evidently quite unlike the free kitten so full of grace so fascinating in its movements tending to perfect its action by the light jumping and running which are natural to it in the motor instinct of the child there appears to be no grace no natural impulse towards perfection hence we must conclude that the movement which suffices for the cat does not suffice for the child and that if the nature of the child is different his path of liberty must also be different if the child has no intelligent aim in his movements he is without internal guidance thus movement tires him many men feel the dreadful emptiness of being compelled to move without an object one of the cruel punishments invented for the chastisement of slaves was to make them dig deep holes in the earth and fill them up again repeatedly in other words to make them work without an object experiments on fatigue have shown that work with an intelligent object is far less fatiguing than an equal quantity of aimless work so much so that the psychiatrists of today recommend not exercise in the open air but work in the open air 
to restore the individuality of the neurasthenic reconstructive work work that is to say which is not the product of a mental effort but tends to the coordination of the psychomuscular organism such are the activities which are not directed to the production of objects but to their preservation as for instance dusting or washing a little table sweeping the floor laying or clearing the table cleaning shoes spreading out a carpet these are the tasks performed by a servant to preserve the objects belonging to his master work of a very different order to that of the artificer who on the other hand produced those objects by an intelligent effort the two classes of work are profoundly different the one is simple it is a coordinated activity scarcely higher in degree than the activity required for walking or jumping for it merely gives purpose to those simple movements whereas productive work entails a preliminary intellectual work of preparation and comprises a series of very complicated motor movements together with an application of sensory exercises the first is the work suitable for little children who must exercise themselves in order to learn to coordinate their movements it consists of the so-called exercises of practical life which correspond to the psychical principle of liberty of movement for this it will be sufficient to prepare a suitable environment just as we should place the branch of a tree in an aviary and then to leave the children to follow their instincts of activity and imitation the surrounding object should be proportioned to the size and strength of the child light furniture that he can carry about low dressers within reach of his arms locks that he can easily manipulate chests that run on casters light doors that he can open and shut readily clothes pegs fixed on the walls at a height convenient for him brushes his little hand can grasp pieces of soap that can lie in the hollow of such a hand basins so small that the child is strong enough to empty them brooms with short smooth light handles clothes he can easily put on and take off himself these are surroundings which invite activity and among which the child will gradually perfect his movements without fatigue acquiring human grace and dexterity just as the little kitten acquires its graceful movement and feline dexterity solely under the guidance of instinct the field thus open to the free activity of the child will enable him to exercise himself and to form himself as a man it is not movement for its own sake that he will derive from these exercises but a powerful coefficient in the complex formation of his personality his social sentiments in the relations he forms with other free and active children his collaborators in a kind of household designed to protect and aid their development the sense of dignity acquired by the child who learns to satisfy himself in surroundings he himself preserves and dominates these are the coefficients of humanity which accompany liberty of movement from his consciousness of this development of his personality the child derives the impulse to persist in these tasks the industry to perform them the intelligent joy he shows in their completion in such an environment he undoubtedly works himself and fortifies his spiritual being just as when his body is bathed in fresh air and his limbs move freely in the meadows he works at the growth of his physical organism and strengthens it end of chapter five chapter six of spontaneous activity in education this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by mike trong in houston texas spontaneous activities in education by maria montessori translated by florence simmons chapter six attention the phenomenon to be expected from the little child when he is placed in an environment favorable to his spiritual growth is this 
that suddenly the child will fix his attention upon an object will use it for the purpose for which it was constructed and will continue to repeat the same exercise indefinitely one will repeat an exercise twenty times another forty times and yet another two hundred times but it is the first phenomenon to be expected as initiatory to those acts with which spiritual growth is bound up that which moves the child to this manifestation of activity is evidently a primitive internal impulse almost a vague sense of spiritual hunger and it is the impulse to satisfy this hunger which then actually directs the consciousness of the child to the determined object and leads it gradually to a primordial but complex and repeated exercise of the intelligence in comparing judging deciding upon an act and correcting an error when the child occupy with the solid insets places and displaces the ten little cylinders in their respective places thirty or forty times consecutively and having made a mistake sets himself a problem and solves it he becomes more and more interested and tries the experiment again and again he prolongs a complex exercise of his psychical activities which makes way for an internal development it is probably an internal perception of this development which makes the exercise pleasing and induces prolonged application to the same task to quench thirst it is not sufficient to see or to sip water the thirsty man must drink his fill that is to say must take in the quantity his organism requires so to satisfy this kind of psychical hunger and thirst it is not sufficient to see things cursorily much less to hear them described it is necessary to possess them and to use them to the full for the satisfaction of the needs of the inner life this fact stands revealed as the basis of all psychical construction and the sole secret of education the external object is the gymnasium on which the spirit exercises itself and such internal exercises are primarily in themselves the end and aim of action hence the solid insets are not intended to give the child a knowledge of dimensions nor are the plain insets designed to give him a conception of forms the purpose of these as of all the other objects is to make the child exercise his activities the fact that the child really acquires by these means definite knowledge the recollection of which is vivid in proportion to the fixity and intensity of his attention is a necessary result and indeed it is precisely the sensory knowledge of dimensions forms and colors etc thus acquired which makes the continuation of such internal exercises in fields progressively faster and higher a possible achievement hitherto all psychologists have agreed that instability of attention is the characteristic of little children of three or four years old attracted by everything they see they pass from object to object unable to concentrate on any and generally the difficulty of fixing the attention of children is the stumbling block of their education william james speaks of that extreme mobility of the attention with which we are all familiar in children and which makes their first lessons such rough affairs the reflex and passive character of the attention which makes the child seems to belong less to himself than to every object which happens to catch his notice is the first thing which the teacher must overcome the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment character and will an education which should improve this faculty would be the education par excellence thus man acting by himself alone never successfully arrests and fixes that inquiring attention which wanders from object to object in fact in our experiment the attention of the child was not artificially maintained by a teacher it was an object which fixed that attention 
as if it corresponded to some internal impulse an impulse which evidently was directed subtly to the things necessary for its development in the same manner those complex coordinated movements achieved by a newborn infant in the act of sucking are limited to the first and unconscious need of nutrition they are not a conscious acquisition directed to a purpose indeed the conscious acquisition directed to a definite purpose would be impossible in the movement of a newborn infant's mouth as also in the first movements of the child's spirit therefore it is essential that the external stimulus which first presents itself should be verily the breast and the milk of the spirit and then only shall we behold that surprising phenomenon of a little face concentrated in an intensity of attention behold a child of three years old capable of repeating the same exercise fifty times in succession many persons are moving about beside him some one is playing the piano children are singing in chorus but nothing distracts the little child from his profound concentration just so does the suckling keep hold of the mother's breast uninterrupted by external incidents and desists only when he is satisfied only nature accomplishes such miracles if then psychical manifestation have their root in nature it was necessary in order to understand and help nature to study it in its initial periods those which are the simplest and the only ones capable of revealing truths which would serve as guides for the interpretation of later and more complex manifestations this indeed many psychologists have done but applying the analytical methods of experimental psychology they did not start from that point whence the biological sciences derive their knowledge of life that is the liberty of the living creatures they desire to observe if fabre had not made use of insects while leaving them free to carry out their natural manifestations and observing them without allowing his presence to interfere in any way with their functions if he had caught insects had taken them into his study and subjected them to experiment he would not have been able to reveal the marvels of insect life if bacteriologists had not instituted as a method of research an environment similar to that which is natural to microbes both as regards nutritive substances and conditions of temperature etc to the end that they might live freely and thus manifest their characteristics if they had confined themselves to fixing the germs of a disease under the microscope the science which to-day saves the lives of innumerable men and protects whole nations from epidemics would not exist freedom to live is the true basis for every method of observation applied to living creatures liberty is the experimental condition for studying the phenomena of the child's attention it will be enough to remember that the stimuli of infant attention being mainly sensory have a powerful physiological concomitant of accommodation in the organs of sense an accommodation physiologically incomplete in the young child which requires to develop itself according to nature an object not adapted to become a useful stimulus to the powers of accommodation in process of development would not only be incapable of sustaining attention as a psychical fact but would also as a physiological fact weary or actually injure the organs of accommodation such as the eye and ear but the child who chooses the objects and perseveres in their use with the utmost intensity of attention as shown in the muscular contractions which give mimetic expression to his face evidently experiences pleasure and pleasure is an indication of healthy functional activity it always accompanies exercises which are useful to the organs of the body attention also requires a preparation of the ideative centers in relation to the external object for which it is to be demanded 
in other words and internal psychical adaptation the cerebral centers should be excited in their turn by an internal process when an external stimulus acts thus for instance anyone who is expecting a person sees him arriving from a considerable distance not only because the person presents himself to the senses but because he was expected the distant figure claimed attention because the cerebral centers were already excited to that end by means of similar activities a hunter is conscious of the slightest sound made by game in woods in short two forces act upon the cerebral cell as upon a closed door the external sensory force which knocks and the internal force which says open if the internal force does not open it is in vain that the external stimulus knocks at the door and then the strongest stimuli may pass unheeded the absent-minded man may step into a chasm the man who is absorbed in a task may be deaf to a band playing in the street the central action that constitutes attention is the factor of the greatest psychological and philosophic value and the one which has always represented the maximum among the practical values in pedagogy the whole art of teachers has consisted in substance in preparing the attention of the child to make it expectant of their instruction and in securing the cooperation of those internal forces which should open the door when they knock and as the thing which is quite unknown or that which is inaccessible to the understanding can awaken no interest the fundamentals of the art of teaching were to go gradually from the known to the unknown from the easy to the difficult it is the pre-existent known which excites expectation and opens the door to the novel unknown it is the already present easy work which opens new ways for penetration and puts the attention into a state of expectation thus according to the conceptions of pedagogy it should be possible to prepare good offices for oneself the cooperation of the psychical concomitants of the attention everything would depend on skilful manipulation between the known and the unknown and similar things the clever teacher would be like the great military strategist who prepares the plan of a battle upon a table and man would be able to direct man leading him wheresoever he pleases this moreover has long been the materialistic principle which governs psychology according to herbert spencer the mind is at first as it were an indifferent day on which external impressions reign leaving traces more or less profound experiences are according to him and the english empiricists the constructive factors of the mind even in its highest activities man is what experience had made him hence in education by preparing a suitable structure of experiences it is possible to build up the man a conception not less materialistic than that which presented itself for a moment before the marvellous progress of organic chemistry when the series of syntheses succeeded that of analysis it was then believed that a species of albumen might be manufactured synthetically and as albumen is the organic basis of the cells and as the human ovum is nothing but a cell man himself might one day be manufactured on the chemist's table the conception of man as the creator of man was quickly discredited in the material domain but the psychical homunculus still persists among the practical conceptions of pedagogy no chemical synthesis could put into the cell apparently nothing more than a simple clot of nucleated protoplasm that activity sign matter that potential vital force that mysterious factor which causes a cell to develop into man and the elusive attention of children would seem to tell us that the psychical man is subject to analogous laws of autocreation the most modern school of spiritualistic psychologists 
to which william james belonged recognized in the concomitant of attention a fact bound up with the nature of the subject a spiritual force one of the mysterious factors of life from whence his intellect deduce its primal notices of thought man therefore knows not or his appetites their first affection such in you as zeal in bees to gather honey carey's translation dante's purgatorio canto eighteen there is in man a special attitude to external things which forms part of his nature and determines its character the internal activities act as cause they do not react and exist as the effect of external factors our attention is not arrested by all things indifferently but by those which are congenial to our tastes the things which are useful to our inner life are those which arouse our interest our inner world is created upon a selection from the external world acquired for and in harmony with our internal activities the painter will see a preponderance of colors in the world the musician will be attracted by sounds it is the quality of our attention which reveals ourselves and we manifest ourselves externally by our aptitudes it is not our attention which creates us the individual character the internal form the difference between one man and another are also obvious among men who have lived in the same environment but who from that environment have taken only what was necessary for each the experiences with which each constructs his ego in relation to the external world do not form a chaos but are directed by his intimate individual aptitudes if there were any doubt as to the natural force which directs psychical formation our experiences with little children would furnish a decisive proof no teacher could procure such phenomena of attention by any artifices they have evidently an internal origin the power of concentration shown by little children from three to four years old have no counterpart save in the annals of genius these little ones seem to reproduce the infancy of men possessing an extraordinary power of attention such as archimedes who was slain while bending over his circles from which rumours of the taking of syracuse had failed to distract him or newton who absorbed in his studies forgot to eat or victorio alfieri who when writing a poem heard nothing of the noisy wedding procession which was passing with shouts and clamour before his windows now these characteristics of the attention of genius could not be evoked by an interesting teacher however subtle his art nor could any accumulation of passive experiences become such an accumulator of psychical energies if there be a spiritual force working within the child by which he may open the door of his attention the problem which necessarily presents itself is a problem of liberty rather than a problem of pedagogic art affecting the construction of his mind the bestowal of the nourishment suitable to psychical needs by means of external objects and readiness to respect liberty of development in the most perfect manner possible are the foundations which from a logical point of view should be laid down for the construction of a new pedagogy it is no longer a question of attempting to create the homunculus like the chemists of the nineteenth century but rather of taking the lantern of diogenes and going in search of the man a science should establish by means of experiments what is necessary to the primordial psychical requirements of the child and then we shall witness the development of complex vital phenomena in which the intelligence the will and the character develop together just as the brain the stomach and the muscles of the rationally nourished child develop together together with the first psychical exercises the first coordinated cognitions will be fixed in the child's mind and the known will begin to exist in him providing the first germs of an intellectual interest 
supplementing his instinctive interest when this takes place a state of things begins to establish itself which has some analogy with the mechanism of attention which the pedagogists of to-day take as the basis of the art of teaching the transition from the known to the unknown from the simple to the complex from the easy to the difficult is reproduced from a certain point of view but with special characteristics the progression from the known to the unknown does not proceed from object to object as would be assumed by the master who does not bring about the development of ideas from a centre but merely unites them in a chain without any definite object allowing the mind to wander aimlessly though bound to himself here on the other hand the known establishes itself in the child as a complex system of ideas which system was actively constructed by the child himself during a series of psychical processes representing in themselves an internal formation a psychical growth to bring about such a progress we must offer the child a systematic complex material corresponding to his natural instincts thus for instance by means of our sensory apparatus we offer the child a series of objects capable of drawing his instinctive attention to colors forms and sounds to tactile and baric qualities etc and the child by means of the characteristically prolonged exercises with each object begins to organize his psychical personality but at the same time acquires a clear and orderly knowledge of things thenceforth all external objects for the reason that they have forms dimensions colors qualities of smoothness weight hardness etc are no longer foreign to the mind there is something in the consciousness of the child which prepares him to expect these things and invites him to receive them with interest when the child has added a cognition to the primitive impulse which directs his attention to external things he has acquired other relations with the world other forms of interest these are no longer merely those primitive ones which are bound up with a series of primordial instinct but have become a discerning interest based upon the conquests of the intelligence it is true that all these new conquests are fundamentally and profoundly based upon the psychical needs of the individual but the intellectual element has now been added transforming an impulse into a conscious and voluntary quest the old pedagogic conception which assumed that to call the attention of the child to the unknown it is necessary to connect it with the known because it is thus that his interest may be won for the new knowledge to be imparted grasped but a single detail of the complex phenomenon we now witness after our experiments if the known is to represent a new source of interest directed towards the unknown it is essential that it should itself have been acquired in accordance with the tendency of nature then preceding knowledge will lend interest to objects of ever-increasing complexity and of lofty significance the culture thus created ensures the possibility of an indefinite continuation in the successive evolution of such formative phenomena moreover this culture itself creates order in the mind when the teacher giving her plain and simple lesson says this is long this is short this is red this is yellow etc she fixes with a single word the clearly marked order of the sensations classifies and catalogues them and each impression is perfectly distinct from the other and has its own determined place in the mind which may be recalled by a word thenceforth new acquisitions will not be thrown aside or mixed together chaotically but will be duly deposited in their proper places side by side with previous acquisitions of the same kind like books in a well-arranged library 
thus the mind not only has within itself the propulsive force required to increase its knowledge but also an established order which will be steadily maintained throughout its successive and illimitable enrichment by new material and as it grows and gains strength it retains its equilibrium these continual exercises in comparison judgment and choice carried out among the objects further tend to place the internal acquisitions so logically into relation one with another that the results are a singular facility and accuracy of reasoning power and a remarkable quickness of comprehension the law of the minimum of effort is truly carried out as it is everywhere where order and activity reign the internal coordination like physiological adaptation establishes itself as a result of the spontaneity of the exercises the free development of a personality which grows and organizes itself is that which determines such an internal condition just as in the body of the embryo the heart the process of development makes a place for itself in the space of the diastinum between the lungs and the diaphragm assumes its arched form as a result of pulmonary dilation the teacher directs these phenomena but in so doing she is careful to avoid calling the child's attention to herself since the whole future depends upon his concentration her art consists in understanding and in avoiding interference with natural phenomena that which has been clearly demonstrated as regards the nutrition of the newborn infant and the first coordinated activities of the spirit will be repeated at every period of life with the necessary modifications induced by the increased complexity of the phenomena continuing the parallel with physical nutrition let us consider the growing infant which has cut its teeth develop its gastric juice and so gradually requires a more complicated diet until we come to the adult man nourishing himself by means of all the complications of modern kitchen and table to keep himself in health he should eat only the things which correspond to the intimate needs of his organism and if he introduces over-rich or unusual unsuitable or poisonous substances the result will be impoverishment self-poisoning a malady now it was the study of the child's nutrition during the period of suckling and during the first years of life which created alimentary hygiene not only for the child but for the adult and pointed out the perils to which all were alike exposed during the epoch when infantile hygiene was unknown there is a singular parallel in psychical life the man will have an infinitely more complex life than the child but for him too there should always be a correspondence between the needs of his nature and the manner in which his spirit is nourished a rule of internal life will always promote the health of the man turning to attention the primitive fact of correspondence between nature and stimulus which is the fundamental of life should prevail however modified when dealing with older children and should remain the basis of education i am prepared for the objections of experts children must be accustomed to pay attention to everything even to things which are distasteful to them because practical life demands such efforts the objection is based on a prejudice analogous to that which at one time made good fathers of families say children should be accustomed to eat everything in just the same way moral training is put outside its rightful sphere a fatal confusion when ideas of this order now happily obsolete obtain fathers would allow their children to fast all day if they refused a dish they dislike at the midday meal forbidding them anything but the rejected portion which became ever colder and more disgusting until at last hunger weakened the child's will and destroyed his caprice and the plate full of cold food was swallowed thus argued such a father in the various circumstances in which he may be placed throughout his life my son will be ready to eat whatever comes to hand and will not be greedy and capricious 
in those days also sweets were forbidden to children whose organisms require sugar because the muscles consume a great deal of this during growth in order to teach children to overcome greediness and an easy and convenient method of correcting naughty children was to send them to bed without any supper very similar methods are now adopted by those who insist that children should pay attention to things they dislike in order to accustom them to the necessities of life but as in the case of psychical nourishment hunger is never brought to bear upon the cold and distasteful viands the indigestible and heavy food weakens and poisons the unwilling recipient not thus shall we prepare the robust spirit ready for all the difficult eventualities of life the boy who swallowed the cold soup and went fasting to bed was the one whose body developed badly who was too weak to resist infection when he encountered it and fell ill and morally it was he who having a store of unsatisfied appetites within him looked upon it as the greatest joy of his liberty when he became an adult to eat and drink to excess how unlike was he to the boy of to-day who rationally fed and made robust of body becomes the abstemious man who eats to live in health and combats alcoholism and excessive and injurious feeding the modern man who can defend himself by so many means against infectious diseases and who is so ready for effort that without any compulsion he braves the arduous exertion of sport and attempts to carry out great enterprises such as the discovery of the poles and the ascent of lofty mountains so too the man capable of braving the icy wastes of moral conflict of undertaking spiritual ascents will be he whose will is strong whose spirit is well balanced whose decisions are prompt and steadfast and the more a man's inner life shall have grown normally organizing itself in accordance with the provident laws of nature and forming an individuality the more richly will he be endowed with a strong will and a well-balanced mind to be ready for a struggle it is not necessary to have struggled from one's birth but it is necessary to be strong he who is strong is ready no hero was a hero before he had performed his heroic deed the trials life has in store for us are unforeseen unexpected no one can prepare us directly to meet them it is only a vigorous soul that can be prepared for everything when a living being is in process of evolution it is essential to provide for the special requirements of the moment in order to ensure its normal development the fetus must be nourished with blood the newborn infant with milk if during its intrauterine life the fetus should lack blood rich in albuminous substances and oxygen or if poisonous substances should be introduced into its tissues the living being will not develop normally and no aftercare will strengthen the man evolved from this impoverished source should the infant lack sufficient milk the malnutrition of the the initial stage of life condemns him to a permanent state of inferiority the suckling prepares himself to walk by lying stretched out and spending long quiet hours in sleep it is by sucking that the babe begins his teething so too the fledgling in the nest does not prepare for flight by flying but remains motionless in the little warm shell where its food is provided the preparations for life are indirect the prelude to such phenomenon of nature as the majestic flight of birds the ferocity of wild beasts the song of the nightingale the variegated beauty of the butterfly's wings is the preparation in the secret places of a nest or a den or in the motionless intimacy of the cocoon omnipotent nature asks only peace for the creatures in process of formation all the rest she gives herself then the childish spirit should also find a warm nest where its nutrition is secure and after this we should await the revelations of its development 
it is essential therefore to offer objects which correspond to its formative tendencies in order to obtain the result which education makes its goal the development of the latent forces in man with the minimum of strain and all possible fullness End of chapter six recording by mike tronk in houston texas Chapter 7 of Spontaneous Activity in Education. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Trong in Houston, Texas. Spontaneous Activity in Education by Maria Montessori. Translated by Florence Simmons. Chapter 7. Will. When the child chooses from among a considerable number of objects the one he prefers, when he moves to go and take it from the sideboard and then replaces it, or consents to give it up to a companion, when he waits until one of the pieces of the apparatus he wishes to use is laid aside by the child who has it in his hand at the moment, when he persists for a long time with earnest attention in the same exercise, correcting the mistakes which the didactic material reveals to him when in the silence exercise he retains all his impulses all his movements and then rising when his name is called controls these movements carefully to avoid making a noise with his feet or knocking against the furniture he performs so many acts of the will it may be said that in him the exercise of the will is continuous nay that the factor which really acts and persists among his aptitudes is the will which is built up on the internal fundamental fact of a prolonged attention let us analyze some of the coefficients of will the whole external expression of the will is contained in movement whatever action man performs whether he walks works speaks or writes opens his eyes to look or closes them to shut out a scene he acts by motion an act of the will may also be directed to the restriction of movement to restrain the disorderly movements of anger not to give way to the impulse which urges us to snatch a desirable object from the hand of another are voluntary actions therefore the will is not a simple impulse towards movement but the intelligent direction of movements there can be no manifestation of the will without completed action he who thinks of performing a good action but leaves it undone he who desires to atone for an offense but takes no step to do so he who proposes to go out to pay a call or to write a letter but goes no farther in the matter does not accomplish an exercise of the will to think and to wish is not enough it is action which counts the way to hell is paved with good intentions the life of volition is the life of action now all our actions represent a resultant from the forces of impulse and inhibition and by constant repetition of actions this resultant may become almost habitual and unconscious such is the case for instance with regard to all those customary actions the sum of which constitute the behavior of a well-bred person our impulse might be to pay a certain visit but we know that we might disturb our friend that it is not her day for receiving and we refrain we may be comfortably seated in a corner of a drawing-room but a venerable person enters and we rise to our feet we are not much attracted by this lady but nevertheless we also bow or shake her hand the sweet meat to which our neighbor helps herself is just the one we desired but we are careful to give no sign of this all the movements of our body are not merely those dictated by impulse or weariness they are the correct expression of what we consider decorous with our impulses we could take no part in social life on the other hand without inhibitions we could not correct direct and utilize our impulses 
this reciprocal equilibrium between opposite motor forces is the result of prolonged exercises of ancient habits within us we no longer have any sense of effort in performing these we no longer require to support of reason and knowledge to accomplish them these acts have almost become reflex and yet the acts in question are by no means reflex actions it is not nature but habit which produces all this we know well how the person who has not been brought up to observe certain rules but has been hastily instructed in the knowledge of them will too often be guilty of blunders and lapses because he is obliged to perform there and then all the necessary coordination of voluntary acts and there and then direct them under the vigilant and immediate control of the consciousness and such a perpetual effort cannot certainly compete with the habit of distinguished manners the will stores up its prolonged efforts outside the consciousness or at its extreme margin and leaves the consciousness itself unencumbered to make new acquisitions and further efforts thus we cease to consider as evidences of will those habits in which we nevertheless see the consciousness as it were hanging over and watchful of each act that is that it may accord with the perfect rule of an external code of manners an educated man who acts thus is merrily a man in himself merrily a man of healthy mind it is in fact only disease which can disintegrate the personality organized upon its adaptations and induce a man of society to cease to act in a becoming manner it is well known that a neurasthenic subject who begins to show the first symptoms of paranoia may at first seems to be merely one who fails in good breeding but he on the other hand who remains within the limits of good breeding is nothing more than a normal man we will not venture to call him a man of will the consciousness of such a man is always being put to the test and the mechanisms stored up in the margin of consciousness no longer possess a volative value but the child is making his first trial of arms and his personality is a very different thing from that just described in comparison with the adult he is an unbalanced creature almost invariably the prey of his own impulses and sometimes subject to the most obstinate inhibitions the two opposite activities of the will have not yet combined to form the new personality the psychical embryo has still the two elements separate the great essential is that this combination this adaptation should take place and establish itself as a supporting girdle at the margin of consciousness hence it is necessary to induce active exercise as soon as possible since this is essential to such a degree of development the aim in view is not to make the child a little precautious gentleman but to induce him to exercise his powers of volition and to bring about as soon as possible the reciprocal contact of impulses with inhibitions it is this construction itself which is necessary not the result which may be achieved externally by means of this construction it is in fact merely a means to an end and the end is that the child should act together with other children and practice the gymnastics of the will in the daily habits of life the child who is absorbed in some task inhibits all movements which do not conduce to the accomplishment of this work he makes a selection among the muscular coordinations of which he is capable persists in them and thus begins to make such coordinations permanent this is a very different matter to the disorderly movements of a child giving way to uncoordinated impulses when he begins to respect the work of others when he waits patiently for the object he desires instead of snatching it from the hand of another when he can walk about without knocking against his companions without stamping on their feet without overturning the table then he is organizing his powers of volition and bringing impulses and inhibitions into equilibrium such an attitude 
prepares the way for the habits of social life it would be impossible to bring about such a result by keeping children motionless seated side by side under such conditions relations between children cannot be established and infantile social life does not develop it is by means of free intercourse the, of real practice which obliges each one to adapt his own limits to the limits of others that social habits may be established dissertations on what ought to be done will never bring about the construction of the will to make a child acquire graceful movements it will not suffice to inculcate ideas of politeness and of rights and duties if this were so it would suffice to give a minute description of the movements of the hand necessary in playing the piano to enable an attentive pupil to execute a sonata by beethoven in all such matters the formation is the essential factor the powers of will are established by exercise in education it is of very great value to organize all the mechanism useful in the production of personality at an early stage just as movement the gymnastics of children is necessary because as is well known muscles which are not exercised become incapable of performing the variety of movements of which the muscular system is capable so an analogous system of gymnastics is necessary to maintain the activity of the psychical life the uneducated organism may be easily directed for subsequent deficiencies he who is weak of muscle is inclined to remain motionless and so to perish when an action is necessary to overcome danger thus the child who is weak of will who is hypobulic or abulic will readily adapt himself to a school where all the children are kept seated and motionless listening or pretending to listen many children of this kind however end in the hospital for nervous disorders and have the following notes on their school reports conduct excellent no progress in studies of such children some teachers confine themselves to such a remark as they are so good and by this they tend to protect them from any intervention and leave them to sink undisturbed into the weakness which threatens to engulf them like a quicksand other children whose natural impulses are strong are noted merrily as creators of disorder and are set down as naughty if we inquire into the nature of their naughtiness we shall be told almost invariably that they will never keep still these turbulent spirits are further stigmatized as aggressive to their companions and their aggressions are nearly always of this kind they try by every possible means to rouse their companions from their quiet sense and draw them into an association there are also children in whom the inhibitory powers are dominant their timidity is extreme they sometimes seem as if they cannot make up their minds to answer a question they will do so after some external stimulus but in a very low voice and will then burst into tears the necessary gymnastic in all these three cases is free action the constant and interesting movement of others is the best of incitement to the abulic motion directed into the channel of orderly exercise develops the inhibitory powers of the too impulsive child and the child who is too much in subjection to his inhibitory powers when liberated from the bondage of surveillance and free to act privately on his own initiative in other words when he is removed from all external inducements to exercise inhibition is able to find an equilibrium between the two opposite volitional forces this is indeed the way of salvation for all men that wherein the weak gain strength that wherein the strong attain perfection the one of balance as between impulse and inhibition is not only a familiar and interesting fact in pathology it is further met with a minor degree among normal persons just as frequently as deficiencies of education are to be met in the external social sphere impulse leads criminals to commit evil actions against other men 
but how often normal persons have to regret thoughtless acts and nervous outbursts which have sad consequences to themselves for the most part the normal impulsive person harms himself only compromises his career and is unable to bring his talents to fruition he suffers from a conscious servitude as from a misfortune from which he might perhaps have been saved he who is pathologically the victim of his own powers of inhibition is certainly the more unhappy sufferer he remains immobile and silent but internally he longs to move a thousand impulses which can find no outlet torture the soul which aspires to art to work and eloquent speech on his own misfortunes would fain flow from his lips to implore help from a physician or comfort from some lofty soul but his lips are sealed he feels the horrible oppression of one buried alive but how many normal persons suffer from something of the same kind on some propitious occasion in their lives they ought to have come forward and shown their worth but they were unable to do so a thousand times they have thought that a sincere expression of feeling might have straightened out a difficult situation but the heart has closed and the lips have remained mute how passionately they have longed to speak to some noble soul who would have understood them illuminated and comforted them but when they have been face to face with this person they have been unable to speak a word the longed for individual encouraged them questioned them urged them to express themselves but the soul responds to the invitation was an internal anguish speak speak that impulse in the depths of their consciousness but inhibition was inexorable as a resistless material force it is in the education of the will by means of free exercises wherein the impulses balance the inhibitions that the cure of such subjects might be found provided such a cure could be undertaken at the age when the will is in process of formation such an equilibrium established as a mechanism at the margin of consciousness which makes a man of the world correct in his conduct is by no means that which constitutes the person of will it has been said above that the consciousness remains free for other voluntary requirements the most refined and aristocratic lady might nevertheless be a person without will and without character although she might have acquired the most rigorous mechanisms productive of a mechanical will directed solely to external objects there is a voluntary fundamental quality upon which not only are the superficial relations between man and man based but on which the very edifice of society is erected this quality is known as continuity the social structure is founded upon the fact that men can work steadily and produce within certain average limits on which the economic equilibrium of a people is constructed the social relations which are the base of the reproduction of the species are founded upon the continuous union of parents in marriage the family and productive work these are the two pivots of society they rest upon the greatest volative quality constancy or persistence this quality is really the exponent of the uninterrupted concord of the inner personality without it a life would be a series of episodes a chaos it would be like a body disintegrated into its cells rather than an organism which persists throughout the mutations of its own material this fundamental quality when it embraces the sentiment of the individual and the direction of his ideation that is to say his whole personality is what we have called character the man of character is the persistent man the man who is faithful to his own word his own convictions his own affections now the sum of these various manifestations of constancy has an exponent of immense social value persistence in work the degenerate even before he gave way to criminal impulse 
before he betrayed the inconsistency of his affections before he broke his word before he made havoc of all the convictions that ennobled the soul of man had a certain stigma which marked him as one lost and disintegrated this was laziness incapacity to persist in work directly an honest and well-behaved man begins to suffer from brain disease before he shows any violent impulses disorder in conduct or signs of delirium he has a premonitory symptom he can no longer apply himself to work among the masses it is justly thought that a girl will make a good wife when she is industrious and a man is said to be an honest fellow and one who can offer good prospects to the girl who is to be his wife when he is a good workman this goodness is not a matter of ability it implies steadiness perseverance for instance a pseudo artist of great skill in producing small artistic objects but lacking the will to work would not be considered a good match everyone knows that he is not only incapable of economic production but that he is a suspicious and dangerous character that he might become a bad husband a bad father a bad citizen on the other hand the humblest artisan who works undoubtedly contains within himself all the elements which make for happiness and security in life this unquestionably was the meaning of the great roman encomium she stayed indoors and spun the wool that is to say she was a woman of character a worthy companion for the conquerors of the world now the little child who manifests perseverance in his work as the first constructive act of his psychical life and upon this act builds up internal order equilibrium and the growth of personality demonstrates almost as in a splendid revelation the true manner in which man renders himself valuable to the community the little child who persists in his exercises concentrated and absorbed is obviously elaborating the constant man the man of character the man who will find in himself all human values crowning that unique fundamental manifestation persistence in work whatever the task the child may choose it will be all the same provided he persists in it for what is valuable is not the work itself but the work as a means for the construction of the psychic man he who interrupts the children in their occupations in order to make them learn some predetermined thing he who makes them cease the study of arithmetic to pass on to that of geography and the like thinking it is important to direct their culture confuses the means with the end and destroys the man for a vanity that which it is necessary to direct is not the culture of man but the man himself if persistent be the true foundation of the will we nevertheless recognize decision as the act of the will par excellence in order to accomplish any conscious act whatsoever it is necessary that we should decide now a decision is always the result of a choice if we have several hats we must decide which one we will put on when we go out it may not in the least matter whether it be the brown hat or the gray but we must choose one of them for such a choice we must have our motives whether they be in favor of the gray or the brown but finally one of the motives will prevail and the choice will be made obviously the habit of taking a hat and going out will facilitate our choice we are almost unconscious which of the motives stirred and struggled within us it is the question of a minute and leaves no impression of effort our knowledge as to which hat will be suitable for the morning or the afternoon for the theater or for sport save us from any mental conflict but this will not be the case if for instance we are about to spend a certain sum of money on a present what shall we buy among the various objects from which it will be possible to choose if we have no very definite knowledge of the things our task may become an anxiety 
we should like to choose something artistic but we do not know much about art and we fear to be deceived and so to cut a sorry figure we know not what is customary and have no idea whether a piece of lace or a silver bowl would be suitable we then feel the need of some one to enlighten us as to all these unknown details and we go to ask advice it does not however follow that we shall take the advice we should receive to tell the truth the advice was to deal with our ignorance we require an aid to knowledge rather than an incitement to an effort of the will volition is something which we jealously reserve for ourselves and is a very different matter from the knowledge indispensable to a decision the choice which we make after the advice of one or more persons will bear our own impress it will be the decision of our ego the choice which the mistress of a house will make to prepare a dinner for guests is of the same nature but there she has a perfect knowledge of the subject and good taste and the decision will be made with pleasure and without any extraneous aid but who does not know that in every case this making a decision is an internal labor a genuine effort so much so that persons of feeble will try to avoid it as a thing irksome to them if possible the mistress of the house will leave the decisions to the cook and to a dressmaker all the arguments necessary to make one of the many motives that come into play in the choice of a gown prevail over the rest the dressmaker seeing that a decision will only be reached after long hesitation will say at a certain moment choose this which suits you so well and the lady will agree more to evade the effort of a decision than because the garment pleases her our entire life is a continual exercise of decisions when we go out of the house after having locked the door we have a clear consciousness of this act a certainty that the house is well protected and we decide to step out and walk away from it the stronger we are in such exercises the more independent we shall be of others clarity of ideas the mechanism of the habit of decision give us a sense of liberty the heaviest chain which may bind us in a humiliating form of slavery is an incapacity to make our own decisions and the consequent need to refer to others the fear of making a mistake the sense of groping in the dark of having to bear the consequences of an error we are not certain to recognize makes us run behind another person like a dog on a chain finally we shall fall into an extremity of dependence we shall no longer be able to dispatch a letter or buy a pocket handkerchief without asking advice but when an actual conflict arises in such a consciousness and the decision has to be instantaneous irresolution is the portion of one whose weakness has placed him in subjection to another stronger will and then we behold a subjection which has almost imperceptibly become an incubus the victim has taken the first step towards an abyss where the feeble in will run the risk of perdition thus the more the young are placed in subjection without power to exercise their own wills the more easily do they fall a prey to the perils of which the world is full that which gives strength to resist is not the moral vision it is the exercise of will power and this exercise is to be found in the routine of life itself the mother of a family much occupied in her mission of domestic work and accustomed to decide in all matters pertaining to the daily round is more likely to gain the victory in the event of moral conflict than a childless woman who lives in an innovating atmosphere of domestic idleness and has accustomed herself to accept her husband's will as her own yet both of these women might have the same moral vision the first mentioned if left a widow might make herself conversant with business and carry on the undertaking managed by her husband but the second in like circumstances would require tutelage and would run every risk of disaster to ensure moral salvation it is primarily necessary to depend on oneself because in the moment of peril we are alone 
and strength is not to be acquired instantaneously he who knows that he will have to fight prepares himself for boxing and dueling by strength and skill he does not sit still with folded hands because he knows that he will then either be lost or he will have to depend like a shadow of a body on someone to protect him step by step throughout his life which in practice is impossible one single moment served to conquer us says francesca in dante's inferno temptation if it is not to conquer must not fall like a bomb against another bomb of instantaneous moral explosions but against the strong walls of an impregnable fortress strongly built up stone by stone beginning at that distant day when the foundations were first laid persistent work clarity of ideas the habit of sifting conflicting motives in the consciousness even in the minutest actions of life decision taking every moment on the smallest things the gradual master over one's actions the power of self-direction increasing by degrees in the sum of successively repeated acts these are the stout little stones on which the strong structure of personality is built up this may then be inhabited by morality as by a princess who lives among the embattled towers and moats of a medieval fortress that is in a perpetual state of defence always under arms but with every probability of remaining the lady the chatelaine if to build up the house which morality will inhabit some mastery over the body is also necessary such as abstinence from alcohol which is the chief example of poison taking from without and tending to weaken and movement in the open air which facilitates material recuperation by freeing us from the poisons which we ourselves manufacture and which weaken us how much more essential must be the continual exercise of the will as a vivifying means of psychical recuperation our little children are constructing their own wills when by a process of self-education they put in motion complex internal activities of comparison and judgment and in this wise make their intellectual acquisitions with order and clarity this is a kind of knowledge capable of preparing children to form their own decisions and one which makes them independent of the suggestions of others they can then decide in every act of their daily life they decide to take or not to take they decide to accompany the rhythm of a song with movement they decide to check every motor impulse when they desire silence the constant work which builds up their personality is all set in motion by decisions and this takes the place of the primitive state of chaos in which on the other hand actions were the outcome of impulses a voluntary life develops gradually within them and doubt and timidity disappear together with the darkness of the primitive mental confusion such a development of the will would be impossible if instead of allowing order and clarity to mature in the mind we should seek to uncumber it with chaotic ideas or with stores of lessons learned by heart and then prevent children from making decisions by deciding everything for them teachers who adopt these methods are justified in saying that a child ought not to have a will of his own and in teaching him that there is no such plant as i will indeed they prevent the infantine will from developing under such conditions children are conscious of a power which inhibits all their actions they become timid and have no courage to undertake in anything without the help and consent of the person on whom they depend entirely what color are these cherries a lady once asked a child who knew quite well that they were red but the timid nervous child doubtful as to whether it would be right or wrong to answer murmured i will ask my teacher the volatile mechanism which prepares for decision is one of the most important mechanisms of the will it is valuable in itself and should be established in strengthening in itself pathology illustrates it for us apart from the other factor of the will and thus places it before our eyes as a pillar of the great vault which supports the human personality 
the so-called mania of doubt is one of the most frequent phases in the degenerative forms of psychopathy and sometimes precedes certain obsessions which urge the sufferer on irresistibly to the commission of immoral or harmful acts but there may be also a mania of doubt simple and genuine which is confined to the impossibility of taking a decision and which produces a serious state of distress though it induces no moral lapses and may even arise from a moral scruple in a hospital for nervous disorders i once encountered a characteristic case of the mania of doubt which had a moral basis the patient was a man whose business it was to go round to houses collecting refuse he was seized with misgivings lest some useful object should have accidentally fallen into the rubbish baskets and that he would be suspected of appropriating it hereupon the unhappy man just when he was about to go off with his load climbed all the stairs again and knocked again at all the doors asking whether something valuable might not perhaps have chanced to be in the baskets going away after assurances to the contrary he would return and knocked again and so on in vain he applied to the doctor for some means of strengthening his will we told him repeatedly that there was nothing of any value in the baskets that he might be quite easy on this point and carried on his business without any preoccupations then a gleam of hope shone in his eyes i may be quite easy he repeated going away in a minute he was back again then i may really be easy in vain we reassured him yes indeed quite easy his wife led him away but from the window we saw the man stop at a certain point in the street struggle with her and come back in great agitation once more he appeared at the door to ask i may be quite easy then but how often normal persons harbor in their minds the germs of such a mania here for instance is a person who is going out he locks the door and shakes it but when he has gone a few steps he is assailed by doubt did he fasten the door he knows that he did he perfectly remembers having shaken it but an irresistible impulse makes him go back to see if the door is really fastened there are children who before getting into bed at night always look under it to see if there are any animals there cats for instance they see there are none and quite understand that there are none nevertheless after a while they get out again to see if there is anything these germs are carried about and closed like tubercular bacilli in some tiny lymphatic gland the whole organism is weak but the mischief is hidden and causes no uneasiness just as pallor of the face may be concealed for a time by rouge if we consider that the will must manifest itself in actions which the body must carry out effectively we shall understand that a formative exercise is necessary to develop it by means of its mechanisms there is a perfect parallel between the formation of the will and the coordination of movement of its physiological structure the striated muscle it is evident that exercise is necessary to establish precision in our movements we know that we cannot learn to dance without preliminary exercises that we cannot play the piano without practicing the movements of the hand but prior to this the fundamental coordination of movements that is to say ambulation and prehension must have already been established from infancy it is not yet so evident to us that similar gradual preparations are necessary to develop the will in the purely physiological functions of the muscular apparatus our voluntary muscles do not all act in the same manner but rather in two opposite senses some for instance serve to thrust the arm out from the body others to draw it near some serve to bend others to straighten the knee they are that is to say antagonistic in their action every movement of the body is the result of a combination between antagonistic muscles in which now one now the other prevails in a kind of collaboration by which the greatest diversity of movements is made possible to us movements energetic graceful elegant it is thus we are enabled to establish not only a noble attitude of the body 
but a delightful motor correspondence with musical rhythm to bring about this intimate combination between antagonistic forces all that is necessary is exercise in movement true we can educate movement but this only after the natural coordination has already taken place then we can provoke special movements as in sporting games dances etc which movements must however be repeatedly executed by the performer himself in order to produce in him the possibility of new combinations of movements not only in the case of movements of grace and agility but also in those of strength it is necessary that the performer himself should act repeatedly the will certainly comes into play here the performer wishes to devote himself to sport or to dancing or to the arts of self-defense to compete in matches etc but in order to will this it is necessary that he should have practice continually thus making ready the apparatus on which the volative act will finally depend and to which it will issue its command movement is always voluntary both when the first movements established by muscular coordination take place and when exercises designed to produce fresh combinations of movement follow each other as in short when the will acts like a commander whose orders are carried out by a well-organized disciplined and highly skilled army voluntary action in respect of its powers increases in degree as its dependent muscles perfect themselves and so achieve the necessary conditions for seconding its efforts it would certainly never occur to any one that in order to educate the voluntary motility of a child it would be well first of all to keep it absolutely motionless covering its limbs with cement until the muscles become atrophied and almost paralyzed and then when this result had been attained that it would suffice to read to the child wonderful stories of clowns acrobats and champion boxers and wrestlers to fire him by such examples and to inspire in him an ardent desire to emulate them it is obvious that such a proceeding would be an inconceivable absurdity and yet we do something of the same kind when in order to educate the child's will we first of all attempt to annihilate it or as we say break it and thus hamper the development of every factor of the will substituting ourselves for the child in everything it is our will that we keep him motionless or make him act it is we who choose and decide for him and after all this we are content to teach him that to will is to do and we present to his fancy in the guise of fabulous tales stories of heroic men giants of will under the illusion that by committing their deed to memory a vigorous feeling of emulation will be aroused and will complete the miracle when i was a child attending the first classes of the elementary schools there was a kind teacher who was very fond of us of course she kept us captive and motionless on our seats and talked incessantly herself though she looked pale and exhausted her fixed idea was to make us learn by heart the lives of famous women and more especially heroines in order to incite us imitate them she made us study an immense number of biographies in order to demonstrate to us all the possibilities of becoming illustrious and also to convince us that it was not beyond our powers to be heroines since these were so numerous the exhortation which accompanied these narratives was always the same you too should try to become famous would not you too like to be famous oh no i answer one day dryly i shall never do so i care too much for the children of the future to add yet another biography to the list the unanimous reports of the educationists from all parts of the world who attended the last pedagogic and psychological international congresses lamented the lack of character in the young as constituting a great danger to the race but it is not that character is lacking in the race it is that school distorts the body and weakens the spirit all that is needed is an act of liberation and the latent forces of man will then develop 
the manner in which we are to make use of our strong will is a higher question which however can rest only upon one basis that the will exists that is has been developed and has become strong one of the examples usually given to our children to teach them to admire strength of will is that of victorio alfieri who began to educate himself late in life overcoming the drudgery of the rudiments by a great effort he who had hitherto been a man of the world set to work to study the latin grammar and persevered until he became a man of letters and in virtue of his ardent genius one of the greatest poets the phrase by which he explained his transformation is just the phrase every child in italy has heard quoted by his teachers i will perpetually i will with all my strength i will now before he made the great decision vittorio alfieri was the victim of a capricious society lady whom he loved alfieri felt that he was ruining himself by remaining the slave of his passion an internal impulse urged him to raise himself he felt the great man latent within him full of powers not yet developed but potential and expansive he would fain have turned them to account responded to their inner calls and decided himself to them but then a scented note from the lady who summoned him to join her in her box at the play and the evening would be wasted the power of this lady exercised over him overcame his own will which would gladly have resisted nevertheless the rage and weariness he endured as he sat through the silly performances at the theatre caused him such acute suffering that at last he felt that he hated the fascinating lady his determination took a material form he resolved to create an insurmountable obstacle between himself and her he accordingly cut off the thick plate of hair which adorned his head the badge of gentle birth without which he would have been ashamed to leave the house then he had himself bound with ropes to his armchair where he spent several days in such agitation he was unable even to read a line it was only the material impossibility of moving and the thought of cutting a ridiculous figure which kept him there in spite of the impulse to hasten to the beloved one it was thus that he willed willed perpetually with all his strength and so left the man within him free to expand it was thus he saved himself from futility and perdition and worked for his own immortality and it is something of the same sort that we desire to bring about in our children by the education of the will we wish them to learn to save themselves from the vanities that destroy man and concentrate on work which causes the inner life to expand and leads to a great undertakings we wish them to work for their own immortality this loving and anxious desire inclines us to draw them along shielded by us but is there not within the child himself a power which enables him to save himself the child loves us with all his heart and follows us with all the devotion of his little soul is capable nevertheless he has something within himself which governs his inner life it is the force of his own expansion it is this force for instance which leads him to touch things in order to become acquainted with them and we say to him do not touch he moves about to establish his equilibrium and we tell him to keep still he questions us to acquire knowledge and we reply do not be tiresome we relegate him to a place at our side vanquish and subdue with a few tiresome playthings like an alfieri in the box at the theatre he might well think why does she whom i love so dearly want to annihilate me why does she wish to oppress me with her caprices it is caprice which makes her prevent me from developing the expansive forces within me and relegate me to a place among vain and wearisome things merely because i love her thus to save himself the child should be a strong spirit like victorio alfieri but too often he cannot 
we do not perceive that the child is a victim and that we are annihilating him and then we demand everything from his nullity by a fiat by an act of our omnipotence we want the adult man but without allowing him to grow many will think when they read the story of victorio alfieri that they would have wished something more in their sons they would have wished it to be unnecessary to set up material obstacles against temptation such as the cutting off of the hair and the binding to the armchair with ropes and would have hoped that a spiritual force would have sufficed to resist it like one of our great poets seeing of the roman lucrezia reproves her for having killed herself since she ought to have died of grief at outrage had she been even more virtuous than she was now that father with the spiritual ideals would not in all probability ask himself what he himself had done to enable his son to become strong and rise to the level of spiritual aid very likely he is a father who did his utmost to break the will of his son and make him submissive to his own will no earthly father can make the spirit rise to such heights this can only be accomplished by the mysterious voice which speaks within the heart of the man in the silence a voice in which strident because it is raised against the laws of nature like the voice of the father who wishes to subdue another creature to himself disturbs that silence where in peace and liberty the divine works are being accomplished without the strong man all is vain it is recorded that a priest once presented to saint teresa a young girl who wished to become a carmelite nun and who according to him had angelic quality saint teresa accepting the neophyte replied see my father our lord has given this maiden devotion but she has no judgment and never will have any and she will always be a burden to us one of the greatest of contemporary theologians who during the proceedings to obtain the canonization of joan of arc had made a profound study of her personality says in reference to the suggestion that she was simply the instrument of divine inspiration let no one deceive himself joan of arc was no blind and passive instrument of a supernatural power the liberator of france had entire command of her personality she gave proof of this by her independent action both in decisions and in deeds i believe that the work of the educator consists primarily in protecting the powers and directing them without disturbing them in their expansion and in the bringing of man into contact with the spirit which is within him and which should operate through him end of chapter seven Recording by Mike Trong in Houston, Texas. Chapter 8, Part 1 of Spontaneous Activity in Education. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org spontaneous activity in education by maria montessori translated by florence simmons chapter eight part one intelligence let us pause a moment to consider what is the key by means of which we may bring about the realization of the liberty of the child that key which sets in motion the mechanisms essential to education the child who is free to move about, and who perfects himself by so doing, is he who has an intelligent object in his movements. The child who is free to develop his inner personality, who perseveres in a task for a considerable time, and organizes himself upon such a fundamental phenomenon, is sustained and guided by an intelligent purpose. Without this, his persistence in work, 
his inner formation and his progress would not be possible. When we refrain from guiding the subjugated child step by step, when liberating the child from our personal influence, we place him in an environment suited to him and in contact with the means of development. We leave him confidently to his own intelligence. His motor activity will then direct itself to definite actions. He will wash his hands and face, sweep the room, dust the furniture, change his clothes, spread the rugs, lay the table, cultivate plants, and take care of animals. He will choose the tasks conducive to his development and persist in them, attracted and guided by his interest towards a sensory material which leads him to distinguish one thing from another, to select, to reason, to correct himself. And the acquirements thus made are not only a cause of internal growth, but a strong propulsive force to further progress. Thus, passing from simple objects to objects of ever-increasing complexity, he becomes possessed of a culture. Moreover, he organizes his character by means of the internal order which forms itself within him and by the skill which he acquires. Therefore, when we leave the child to himself, we leave him to his intelligence, not, as is commonly supposed, to his instincts, meaning by the word instincts those designated as animal instincts. We are so accustomed to treat children like dogs and other domestic animals that a free child makes us think of a dog barking, jumping, and stealing dainties. And so accustomed are we to regard as manifestations of evil instincts the rebellions of the child treated as a beast, his obscure protests and desperations, or the protective devices he has to invent to save himself from such a humiliating situation, that by way of elevating him we first compare him to plants and flowers, and then actually try to keep him as far as possible in the state of physical immobility of vegetables subjecting him to the same sensations, reducing him to slavery. But he never becomes the plant with angelic perfume we would fain believe him to be. Rather, do signs of corruption gradually manifest themselves as his human substance mortifies and dies. But when we leave the child free as a man in the palestra of his own intelligence, his type changes entirely. It is of this type we must form new conceptions in discussing the questions of liberty. That of intelligence should also, I believe, be the key to the problem of the social liberty of man. We have heard much talk of late years, of a very superficial kind, concerning liberty of thought, the issue being obscured by prejudices akin to those prevalent concerning children. It has been supposed that man would be liberated were he abandoned to his own thoughts. But was he capable of thinking? Was not the epoch of such freedom also that of cerebral neurasthenia? Was it not also that epoch when laws of extending social rights to illiterates were under discussion? Now let us take an example. If we told a sick person to choose between disease and health, would this make him free to do so? If we offer an uneducated peasant good and bad paper money, leaving him free to choose, which will he take? If he chooses the bad notes, he is not free, he is cheated. If he chooses the good, he is not free, he is lucky. He will be free when he has the sufficient knowledge not only to distinguish the good from the bad, but to understand the social utility of each. It is the giving of this internal formation which makes a man free, irrespective of a social sanction, which is merely an external conquest of liberty. If the liberty of man were such a simple problem, we should only need to pass a law, enabling the blind to see and the deaf to hear, in order to restore poor humanity to health. Our honesty ought to make us recognize one day that the fundamental rights of man are those of his own formation, free of obstacles, free from slavery, and free to draw from his environment the means required for his development. In short, it is in education that we shall find the fundamental solution of the social problems connected with personality. 
deeply instructive is the revelation made to us by the children that the intelligence is the key which reveals the secrets of their formation and is the actual means of their internal construction the hygiene of the intelligence thus assumes cardinal importance when intelligence is recognized as the means of formation the pivot of life itself it can no longer be exhausted for dubious ends or oppressed and suffocated without discernment. At a not far distant day, the intelligence of children must become the object of treatment much wiser and more elaborate than that which we now bestow on their bodies, to adjuncts of which, such as teeth, nails, and hair, we devote costly and laborious processes. When we reflect that a mother who is perfectly conscious of the dangers and remedies connected with the hair of the child can oppress and enslave his intelligence quite unknowingly, we are at once obliged to admit that the new road leading to civilization must needs be a long one. If such contrasts in our attitude to the superfluities and the essentials of life are still possible at the present day, what is intelligence? Without rising to the heights of the definitions given by the philosophers, we may, for the moment, consider the sum of those reflex and associative or reproductive activities which enable the mind to construct itself, putting it into relation with the environment. According to Bain, the consciousness of difference is the beginning of every intellectual exercise. The first step of the mind is appreciation of distinction. The basis of its perceptive functions towards the external world are the sensations. To collect facts and distinguish between them is the initial process in intellectual construction. Let us try to infuse a little more precision and clarity into the analysis of intelligence, the first characteristic which presents itself to us as an indication of intellectual development is related to time. The masses are so much alive to this primitive characteristic that the popular expression, quick, is synonymous with intelligent. To be rapid in reacting to a stimulus, in the association of ideas, in the capacity of formulating a judgment, this is the most obvious external manifestation of intelligence. This quickness is certainly related to the capacity for receiving impressions from the environment elaborating images, and externalizing the internal results. All these activities may be developed by means of an exercise comparable to a system of mental gymnastics to collect numerous sensations, to put them constantly in relation with one another, to deduce judgments therefrom, and to acquire the habit of manifesting these freely. All this ought, as a psychologist would say, to render the conductive channels and the associative channels more and more permeable, and the period of reaction ever briefer. As in intelligent muscular movement, the repetition of the act not only renders it more perfect in itself, but more rapid in execution. An intelligent child at school is not only one who understands, but one who understands quickly. On the other hand, one who learns the same things, but who takes a longer time in so doing, say, two years instead of one, is slow. Of a quick child, the people say that nothing escapes him. His attention is always on the alert, and he is ready to receive every kind of stimulus. As a sensitive scale will show the slightest variation in weight, so the sensitive brain will respond to the slightest appeal. It is equally rapid in its associative processes, he understands in a flash is a familiar saying to indicate accurate conception. Now an exercise which puts in motion the intellectual mechanisms can only be an auto-exercise. It is impossible that another person exercising himself in our stead should make us acquire skill. The sensory exercises arouse and intensify the central activities in our children. When sense and stimulus Duly isolated, the child has clear perceptions in his consciousness. When sensations of heat, cold, roughness, smoothness, weight, and lightness, when a sound and isolated noise are perceived by him, when, in almost complete silence, 
he closes his eyes and waits for a voice to murmur a word. It is as if the external world had knocked at the door of his soul, awakening its activities. And further, when the multitudinous sensations are all contained in the richness of the environment, the two react harmoniously one upon the other, intensifying the activities that have been awakened. This is exemplified in the case of the child absorbed in coloring his designs, who will choose the most beautiful tints while music is being played, or in that of another who contemplating the gay and gracious environment of the school and the flowering plants will sing his song to perfection. The first characteristic which manifests itself in our children after their process of auto-education has been initiated is that their reactions become ever more ready and more rapid. A sensory stimulus which might before have passed unobserved or might have roused a languid interest is vividly perceived. The relation between things is easily recognized and thus errors in their use are quickly detected, judged, and corrected. By means of the sensory gymnastics, the child carries out just this primordial and fundamental exercise of the intelligence which awakens and sets in motion the central nervous mechanisms. When we see these external manifestations of our quick and active children, sensitive to the slightest call, ready to run swiftly towards us without relaxing the attention they give to their own movements and to all the external objects they encounter, and compare them with the torpid children in their ordinary schools, clumsy in their movements, indifferent to stimuli, incapable of spontaneous association of ideas, we are led to think of the civilization of our own days as compared with that of olden times. The civil environment of bygone years, as compared with our own, was more leisurely. We have learnt how to save time. The stagecoach was once the means of transport, whereas now we travel in motor cars and even in airplanes. The voice was the medium of speech from a distance, whereas now we speak through the telephone. Men killed each other one by one, whereas now they kill each other en masse. All this makes us realize that our civilization is not based upon respect for life and respect for the soul, but rather it is based on our respect for time. It is solely in an external sense that civilization has pursued its course. It has become more rapid, and it has set in motion machinery. But man has not had the same preparation to keep up with it. Individuals have not accelerated themselves methodically. The children of this bewildering environment are not new men, more active, readier, more intelligent. The transformed human personality has not yet risen, ready to meet all eventualities, and to utilize for his own benefit the external conquests of his environment. Torpid man saves time and money in this civilization, but his soul remains defrauded, and depressed. If he does not rise to the task of reforming himself in harmony with the new world he has created, he runs the risk of being some day overthrown and crushed by it. The swift reactions occurring among our children are not merely an external manifestation of the intelligence. They are related not only to the exercise, but also to the order which has been established within. And it is this intimate work of rearrangement which is in itself a more exact indication of intellectual formation. Order is, in short, the true key to rapidity of reaction. In a chaotic mind, the recognition of a sensation is no less difficult than the elaboration of a reasoned discourse. In all things, social as well as others, it is organization and order which make it possible to proceed rapidly. To be able to distinguish is the characteristic sign of intelligence. To distinguish is to arrange, and also in life it is to prepare for creation. Creation finds its expansion in order. We find this conception in the genesis of Scripture. God did not begin to create without preparation, and this preparation was the introduction of order into chaos. 
and god divided the light from the darkness and he said let the waters be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear the consciousness may possess a rich and varied content but when there is mental confusion the intelligence does not appear its appearance is exactly like the kindling of a light which makes it possible to distinguish things clearly let there be light thus we may justly say that to help the development of the intelligence is to help to put the images of the consciousness in order we ought to think of the mental state of the little child of three years old who has already looked upon a world how often has he fallen asleep utterly weary from having seen so many things it has not occurred to anyone that for him to walk is in fact to work that seeing and hearing when the organs are not as yet accommodated so that he is obliged to be perpetually correcting the errors of his senses and verifying with his hand what he cannot as yet appraise correctly with his eye is a great exertion hence the little one who is overtaxed by stimuli in places where these abound cries or falls asleep the little child of three years old carries with him a heavy chaos he is like a man who has accumulated an immense quantity of books piled up without any order and who asks himself what shall i do with them when will he be able to arrange them in such fashion as to enable him to say i possess a library by means of our so-called sensory exercises we make it possible for the child to distinguish and to classify our sensory material in fact analyzes and represents the attributes of things dimensions forms colors smoothness or roughness of surface weight temperature flavor noise sounds it is the qualities of these objects not the objects themselves which are important although these qualities isolated one from the other are themselves represented by objects for the attributes long short thick thin large small red yellow green hot cold heavy light rough smooth scented noisy resonant we have a like number of corresponding objects arranged in a graduated series this gradation is important for the establishment of order indeed the attributes of the objects differ not only in quality but also in quantity there may be more or less high or more or less low more or less thick or more or less thin these sounds have various tones the colors have various degrees of intensity the shapes may resemble each other in varying degrees the states of roughness and smoothness are by no means absolute the material for the education of the senses lends itself to the purpose of distinguishing between these things first of all it enables the child to ascertain the identity of two stimuli by means of numerous exercises in matching and fitting afterwards difference is appreciated when the lessons directed the child's attention to the external objects of a series light dark long short at last he begins to distinguish the degrees of the various attributes arranging a series of objects in gradation such as the tablets which show the various degrees of intensity of the same chromatic tone the bells which produce the notes of an octave the objects which represent length in decimal proportions or thickness in centimetric proportions these exercises which are so attractive to children are as we have seen repeated by them indefinitely the teacher puts the seal upon each acquisition with a word thus the classification is complete and finally has its schedule that is it becomes possible to recall the attribute and its image by a name now as we have no possible means of distinguishing things other than by their attributes the classification of these entails a fundamental order of arrangement comprehending everything henceforth the world is no longer a chaos for the child his mind bears some resemblance to the orderly shelves of a library or a rich museum each object is in its place in its proper category and each acquisition he makes will be no longer merely stored but duly allocated this primitive order will never be disturbed 
but only enriched by fresh material. Thus the child, having acquired the power of distinguishing one thing from another, has laid the foundations of the intelligence. It is unnecessary to repeat what an internal impulse the acquired order contributes towards the seeking after objects in the environment. Henceforth, the child recognizes the objects which surround him. When he discovers with so much emotion that the sky is blue, that his hand is smooth, that the window is rectangular, he does not in reality discover sky, nor hand, nor window, but he discovers their position in the order of his mind by arrangement of his ideas. And this determines a stable equilibrium in the internal personality which produces calm, strength, and the possibility of fresh conquests, just as the muscles which have coordinated their functions enable the body to maintain its equilibrium, and to acquire the stability and security which facilitate all movements. This order conduces to an economy of time and strength. Like a well-arranged museum, it saves the time and strength of inquirers, the child can therefore perform a greater quantity of work without fatigue, and can react to stimuli in a briefer space of time. To be able to distinguish, classify, and catalogue external things on the basis of a secure order already established in the mind, this is at once intelligence and culture. This is indeed the popular conception, when an educated person can recognize an author by his style, or the characteristics of the literary compositions of a period, he is pronounced versed, intelligente in literature. In the same way we say of one who could recognize a painter by the manner in which he lays his colors on the canvas, or fix the period of a sculptor from the fragment of a base relief, that he is versed, intelligente in art. The scientist is of the same type. He is able to observe things and to give due value even to their minutest details. Hence the differences between the characteristics of things are clearly perceived and classified. The scientist distinguishes objects in accordance with the orderly content of his mind. A seedling, a microbe, an animal or the remains of an animal are not enigmas to him, though in themselves they may be strange to him. We may say the same of the chemist, the physicist, the geologist, the archaeologist. It is not the accumulation of a direct knowledge of things which forms the man of letters, the scientist, and the connoisseur. It is the prepared order established in the mind which is to receive such knowledge. On the other hand, the uncultivated person has only the direct knowledge of objects. Such a person may be a lady who spends a great part of the night reading books, or a gardener who spends his life making material distinctions between the plants in his garden. The knowledge of such uncultured minds is not only disorderly, but it is confined to the objects with which it comes into direct contact, whereas the knowledge of the scientist is infinite, because possessing the power of classifying the attributes of things, he can recognize them all, and determine now the class, now the relationships, now the origins of each facts much more profound than the actual things could of themselves reveal. Now our children, after the manner of the connoisseur of art and the man of science, recognize objects in the external world by means of their attributes and classify them. Hence they are sensitive to all objects. Everything possesses a value for them. Uncultured children, on the other hand, pass blind and deaf close to things, just as ignorant man passes by a work of art or listens to a performance of classical music without recognition or enjoyment. The educational methods now in use proceed on lines exactly the reverse of ours. Having first abolished spontaneous activity, they present objects with their accumulation of attributes directly to the child calling attention to each attribute and hoping that from all this mass the mind of the child will be able to abstract the attributes themselves without any guidance or order. Thus they create in a passive being an artificial chaos, more limited than that which the natural world would offer. 
the objective method now in use, which consists in presenting an object and noting all its attributes, that is, describing it, is nothing but a sensory variation on the customary mnemonic method. Instead of describing an absent object, a present object is described. Instead of the imagination alone working to effect its reconstruction, the senses intervene. That is done so that the distinctive qualities of the object itself should be better remembered. The passive mind receives images, which are limited to the objects presented and which are stored up without any order. As a fact, every object may have infinite attributes, and if, as often happens in object lessons, the origins and ultimate ends of the object itself are included among these attributes, the mind has literally to range throughout the universe. If, for instance, in an object lesson on coffee, which I heard given in a kindergarten school, the object is described and the attention of the children directed to its size, color, its shape, its aroma, its flavor, its temperature, and then if the teacher goes on to describe the plant and the manner in which the substance was brought to Europe across the ocean, and finally, lighting a spirit lamp, boils the water, grinds the berries, and prepares the beverage, the mind has been led to wander in infinite spaces, but the subject has not been exhausted, for it would be possible to go on to describe the exciting effects of coffee, caffeine which is extracted from the berry, and many other things. Such an analysis would spread like spilt oil until finally dispersed, and the outcome would be of no use in any way. If indeed we should ask a child so instructed, what is coffee then? He might well reply, it is such a long story that I cannot remember it. A notion so vague and I cannot certainly say so complete, fatigues and encumbers the mind and can never transform itself into a dynamic excitation of similar associations. The efforts the child makes will be at the most efforts of memory to recall the history of coffee. If associations are formed in his mind, they will be inferior associations of a contiguity. His mind will wander from the teacher who is speaking to the ocean that was traversed, to the dining table at home on which coffee appears in cups every day. In other words, he will stray aimlessly, as does the idle mind, when it allows itself to wander from the continuity of its passive associations. In this kind of reverie to which the minds of children give themselves up, there is no sign of internal activity, far less of any individual difference. Children subjected to the object lesson system always remain purely receptive beings, or, if we prefer to put it so, storehouses in which new objects are continually deposited. No activity is thus aroused and directed towards the object in order to recognize its qualities in such a manner that the child himself forms an idea of it, nor can the possibility of connecting other objects with the first by their common characteristics, arise in his mind. For in what particular does any object resemble the others in its use? When we associate the images of different objects by similarity, we should extract from the whole the qualities which the objects themselves have in common. If, for instance, we say that two rectangular tablets are alike, we have first extracted from the numerous qualities of these tablets such facts as that they are of wood, that they are polished, smooth, colored, of the same temperature, etc. The quality relating to their shape. They are alike in shape. This may suggest a long series of objects, the top of a table, the window, etc. But before such a result as this can be achieved, it is necessary that the mind should first be capable of abstracting from the numerous attributes of these objects the quality of a rectangular shape. The work of the mind in this quest must necessarily be active. It analyzes the object, extracts a determined attribute therefrom, and under the guidance of this determined attribute, makes a synthesis associating many objects by the same medium of connection. 
if this capacity for the selecting of single attributes among all those proper to the object not be acquired association by means of similarity synthesis and all the higher work of the intelligence becomes impossible moreover this is intellectual work in reality because the essential quality of the intelligence is not to photograph objects and keep them one upon the other like the pages of an album or juxtaposed like the stones in a pavement such a labor of mere deposit is an outrage on the intellectual nature the intelligence with its characteristic orderliness and power of discrimination is capable of distinguishing and extracting the dominant characteristics of objects and it is upon these that it proceeds to build up its internal structures now our children whose minds are thus ordered in relation to the classification of attributes by the pedagogic aid they have received are led not only to observe objects according to all the attributes they have analyzed but also to distinguish identities differences and resemblances and this work renders the extraction of one of the qualities of corresponding to one of the sensory groups which have been considered apart easy and spontaneous that is to say it will be easy for the child thus to recognize the various qualities of an object to note for instance that certain objects are alike in form or alike in color because forms and colors have already been grouped into very distinctive categories and they therefore recall series of objects by similarity this classification of attributes is a kind of lodestone it is an attractive force of a determined group of qualities and the objects which have this quality are attracted thereto and united one with another this is association by similitude almost of a mechanical kind books are of the shape of prisms one of our children might say and such a pronouncement would be the conclusion arrived at by a very complex mental process were it not that prismatic forms already existed as a well-defined series in his mind attracting to itself all the surrounding objects which possess the same character thus the whiteness of sheets of paper interrupted by dark signs may be attracted by the colors systemized in the mind into a synthetic whole which might make the child say books are sheets of white printed paper it is in this act of work that individual differences may manifest themselves what will be the group of attributes which will attract similar objects and what will be the prevailing characteristic chosen for the purpose of association by similarity one child will note that a curtain is light green another that the same curtain is light in weight one will be struck by the whiteness of a hand another by the smoothness of its skin for one child the window will be a rectangle to another it is something through which the blue of the sky may be seen the choice of prevailing characteristics made by children becomes a natural selection harmonizing with their own innate tendencies in like manner a scientist will choose the characters most useful to his associations an anthropologist may choose the shape of the head to distinguish the human races and another might choose the cutaneous pigment either will serve the purpose each anthropologist may have the most accurate knowledge of the external characteristics of men but the important matter consists in finding a characteristic which will serve as a basis for classification that is to say a characteristic on which it will be possible to group numerous characteristics in the order of similitude purely practical persons would consider man from the utilitarian rather than from the scientific point of view a maker of hats would single out the dimensions of the head from among other human characteristics an orator would consider man from the point of view of his susceptibility to the spoken word but selection is the fundamental necessity which enables us to realize things to emerge from the vague into the practical from aimless contemplation into the sphere of action every created thing in existence is characterized by the fact that it has limitations our own psychosensory organization is founded upon a selection what are the functions of the senses 
but to respond to a determined series of vibrations and to no others. Thus the eye limits light and the ear sounds. In forming the contents of the mind, the first step is therefore a selection, necessarily and materially limited. Nevertheless, the mind imposes still further limits on the selection possible to the senses, fashioning it upon the activity of internal choice. Thus attention is fixed upon determined objects and not upon all objects. And the volition chooses the actions which are really to be performed from among a multitude of possible actions. It is in like fashion that the lofty work of the intelligence is accomplished. By an analogous action of attention and internal will, it abstracts the dominant characteristics of things, and thus succeeds in associating their images and keeping them in the foreground of consciousness. It ceases to consider an immense amount of ballast which would render its context formless and confused. Every superior mind distinguishes the essential form from the superfluous, rejecting the latter, and thus it is enabled to achieve its characteristic, clear, delicate, and vital activities. It is capable of extracting that which is useful to its creative life, and thus finds in the cosmos the meaning of salvation. Without this characteristic activity, the intelligence cannot construct itself. It would be like an attention that wanders from thing to thing without ever fixing upon any one of them, and like a will that can never decide upon any definite action. It is possible to suppose, says James, that a god could, without impairing his activity, simultaneously behold all the minutest portions of the world. But if our human attention should be thus dissipated, we should merely contemplate all things vacuously, without ever finding occasion to do any particular act. It is one of the marvelous phenomena of life that it is impossible to realize anything without determining limits. That mysterious law which ordains that every living being has its form and stature, unlike the minerals, which are indefinite in form and dimensions, is repeated in the psychical life. Its development, its auto-creation, is nothing but a determination, even more precise, a progressive concentration. It is thus that from the primitive chaos our internal characteristic form is gradually shaped and chiseled. The capacity for forming a conception of a thing, for judging and reasoning, has always this foundation. When, after having noted the usual qualities of a column, we abstract the general truth that the column is a support. This synthetic idea is based upon a selected quality. Thus, in the judgment, we may pronounce columns are cylindrical. We have abstracted one quality from among the many others we could have adduced. As columns are cold, they are hard, they are a composition of carbonate of lime, etc., it is only the capacity for such a selection which makes reasoning possible. When, for example, in the demonstration of the theorem of Pythagoras, children handle the various pieces of the metal insets, they should start from the point at which they become aware that a rectangle is equal to the rhomb and a square is equal to the same rhomb. It is the perception of this truth which makes it possible to go on to the following reasoning. Therefore, the square and the rectangle are equal to each other. If it had not been possible to determine this attribute, the mind could not have arrived at any conclusion. The mind has succeeded in discovering an attribute common to two dissimilar figures, and it is this discovery which may lead to a series of conclusions by means of which the theorem of Pythagoras will be finally demonstrated. Now, as in the case of will, decision presupposes a methodical exercise of the impulsive and inhibitory forces, only to be performed by the individual himself until habits have been established. So in case of the intelligence, the individual must exercise himself in his activities of association and selection, guided and aided by external means, until he has developed, 
by the definitive elimination of certain ideas and the choices of others mental habits characteristic of the individual characteristic of the type because underlying all the internal activities the mind can construct there is as the phenomena of attention show us the individual tendency the nature there is undoubtedly a fundamental difference between understanding and learning the reasoning of others and being able to reason between learning how an artist may see the external world according to his prevailing interest in color harmony and form and actually seeing the external world about a fulcrum which sustains one's own aesthetical creation in the mind of one who learns the things of others we may find as in a sack of old clothes hanging over the shoulders of a hawker solutions of the problems of euclid together with the images of raphael's works ideas of history and geography and rules of style huddled together with a like indifference and a like sensation of weight while on the other hand he who uses all these things for his own life is like the person who is assisted in attaining his own welfare his own relief his own comfort by those same objects which are merely burdens when in the sack of the hawker such objects are however no longer huddled together without order and without purpose in a closed bag but set out in the spacious rooms of a well-ordered house the mind which constructs may contain a great deal more than the mind in which pieces of knowledge are heaped up as in the bag and in that mind as in the house the objects are clearly divided one from another harmoniously arranged and distinctive in their uses between understanding because another person seeks to impress upon us the explanation of a thing by speech and understanding the thing ourselves there is an immeasurable distance the two are comparable to the impression made in soft wax which will subsequently be effaced and replaced by other impressions and the form chiseled in the marble by an artist as his creation he who understands of himself has an unforeseen impression he feels that his consciousness has been liberated and something luminous shines forth within him understanding then is not a matter of indifference it is the beginning of something sometimes it is the beginning of a life which renews itself within us perhaps no emotion is more fruitful for man than the intellectual emotion he who makes a discovery rich in results certainly enjoys the greatest of human felicities but even he who merely understands gets a lofty enjoyment which will rise superior to and overcome the most acute suffering indeed he who is oppressed by a misfortune if he can be brought to differentiate his own case from that of another or to see a reason for his affliction experiences relief and a sense of salvation amidst the confused darkness in which he was plunged a consoling ray of intellectual light has reached him the difficult matter indeed is to find the way of escape in the hour of darkness when we reflect that a dog may die of grief on the grave of his master and that a mother can survive on the grave of her only son we see at once that it is the light of reason which makes the difference between the two the dog cannot reason on the matter it may die because no light can penetrate the darkness of its intelligence to overcome the depression of its grief but the thought of a universal justice the living memory of the lost one which remains to us saves the human being and by degrees not forgetfulness which alone can save the animal but the connection which the intelligence establishes with the universe restores calm to the suffering soul such comfort could never be derived from the dry lessons of a professor from memorizing the theory of a savant who is not in sympathy with the state of our soul when we say to give ourselves a reason to derive strength from a principle we imply that the ever inquiring intelligence should be left at liberty to perform its work of reconstruction and salvation now if intelligence in comprehending may actually prove our salvation when in danger of death what a source of enjoyment it should prove to man 
when we talk of the opening of the mind we mean a creative phenomenon which is not the weak result of an impression violently made from without the opening of the mind is the active comprehension which accompanies great emotions and which is therefore felt as a spiritual event i once knew a motherless girl who was so much depressed by the arid teaching of her school that she had become almost incapable of study and even of understanding the things which were taught her her life of solitude lacking in natural affection was a further aggravation of her mental fatigue her father decided that she should live for a year or two in the open country like a little savage he then brought her back to town and placed her under the private direction of a number of professors the girl studied and learned but remained passive and weary every now and then her father would say is your mind opening again and the girl always replied i do not know what do you mean owing to a curious coincidence in my life this girl was confided to my sole care and it was thus that i when i was still a medical student made my first pedagogic experiment upon which i cannot linger now though it would be worthy of interest one day we were together and when she was at work on organic chemistry she broke off and looking at me with beaming eyes said here it is now i do understand she then got up and went away calling out loud father father my mind has opened i not then knowing the girl's history was astonished and agitated she had taken her father's hand and was saying now i can tell you yes yes i did not know what it meant before my mind has opened the joy of father and daughter and their union at that moment made me think of the joys and wellsprings of life which we destroy by enslaving the intelligence end of chapter eight part one